ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another day of the ESL SCT Masters Regional Spring. It's a redo from yesterday. I'm Wardy. With me is Ben Demu Baker. How you doing, matey? Ready for day two? I definitely am, and like I started off uh, much fresher today, so I'm very happy about that. And you know, I played some bladder games, got flamed. It was like I was playing Edra all over again, and yeah, I'm I'm happy, chappy. <laughs> like today, today is Dodd Day, Do or Die Day. It really is actually because today we have a load of matches that are players that are two and zero, making qualification and going to playoffs already. And for a lot of guys, it's elimination time. So if they don't win, it is over. So it is going to be a tough one in that regard. We'll have a look at exactly what is to come today in just a couple of moments. First oh. of all, though, we're going to go and uh, you're getting attacked by animals, Ben. I got attacked. I got attacked by like a fly or a mosquito or something. It was like, <laughs> what the hell? But uh, yeah, yeah, no, no. It's it's actually a very exciting day because now we get to see the guys that are all two zero in the groups play against the other guys two zero, and then equally the guys that are zero two. So there's probably going to be like different classes of play that we go in to see, but doesn't make it any less fun because then it like this is really where it all counts very very true we're here because of of course blizzard entertainment monster energy the united states air force and esl shop and we're also here because we're trying to get ourselves to dallas but you can join us make sure you get your tickets today dreamhack.com forward slash dallas slash tickets you can get 50 percent off with the code starcraft and we would love to see you there for the offline finals let's take a quick peek at what's coming up for our first four best of threes today as we go into asia uh, as we said, we will start with the t players who are 2-0 and and a surprising lack of Oliveira because this man beat him. Lemon takes on Firefly, then Yeshi battles against Cyan, and then we go to the do or die moments. Mio, Micah, and Misaki battle each other in ZVZ. We actually have all mirror matchups in Asia to start the day. It'll be PvP to wrap up Asia with Jim versus Max said a battle of the Chinese old god. So that's going to be very fun as we get ready to go into this first matchup of the day, Ben. It is indeed Lemon Firefly. Firefly, we expect to be here looking good, you know, looking for a quick qualification to the playoffs. But Lemon is probably the upset of the tournament altogether right now. Lemon is the guy that... <laughs> I, I know it's kind of a meme these days, like, everybody's talking about. But, like, definitely I've seen his name mentioned quite a bit in the Twitch chats and stuff. So I'm excited to see how he does, because Firefly, he's a smart little Protoss man. Like, I will never forget his best of five with Oliveira. I think I might have casted with you last season on it, but he just played really smart. Like, it was, it was very fun to see. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. It was a... Uh... A really fun series out of um, Firefly. Then he's he's a good player, man. He's he's solid. He's he's fun. I uh, expect him to be the favorite here. But Lemon, I mean, again, it's not just Oliveira that Lemon knocked down. He also knocked down Nice, who's another one of the stronger pros players in this region. So to me, Lemon is out here like completely turning this region upside down and on its head. So can he keep that up today? That will be the big question as we go into game number one of this best of three. We are going to start off in the bottom right-hand side. Just give it a moment. StarCraft doesn't like to show up straight away. There it is. See, it was going to come eventually. It is going to be our Blue Protoss player representing Offside Gaming. It is Firefly. And spawning over in the top left, the kind of wonder of the tournament so far, it is the Red Protoss. It is Lemon. And is he playing for a Team Warder? You know, you've got that fancy overlay that I cannot see currently. No, oh, he's just got a big old proto symbol next to his name. Oh, that's the way I like him, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm very, very looking forward to see what he brings today. Because already, yeah, you saying he took down Nice, that's a big deal. Nice is not an easy opponent. We got to see him pretty much dismantle Hass uh, yesterday, which was, I, I don't want to say expected, but, you know, he, he's definitely looking like a solid contender. One of the guys that could have went 3-0 uh, in the group stage, but... Yeah, Lemon is here, and so far it's four Protosses that are all 2-0 uh, in the Chinese region, so that's amazing, or rather the Asian region. Yeah, no, it's all about Protoss in this region so far. Obviously, two Protoss will make playoffs. Again, for these guys, 2-0, you know, if you lose this, you still have two more best of threes, where you only need to win one to get to the playoffs. Obviously, it's nice to get it done already, but this is far away from being the most important match these guys will ever play. Um, a couple matches down the line, maybe they'll regret not winning this one, but there are second and third chances to be had after this today. So, again, keep that in mind for our first couple matches. These guys are just playing for qualification, but it's still pretty chill. They have another couple days to make it there if they don't make it a day. I think that is fairly important to note. Definitely is. Firefly, 
kind of making a zealot here just in case he gets blocked in some way, but most likely will cancel it. I say that, but it's getting ridiculously close. And he's like, you know what? It's all right. I've got a zealot popping out at the perfect time. So just a different way of dealing with it. And got to mention, he hasn't gone for two gate on the high ground. So he's doing a very different, uh, um, different definitely out of the regular openings right like it's kind of like a low gate one gate yeah. expand but it's not at all it's on the high ground this is becoming like the more normal way if you are going to fast expand because even max backs the same man there's just too many ways they punish me for having a wall off now so just take the gateway mm. high ground this is still greedy because you expand before you put down tech so a lot of the time the um you know a lot of the time the tech is one of those situations where you would get a stargate then expand that's how max back does it a lot in this case we're just going to expand straight away and he's right too because lemon just sees it and says okay you know what i'm also just going to expand straight away so yes i had an extra gateway but i'm just going to put my expansion down anyways i'll still have two gears to work with now then they're both going to go into the twilight council and they're both building sentries which is actually a real oddity for the asia region we have just not seen this so far so actually getting to see some sentries is a real cool little difference uh, for asia i mean we've been seeing this in the other regions sure but yeah for asia we've really actually been talking about and laughing about how they really refuse to use sentries so cool to see this new sentry coming up of course it's just going to zap things down it doesn't die as easily and it will be really good for providing information because you will see constant hallucinations throughout this game as both players will have full info on what the opponent is up to yeah it's kind of funny that there's no adepts on the field like normally in this region it's like oh is he going two adepts four maybe six with an oracle like super risque play but these guys very respectful play very much about finding out what the other guy is doing and so far there's not much in it like lemon even though he had the two gates earlier and went for that far more old school setup he got his nexus down just as fast if not a little bit quicker it's going to be the blink that's very very similar between the two players Firefly is the guy with less gates to work with right now, but doesn't mean that Lemon can actually do anything on this side of the map. Yeah, I mean, he just doesn't have the numbers. He doesn't have the reinforcements. He still did put a lot of money into the Nexus. Firefly just drops down mm. the third base, man. Like, he is playing no chill at all. He's just going to go, go, go. I wonder if that's something which Lemon will try and do something about. Nope, he's just going to third base too. Okay, we are just playing the most macro PvP we've ever seen. Yeah, this is... I mean, this is kind of refreshing in a way, right? Like, this is, uh, you know, when you tune in to StarCraft and you're like, you know what? I've got like a good 20 minutes to burn. Like, I just want to play a nice macro game, not get cheesed. And this is absolutely that. Lemon throws down a forge. Usually that's a sign of Protoss being like, all right, I'm not going to die to anything. Let's get the upgrades going. And he's right in doing that. And we'll probably see it from Firefly as well. He's actually spamming out quite a few extra gateways now, probably thinking like, oh, I'm playing a bit greedy, but again, just full-on scouting he knows that he's safe doing it and now he gets some adepts out on the field in fact that was firefly right yeah yeah so i'm just gonna have a couple of those just to poke about a little bit and try and find a little bit of info and you have the charge and the plus one all coming up those couple of adepts continue to make their way to the upper left hand side as well so away they go as that robot facility comes in from both players next is going to be finishing and again we've got that charge starting up as well full lemon right now again that charge up and rolling for the moment Ooh, the Adepts do sneak in, despite there being a probe there, watching the door, and already quite a few probes are falling. Nice little surround attempt here with the Stalkers, but still, that's a nice trade for Firefly, and that's exactly what he was looking for. Both players going very quickly into charge as well. I tell you what, the production tabs have been so symmetrical between these two, despite different routes to get here, but so similar. Yeah. Yeah, at this point, the... Uh... They really have just kind of, they've, they've followed each other's footsteps, right? It might have not been the exact same way of expanding, but it's still a similar time. And now they're just going plus one, charge. They are both getting the same tech at about the same time. A couple of probes go down here. Firefly does have a work lead, so a slight edge in that regard. And the difference right now is also just that fourth base coming up. And there is a difference in gateway count as well. This is going to be going up to like two extra gateways. It was a little bit sooner than Lemon. That's basically the difference of getting the Nexus later, so... A little switch around there. Not sure if that's enough for Firefly to necessarily come across and do anything <laughs> with, so I guess we'll see. I can't see this game truly evolving into, like, the Disruptor Wars for a while. I think they're just going to go exceedingly ham on the gateway numbers, you know, like that. It became very, very popular when Hero kind of got back from the army, and it was like, okay, he loves gateways. We all love gateways. And now look at them both as well. Moving out across the map 
in the same fashion, both arriving at roughly the same time. Charge has been revealed. Lemon's a little bit faster on the upgrades, and Five Eyes One getting. In fact, he's coming back home to deal with this. Yeah, he's actually. Lemon's going to be able to get a bit of a surround on these stalkers. These stalkers are actually going to have to probably try and recall out of here. No, keep your stalkers going. I mean, if you blink on top, you should get quite a few of these before the recall is successful. And get rid of one, two. Yeah, only three stalkers get away. That's actually a pretty darn good trade for Lemon, who is going to succeed from that. So Lemon going to be able to take down a whole chunk of stuff. And now, look at this. Work account lead for Lemon. Upgrade lead is slightly in his favor. He's going to get the prism as well. So he denies further aggression. And Lemon's going to send it, man. This is looking good for him. It's looking really good for him, man. Like, he also his work account, he's been really good about the production. So even though he's lost more, he's got more as well. He's got more army available as well. Nice force fields out of Firefly here, just keeping the army at bay. But remember, he's also lost more battle units. And Lemon's just cranking out probes while doing this. And Firefly, he's getting behind in this game. And look at that, he just goes for that immortal straight away. Yeah, fights away from the super battery, right? So you can just get rid of the immortal. It doesn't get healed. It makes it an effective trade. Now it's maybe a bit more questionable because the super battery is still active and you're going to start running into it. We warp in a bunch more stalkers. Lemon, though, is just realizing, hey, I have the advantage. Let's keep this up. If I keep trading, this is okay. Whoa, Firefly goes, decides he wants the prism. He loses his next immortal, though. Of course, he did blink into this, which means that he's then going to get chased down. He can get blinked upon. And this is actually still looking very good for Lemon, who continues to look good in the numbers. And Lemon just keeps on trading now. The Zealot hits the mineral line. A few probes starting to drop there. I mean, this is just great. I mean, he's up 20 workers, 20 army supply. He's got every lead he needs. And Lemon is absolutely killing it right now in this game number one. Yeah, look look at the look at the income from both these guys. By the way, I think one thing we've got to mention, Lemon has been on two gases this entire game. Just two. He's not even mining properly from that one in his main. Okay, now he is. Okay, okay, he's got extra gases on that final base, but they were added very, very yeah. late here. So really cool play out of him. So damn heavy on the minerals and Firefly, I don't, I don't think he's got a chance in this game anymore. No, I love that as well. Catching that adept, just making sure it's one less thing you have to worry about, one less bit of harassment to look at here. As Lemon continues to press on forwards, the Zelds will charge through. The Stalkers and the Immortals still trying to follow in as well. We do have our plus two attack upgrade. Is not far from finishing here from Firefly, so that's going to give him a, a little bit of something, but, I mean, that's only equaling the upgrades. You know, Lemon already has that lead, and every fight that happens right now is with that lead as well. Let's just see the Stalkers pulling back over to the third base and a few probes transferring across to the fourth. Look at this resources lost time as well. Lemon's traded twice as well as his opponent here. I'm I'm actually so impressed. This is my first real washing of Lemon and everything he's done has been amazing, Wardy. I have loved the play out of him and he's just absolutely dismantling Firefly and that is not easy to do whatsoever. Holy damn, Lemon is here. Welcome to the Lemonade Stand, Ben. <laughs> this is where we get hyped up for Lemon because honestly, like if he gets... If he wins this, he's probably had one of the toughest routes to the playoffs out of everyone. And he's just done it no problem at all, you know? Like, nice, absolute contender. One Taiwan, time after time after time. Probably knocked Lemon out multiple times over in that region. Then he plays Oliveira. That needs no introduction. And if there is a player that's challenging, you know, the Asia region, it's either Cyan or Firefly. Firefly, one of those guys, and he's now 1-0 up against him. The Lemon hype train is so freaking real. It's going to be Lemonade all weekend, man. I'm feeling it. Yeah, that was real clean play out of him. Like, real clean. Smart, macro-centric, very much so. It was, like, all about getting the scout off as well with the sentry builds. I, I, I like how the game started off as well. He just goes for a two-gate, and then it's like, you know what? Like, let's block. Let's get that nexus down a little bit quicker. Let's play the same thing. But the greed for him, like, even though it looked fairly similar between both of them, his just never stopped until, like, he went for the four base, up to 70-odd probes, where, and then put on the pressure as well. And... Even though he took little bits of eco damage, it was like he all, always traded out a little bit better in terms of just pure value. And then he just had a bigger army and just very smart play out of him. I, I really enjoyed that. Yeah, me too, man. It's just it's, uh, been fun to cheer him on as we get uh, into this game number two, just waiting for the players to get swapped about. And we'll be off and away into round two of this action. We're going to Gold Nora. There's, of course, Mirror Matchup PvP. Mirror Matchup City for the foreseeable future here, unfortunately, in the Asia region, but uh, that's just how it is today. All the winners and all the losers are all Protoss. Zerg and Protoss and losers. I think all the Terrans are in the middle of the group, so that's where it has all been, as we just are taking a sec to get everything swapped around, but we should not be too much longer. We can head on into game number two. 
as yeah, Goldmore is going to be the map. Get this underway. Absolutely, and at the end of all that as well, Firefly, or rather, uh, Lemon was taking his fifth base as well, not slowing down. Oh, yeah. I think he was up to twelve, maybe fourteen gates at the end there, plus three on the way. Just really, really cool. I'm genuinely curious what Firefly is going to bring in this next game against Lemon because in that game of just kind of I, I want to call it like gentlemanly play between them lemon just outclassed him oh yeah no no lemon was uh lemon was popping man <laughs> he looked good as we get ready to go into golden aura we're gonna get this sent pvp time let's let's see what lemon brings man like i mean this is a very sunny game they match each other every step of the way they just both went into that macro game and then uh, like you said lemon just got the better trades made the better moves and he is now going to be sitting in the bottom right-hand side of the map with the 1-0 lead. This is the red Protoss player, Lemon. And spawning over in the top left is the Chinese Protoss. It is Farfla. Both Chinese, I suppose, eh? Lemon's Taiwanese, no? Taiwanese? Sick! I'm 99% sure about this. I will just double-check. I mean, for a while, I was like, me and Micah? Yeah, yeah, Taiwan. Hong Kong, Hong Kong. <laughs> you know, yeah. you, I mean, when, when you like, whenever I cast this region, and I'm like, oh, where's this guy from? Like, I, I always kind of expect my, my first thought is Chinese, but then it's like, holy shit, this, this well, region is definitely producing a lot of good players. To be fair, Asia has been very China dominated since it kind of became yeah. like the mix of all the regions, right? Because... We also used to have, like, I mean, we would expect to like, have Nice and Hass, like, do very well when Asia merged. But then actually, Nice and Hass have not had the best results in this region. They've struggled to make playoffs. They've struggled to make top fours. So uh, in that regard, yeah, this has been, like, the China-heavy region. So when you see another new guy kind of coming up, you probably do, like, think, yeah, Chinese. But yeah, Lemon played in the Taiwanese region for a long time. That's what I was saying. You know, he got beat up by Nice a whole bunch, probably Hass a whole bunch. He used to play Terran. Now he's playing Protoss. And now he's about to be moving on to the playoffs of Asia. It's amazing. There was like um there was another good Protoss from I think Taiwan for a while that was like up and coming. Is I can't remember his name for the life of me. It was like where we were or something. Oh, uh, but always. But always, thank yeah, you. Yeah, he played I don't in know the why, where... he was a Taiwanese player that was living in Australia, I think. So he played in the Oceanic region and he actually had some success there. Yeah. Yeah, quite a bit of success. I remember. I think he beat Risky, and that's why his name uh, really appears <laughs> to me. Beating be, beating Pidgey, you know, of all people. <laughs> Being good old Pidgey, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, this this game, by the way, doesn't look like either one's going for the fastest expand in the world. And far more regular mirror openings, I suppose. We do have the sentry very early on for Lemon. Meaning he will get those uh, scouts after this probe does fall. Or rather, in fact, yeah, yeah, Lemon. <laughs> I got so confused with the production tab. <laughs> it was kind of flipped for me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You can control yeah, like, uh, the red. What, really? Control X <gasps> flip it. What? Why? Yeah. Thank you, Wardy. Saving my life. It makes it so. I know. I can't do it with mirror matchups, man. In, like, uh, World Team League, they never flip it. Uh, same in GSL, right? They never flip it. I'm like, oh my god. Like, if it's a mirror match, I get so confused because I'm so tuned in to, like, the top player on the map being the top player on the production tab and the, and the scoreboard yeah. and stuff. So, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> it's wild how your brain works in that regard. All right, he's shield battery done in pretty damn good time here. So Lemon will be able to hold this. His expansion is a little bit... So oh my goodness. I mean, this is... This is Lemon playing good, but it's also flat Firefly. Like, you shouldn't ever lose a Stalker to the Stalker in a, sen a couple of centuries, right? Like, that was definitely a bit of a misplay there. Twilight Council for both of them, but Lemon just a bit faster on most of the stuff. Firefly did follow up with some sentries back at home. So he will be able to get continual scout information as well. I was just uh, looking at the history of Lemon a little bit, like his tournament history and stuff. Like he's never really had a huge result. The best result ever was 2019 WCS qualifiers. He got second place. Um, he was playing Zerg back then. So I remember him playing like a lot of Terran uh, for the past few years, like in the DreamHack regionals, but he was playing Zerg back then. Bust out a Haas. I mean, kind of crazy. This guy is just seemingly good enough at all three races and currently just grooving with Protoss to go on and run like this so yeah really sick um fascinating play to kind of read up on and you know i've been kind of getting on the hype train and you know like i said i recognize the name i knew he used to play a different race and stuff but like to really like look back and be like well what has he done and be like 
this is kind of it. Like, this is his run at the moment. Pretty sick to see. I always like when players switch race, and it's like, uh, you know, we, we had a classic that was initially a Terran, switched to Protoss, won a GSL. We had Neeb, was a Terran, didn't do much, but then switched to Protoss, wins three WCS <laughs> in a row in Kesper Cup. And, you know, there's there's usually one uh, common, common... Uh, underlier of all these things when they get to Protoss they stick with it and they do really well what, what about that Wardy what do you feel about that Protoss man it's good race to switch to it is good race you know to what to. it's because you know? it's such a complex race but if you get the foundations from the other races down making that switch ah. is so much easier you know so clearly that's it no I, I think you're absolutely right like for me personally, when I, <laughs> I was, I was going to poop talk a little bit more, but then I was like, no, nah, I won't do it. I know there's protesters in the chat that are watching and enjoying and stuff, but no, uh, the way that Lemon's just been playing, it's, it's just been smart. It's been clean. He's made it look simple as well. This game, he does have pretty much double the amount of stalkers here. They're both moving and grooving in the same kind of way. Lemon's Forge is a bit late to this game. But you see that he's getting a big lead on the Stalker. And this is actually very oh, scary whoa, for Firefly. Whoa. And oh, no. He blinked oh, as well no. already. Yeah, he blinked to get over here. So he's actually already got cooldown on blink. And if Lemon chases, he might be able to blink up and actually get another kill there. He decides to split his units apart. He's going to that bottom left tower. Very interesting, because I actually feel like right now, Lemon just killed a bunch of stuff. If he just sent it with everything, he'd be in a pretty good spot. I mean, he's going to back away right now. He's again just left so many stalkers bottom left. He does catch these adepts but I do think he's missing the chance to do some serious damage uh, by chasing this down. So yes, nice to get rid of the adepts but maybe an opportunity missed. Either way, Lemon definitely benefiting and once again army supply lead, worker lead, extra gates coming up Prism and Charge all on the way Gotta love where Lemon is taking this. It's looking starting to look very similar to the last game honestly You're right that he could have potentially, you know done a, a mortally wounding blow but, but getting rid of those adepts when, in his mind, he does have a lead already, not a bad choice, is it? It was like he had two okay choices to make, and he, he went for one, and he saved himself from taking damage. And he's really exploding behind this. The work account's very similar between them, but that resources loss tab does not lie. 50 resources lost for Lemon, 1,075 for Firefly in a PvP. Like, that shouldn't happen, and it's been a lot of unforced errors out of firefly here and now lemon's moving out across the map and you got to remember he used those hallucinations on the stalkers as well and there was no obs there to really know what was going on with that so but uh, lemon's just been playing smart i think oh my goodness big big blink right into the immortal here getting one down straight away the other one's not long to live in this world either luminek yep it's uh going to be a, a pretty decent fight for Lemon, who's just going to sit on this low ground, deny this fourth base, just looking to utilize this army supply lead, finishes up his upgrade, which was the one thing he was a little slower on, as he's actually just going to take down the sentry, so he could run up this ramp too if he wants, there would be moving into shield battery there, which is going to overcharge, but he's going to target that down, because Lemon just knows he's got the advantage, and Firefly is putting up zero resistance, just going to be seeing that pylon cancelling the warp in, Zealots are here for Lemon, and Lemon is about a 2-0 Firefly to move on through, which is... Kind of just a little bit bonkers. We have the Stalkers continue to go after a couple more of those probes. Now there's a lot going down. I mean, the reinforcements of Firefly are just warping in and walking straight into trouble here as we blink forward on top of the Stalkers. Even the Observer going down. Lemon is going to absolutely crush in this series. He looked... I mean, he looked like the player who was meant to be, like, the absolute favorite. Like, the other guy was never meant to stand a chance. And this Firefly is one of the best players in this region. Lemon has just absolutely dunked on him. He really has, like... The way that he's played also, like he is, it's not, this isn't a giga all in from him. Look, back at home, he's on 63 probes. He's still probing up. He's on four bases. GG. He made that look so simple against a really, really legitimate player. And every player that he's gone up against has kind of been the guy that you're like, oh, okay, you know, Lemon's going to lose. And it's like, okay, now it's Oliveira. He's, he's definitely going to lose, right? And then it's yeah. like, all right, all right, but he can't do it again. Firefly, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually on the lemon hype train, man. I, me too. I think yeah. all that was absolutely wonderful play, and just absolutely gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Actually, crazy, man. What a, what a result! Again, we talk about him. He's just not. Uh, I've just yeah. pressed every single button apart from the one I wanted. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, just a, a crazy result, a crazy performance. Again, his run to the playoffs so far. 
nice Oliveira Firefly. He's looked good while doing it. He hasn't been like a cheesy guy. He hasn't like cheesed them out with some like sick, oh, I'm going to proxy for it. No, it's been like solid macro games against Oliveira. It was super solid macro games. I just amazing stuff. I could never... After what he did previously, yes, I could have expected him to beat Firefly, but he beat Firefly easily in straight up games, which was even more impressive. Lemon just absolutely pops off, and he's our first player to make it in the playoffs of the ASL Spring Regional, so congrats to him. And uh, with that, we are going to get into more PvP. Yeishi and Cyan come up next against one another, so we'll be back with that in just a few. We'll see you in a sec.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back once again as we have more PvP on the way as Yeshi and Cyan look to book themselves into the, sec uh, the next stage of the Asia Regionals here in the ESL SC2 Masters Spring. Two players that have constantly been towards the top of the Chinese and of course the Asian scenes, so I'm expecting good things from both. Wouldn't like I think I'd pick Cyan as a favorite because he's a bit more consistent, but Ishii absolutely has what he takes to, to take down a Cyan, so uh, all-time match scores very close together. In fact, Cyan has won more matches against Yeshi, but has lost more maps. That's how kind of close <laughs> they are against one another. So, should be a fun another right. PvP. And uh, we'll see. Hopefully some more competition, because Firefly just didn't fight back against Lemon. No, he didn't. And these two, like the history of them, Cyan is very experienced. And I think the last best of five I got to see between these two, Yeshi went up 2-0 with Proxy Robos. And then... Cyan did a reverse sweep because he started hard countering proxy robos. And Jieshi, he came across as a super proxy robo kid. And Cyan, once he got a read on it, it really showcased like, oh, he's actually, you know, very solid at dealing with that. So the experience really kicked in. But to introduce these players, spawning over in the bottom right here as the blue Protoss, it is Cyan. On the top left, our Red Pros player from Dragon County Z Gaming. It is Yoshi. So, yeah, this is definitely going to be an interesting one for me. Because that kind of makes sense from the last time I saw. If they do play best of five, Cyan usually wins by the sound of it. But in the shorter series, like, you can definitely get caught off guard a bit. You know, it sometimes takes you a little bit of time to warm up to those kind of strategies and... In longer series, maybe Cyan does better and, you know, vice versa. But Jieshi is definitely quite strong. Quite strong indeed. Like, I, I don't know if he's mixing it up these days, but those kind of builds in these feisty, high-pressure 1v1 best of threes can be very, very tough to deal with. Yeah, well, that's uh, a very good point. This is, you know, high-pressure because the thing about these guys as well is, don't get me wrong, they lose, they've got more chances. And I would probably put them as a favorite, but I wouldn't say it's impossible for either of these guys to miss out on playoffs. You know, this is a competitive region. You've already got Oliveira, who's sitting there two and one, so he's your possible next opponent if you lose out here, right? So then you're playing Oliveira to try and qualify, and if you don't, then you're on your last life. So don't get me wrong, not the end of the world, but definitely would be nice to just book yourself in now and then not have to worry about the next few days and just get ready for them playoffs next week. No, absolutely. Like, Oliveira... No matter who you are, unless you're a lemon, you don't want to run into him, you know? Like, he's, he's just very, very solid. And I think there's quite a few other good players, actually, in, in this region that are 2-1. Like, where's Coffee sitting? 2-1. Yep. He's scary. Nice is scary. Nanami is no slouch yep. either. It's it's just... It's a scary place to be, 2-1. Just this whole thing in its entirety and just be like, Hey! 3-0, baby. You're going to be absolutely laughing. We do see slightly different unit choices out of both of them. Cyan's the one that's gone for the Sentry Stalker opening, whereas Jieshi, just the Double Stalker and a Stargate to start things off. Yeah, that Stargate is going to drop down. So we're going to see what we didn't really see last time, which is to Stargate and expand, right? Um, you see the Sentry Stone up from Science. He's going to put his gas there instead of some text. He'll probably expand without a text structure, but of course the Sentry kind of counts as a little bit of uh, tech as well. Let's just uh, see a Nexus going down on the natural. I always like Stargate builds, man, because very often it's an Oracle, right? And then it's about how well does your opponent deal with that? Like, it, it forces a lot of difficult situations. Like, you're, you're kind of stuck in your base. You need to have a certain amount of units to survive against it. I guess sentries, in fact, do they? They don't technically die as fast to Oracles anymore. So that's kind of nice in a way, a, a tiny little buff there. They also deal with the Oracle a bit better now that I think of it as well. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. Like, they don't die to the Oracle. They do extra damage to shields. Like, Sentry's really zapped, man. They really zap. So, uh, that's And that Twilight Council really will be... Yeah, the Twilight Council will be the follow-up here as well for both these players. So, the, the Stargate, even though it is a committal, it's not something that's like, oh, damn, he's, he's, he's counting me. Like, it still forces your opponent to be back and... Very often with that Oracle, you can take a third base a little bit faster, get edges in different ways, just because your opponent is a little bit pinned on two bases until they get blink up and running. Yep. 
Yeah, that blink is uh, going to be that little bit later, so you do got kind of, you know, held in a little bit. But it's not going to be too different as Stalkers are going to be there. Oracle gets pushed back. The Sentries and a Stalker from the Natural get a little bit of a push on that as well. Let's see those extra gates still coming up for here from Yeshi. And a couple more probes going through as well as so we continue to bring all of that into play. Yeah, Scion's build so far is just very solid, isn't it? Like, five Stalkers out, three Sentries. He's got Blink. He's Hallucination Scouting. And so far, hasn't really taken too much proper damage. And getting that Oracle as low as he's done so far for just one probe loss, a eh, not bad at all. And Gieshi is doing exactly what we talked about, by the way. Like that pinning scenario where the single Oracle keeps a good, like, <laughs> six stalkers and three sentries back at home. He takes his moment and he goes, hey, let's get the third base up nice and early. Yeah, the next is uh, going to be dropping into place, so. Just get that go over the dark shrine as the choice from sign. I mean, if he gets away with this, then that is incredible. He's got, you know, if he can push the Oracle back and stop it from scouting, that's the only detection we saw a little bit yesterday, how Oracles can struggle <laughs> against the TTs. Well, yeah, never mind. Revelation to, to confirm that dark shrine is there. Yeah, we saw yesterday a bit about how Oracles can obviously struggle against DTs. If you've got to, you know, revelate multiple of them, you run out of energy. It's just a struggle. But yeah, the scout is huge because now you just pop down the robot facility and away we go. I wonder if he waits for that Revelate to disappear and then cancels it. Like, that would be kind of funny to see, unless he's just going to keep on going with it. I mean, DTs, even if you don't necessarily get to use the DTs in all their glory, you can still warp some uh, High Templars in from them. It's, it's not the worst thing in the world, but Robos, Forges coming online for both these guys. Third base is a little bit later for Cyan, but that's not the, again, be all and end all, because his army right now, in, in terms of like, just what's on the map. In fact, I, I was going to say it's better, but Jeshi's definitely caught up in that stalk account pretty nicely. Yeah, no, he is, uh, he's looking uh, pretty reasonable when it comes to the numbers. 10 against 8. Again, the few sentries can be helpful, but they do scale down a bit the deeper the game goes, right? Force fields be less impactful, mm. guardian shields less impactful, just the more units there are. And just have the obs popping now, plus one attack coming up on the forge. Plus one attack coming up on the other forge as well. So a little bit of an upgrade lead from uh, he or she, Cyan. Just happy to get to three bases. And we continue to match as we go into charge lot stalker. I guess we're going to get charged at some point here from Cyan as well. The players have been kind of matching each other all day so far. It would be kind of weird to see him not going charge. I don't know what else he would really go as the next step, basically. No, I mean, it feels like going for the disruptors, like disruptor stalker combo, like straight away is definitely a, a bit out of fashion at the moment. Obviously, there's been some changes over the past few patches and whatnot. But this style that both of them have now got to is the go to. It's just very good, very mobile. And that's the big thing. Like if your opponent is stuck with those slower, tankier units that are all well and good, your opponent can really envelop the map and have their wicked way with you eventually and nice scouting by both of them continually but now Jeshi's scouting is going to be fairly minimal I'd say yes he's got an observer out but I believe Cyan does as well so Doc wow he's going for Shadow Stride quite quickly here is Cyan that's I mean this is already a different PvP to what we saw in the previous series this feels a lot more tricky and maybe that's just because the Stargate opening to start things off and then you know, it, it spirals out of control a little bit afterwards. Yeah, as uh, Cyan just very confident on the map, but he has way less army supply. And again, against those charge lots, I don't feel like he has a good answer right now. He's going to get a tiny heads up. This army's here with the hallucination. So he starts to pull back. He can force field if he wants to to buy himself some time, and that will be the play. Two of the sentries fell. The other one's out of energy, and now we're going to try and trade as these few zealots want to come up this ramp. A few more zealots warping in. He actually feels as though he can keep going. He did have the army wow. supply lead going into this, and again, with a few more zealots in front, they're just so tanky. I think they trade very well right now. They really do. And Cyan, he has nothing but stalkers. Like, Charge isn't done yet, which might be why he's a little bit hesitant to making his own Zealots right now, because they'd just be like me charging into a fight very, very slowly and very, very poorly as well. But Cyan, remember, he does have an ace up his sleeve here with those DTs. And that's a huge investment. That's why he's getting kind of pushed back a little bit here. Some probes fell somewhere. I think it was maybe at that fourth base, but... Jeshi's just kind of bullying him about a bit. Yeah, once it's still trying, just push into the front. Super battery active, though, and that might just be the end of this. So that will come to a close. Meanwhile, DT is going to poke around on the top side and just going to go for some damage. So, hey, that Dark Shrine is going to come to use. I'm about to have Shadow Strides. So the DTs will even have more options. 
That is something that's not helping you at home right now. Those super batteries faded. All these batteries' energy are disappearing quickly, but I just don't think Yeshi has the warping potential to keep pushing through, does he? A couple more stalkers shown up. There is the prison, but DTs are here now defensively, and apparently no observers, so that means that Cyan's army is going to start defending to some extent, but his numbers are dropping so heavily. The DTs are doing work, but he is just losing so much before those DTs have cleaned up everything. Yeah, I mean, those DTs absolutely keeping Cyan in this fight right now, and Jeshi is just kind of fighting through the pain uh, that those DTs are causing. And you know, look at some of the kill counts. One of these DTs has five kills, two, one. I mean, and those are all very valuable targets. They kept Cyan very much in this game, and Jeshi, it's almost like he forgot about the Dark Shrine a little bit there. Yeah. No, it, it kind of caught him off guard, and especially just the DTs in the army, like... Maybe one or two DTs showing up on the other side, cool, whatever, but to let those couple DTs swipe in your army for so long, it's the only reason Cyan's alive, because otherwise you could see he was just not winning that fight. He was absolutely done for. So Yeshi was an observer away from victory. He is going to send it again right now, but because he lost so many Stalkers, he doesn't have quite the army lead that he had before. It's still a substantial army lead, 58, 60 plus now to 40, but it's not, you know, it could have been already run. Let's see if he can make it happen. There's also Archons now from Sion, which could help in a big way as well against those Zealots. So I guess we will see. Oh, and those DTs in the north, they're going in right before those cannons are finished. I mean, that could absolutely spell some disaster. Blinks into a bunch of charge lots, but Cyan really doesn't have the numbers. Does have green battery overcharge, and I see red probes are dropping in the plenty over here in that north base. Perfect timing out of Cyan, and... I mean, damage being done absolutely everywhere you look, but Cyan definitely winning the eco game here. Probably going to take, yeah, takes out that fourth base. That was absolutely a great attack for him. Yeah, fourth base for fourth base, but he got a bunch of probes along with it. So now he's going to have a worker lead. And now he just needs to keep on holding on. And if he can keep on holding, there's a realistic chance that he's got this, right? I mean, his army will start to catch up as he's mining more across these three bases. He still has harassment already set up on the other side of the map as well. It's not like Yeshi can just completely forget about that, as we do see this from Sion, maybe a little bit too adventurous. He walked forwards, away from batteries, it exposed the Archons as well, so they went down very quickly in this fight. So that is a mistake from Sion, that's going to open the door to Yeji here, moving on in. And now Sion's in trouble, because those Archons, I really felt like, were a big part of this for him. And he just let them get extremely exposed. Extremely exposed, that was a very unnecessary move out. And I mean, he still has this War Prism in the north, with four DTs in it, Wardy. There was no need to move out there. Nice yeah. around on this cannon by Jieshi as well. We'll keep that base alive for now. These Stalkers just happy attacking pylons. Okay, no, they're not. They dive in, start taking out the Stalkers as well, the infrastructure, and Cyan, he's going to be kicking himself for that one. And even this War Prism goes down to that Stalker. Nice play out of Jieshi and GG. That definitely, definitely was a misplay. Like, you know you've killed that fourth base and all those probes, and you've held on. Your one chance that game was staying near those shield batteries. It really was. Like, it, 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 it's so damn important in StarCraft. Like, a game of tennis, you have to know when the ball is in your opponent's court to do something. Like, you don't have to make a move over to the net. You have to wait for them to come to you and see what they're going to do. And Cyan didn't do that. Even though he had all the, 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 all the counterplays in place, like that War Prism in the north that steal the damage and four DTs in it. You've got your army back at home just had to be a little bit patient there so probably going to kick himself for that one a little bit i wonder if he thought i wonder if like he kind of just thought that the army had gone so he's like oh i'm just going to clean up a little bit here but i mean it wasn't gone so then it just obviously looks like a mistake like just trying to justify because i think he knew he didn't want to fight out in the open just i just don't think he was expecting the fight so that was a bit of a uh display uh, he absolutely didn't think he was going to get in a fight right there but he also didn't even need to risk it, you know, in the first place. And very, very easy to say as an observer and, you know, as a caster and stuff. Like, I'm, I'm just kind of watching the moments here. I'm, I'm checking if he got baited by an observer. Like, he wanted to snipe this observer. He kind of starts moving down to his fourth, you see? Sees the army and he's like, oh, damn. Like, it yeah. was... Yeah, I... A bit too greedy out of him actually because i think he wanted to try and establish like the fourth base again nice and early but mm -mm -mm. brutal 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 stuff as we get ready to go into game number two we're gonna go to crimson court 
this is one of the maps we've talked about a little bit in terms of its interesting uh, kind of nature with that kind of narrowness it kind of provides until you open up the map deeper in the game so we'll see what that can mean for the pvp we might not even get to a stage where it matters because this matchup does sometimes trend towards the one base plays as we are going to be seeing in the bottom left hand side able to take the 1-0 lead eventually here is the red protoss player from dragon kaiser gaming yeesh I also want to mention, he had close to 1,700, 1,800 minerals at the end there, did Cyan. Like, even when he was charging into his third base, he had uh, 1,300, so totally a billion percent caught off guard. Uh, but spawning over in the top right here is the man with the experience. It is Cyan. He even did snipe that Observer, the one that I talked about, like, uh, that he might have got a little bit baited by. So even a few DT warpins, but he was very low on gas. Uh, definitely one that is fairly brutal. Yep. Not exactly ideal, as we just have. Gateway dropping down on both sides, a couple of simulators coming through. And, uh, yeah, probes coming up as well. Everything's just getting settled in for the moment. Going to see what the uh, the plan may be at the next step of this. Mm, so far, just very, very mirrored openings. They're both going to scout. Granted, Cyan does it quite a bit faster here. Both will be going for two gate on the high ground, getting the double gas set up as well. Standard stuff. And what do you think about this map, Wardy? I love it. I actually think it's really cool. It provides so many different ways to play. You can play a very narrow map. You can play a very defensive-based setup. You can you know, open up the map, you cannot... I think it's very cool. It's kind of interesting when it's super narrow because it is then very defendable, but it's not like the game has to stay like that, right? So I just think it's very interesting across the board. I like it. It's it's narrow, but the two valley situation makes it... When you, when you look at it like this and you see that minimap, it's actually a really long distance to your opponent's base, or it feels like it. And then the, the valleys down the middle are actually pretty damn chunky granted if you play like a different matchup where force fields can potentially be more influential yeah choking off a valley can be a really big deal but yeah definitely an map especially with the way that you can open up either side there's two sides to massively open up and just make this map way bigger so i think it's always fun when players have a lot of say on what they do with the map itself yeah no, I, I think that's I think that's the coolest part of it, right? Like you just get a lot of options, you just get to play your own way. And I think that's never a bad thing because it keeps the map fresher for longer. It's like Golden War, you know. It wasn't obnoxious mm -hmm. in the end. It was like it gave you plenty of different ways to play it. It wasn't just like here's one, two, three bases and you just go from there. It just creates more variety, so it keeps the map interesting for longer. And these adepts, they're not as good against these sentries anymore, Woody. Not as good at all, because normally you'd be like, bounce on them, bounce on them, but now it's like, do you want it? <laughs> like, are you sure? You go full uh, Clint Eastwood, you know, like, are you sure, punk? Like, <laughs> feeling lucky? And it's like, no, 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 not against you guys anymore. Not against you guys. And it's got a couple of devs to shade in the bow. The sentries continue to pull back as well. Depth's going to go commit in. Hallucination will pop and head across the map as well. It's just going to send that across the other side. we got ourselves... Obviously, the later Nexus here from Cyan, and he's going to be on a later Nexus. He's going to be on a later Twilight Council, and it's all because he's built an Oracle. But just one Oracle, uh, so you've got to hope that that gets something done, right? Yeah, I think Gieshi with that Hallucination Scout, if he was looking, he would have seen the Oracle already. Definitely gets confirmation that there's a Stargate in the main. But so far, no damage has been done to him. He looks like he's well-situated as well. Uh, so far, like, obviously, it's a opposite tech choice from both these guys oh sentries are here and you know they do do quite well but these adepts getting a little bit of damage done man you can really tell how good sentries are now because like that would not have been the case beforehand yep yeah sentries are kind of wild man they really do just pop they're, they're so good they're able to nibble away at those shields so quickly and again they're just so much more survive they're like they live longer against the adepts and oracles and so on the removal of that light tag is actually such a big deal Mm. These oracles do dive pretty deep. Oh, bit of targeting on maybe the closest oracle there. Bit of attack move. Could have maybe got one down quite more significantly here. But Cyan is starting to eke out quite a number of probe kills here. And he's 
not super behind in the stalk numbers. I mean, he is making quite a few more gateways here, a bit faster than his opponent, so we'll be able to catch up, but doesn't look like he's in any imminent danger to anything. Probably going to see, yeah, a very quick third base out of him, but also from Jieshi. So even though Cyan has those oracles where he can pin his opponent back a bit, Jesse's just like, oh, I can take third anyway, it's no problem. He even did it, they've both done it through the golden wall as well, the rich mineral field here. Yeah, it's interesting, right, because not everyone's been doing that, so this is one of those kind of scenarios where we do not play as much down the middle. We draw it out to the edges, and that could mean we potentially end start that scene, you know, a little bit of a longer game, right, because if you're going to play it around the edges, it's going to be tougher to attack into those bases, so tougher to make a move to kind of end anything. I think that's going to be a pretty cool factor to keep our eyes on. Blink is about to finish up from Cyan, by the way, so getting that blink completed. Forge and Linux is coming through too. And we'll have that all on the go very, very shortly. Yes, yes, yes. And I am absolutely going to keep my eyes on the gas counts from both these players. Right now, Jeshi just rocking off two gases still. I'll keep my tabs on when he does take more. Cyan is currently playing with three. Now, he did go for the Stargate option, so he needed to kind of catch up in tech a little bit quicker. But he's also... Okay, okay, now Jieshi is going for that gateway let explosion, as my friend Todd would say. Getting four at the same time, the Robo coming down as well. Charge, plus one a little bit faster as well. Even getting some cannons here defensively. Not a bad thing, right? We saw the DTs in the previous game as well as just having cannons. You know, defensively nice anyways, but also just in case DTs show up, it's just going to be an extra bonus as the Stalkers move in. They do not really succeed in anything. That is going to be a defense made very easily. As we do see a couple of those Stalkers continue to give chase for the moment. The Oracles show up though, and they're going to get a few probes that get caught on the warp in, so... Five work is going down, and Cyan is able to strike. He's opened up a ten worker lead, losing a couple Stalkers in the center. Behind on plus one. That charge almost done, and we see the Prism and extra gates as well. Yeah, she's about to send it. Will he be able to overwhelm? Because again, he's down on workers, so it might be a bit of a struggle to afford everything he wants to here. Yeah, absolutely. Like, there is a window for Jeshi here where he will have those zealots in the mix as well. Like, he can warp them in a little bit quicker, right? And it's kind of a similar situation before. Cyan will have those very, very bad zealots, but I, I like Cyan's position, honestly. Like, even though he's been losing out in the stalker battles between the two, I, I feel he's playing sensible. He's got nice stasises in good locations as well, just in case Jeshi is up to no good. Um, but I do like the fact that Jeshi is setting himself up for a, quite a quick fourth base here, despite taking quite a bit of eco damage. Yeah, he's um, he's getting that uh, settled down nicely as we just get that fourth down, and he is just going to go pushing across the map. If an army supply lead, we'd just love to see him keep on cranking probes, right? He's a few workers down. It just feels like right now he could absolutely just play catch up on that work count, and then he's completely set. Right now, I feel like he's almost leaning a little bit too heavily into the need to achieve something here with this incoming fight, so... We'll see a couple more Zelds get warped in there from the prism, and we will turn onto the rocks on the right-hand side, begin to knock our way through those, and away we go. He's still just on two gases, by the way, Wardy. Like, he's almost about to finish his plus two attack. So that is very, very heavy mineral income. He's adept dealing a little bit of eco damage, which is a nice move by Cyan, using that warp in over those minerals in the south there. But now Jieshi, this fourth base, definitely not long to live over here. So this is the kind of counter damage that Jieshi was looking for. And if if he does stabilize and doesn't isn't too quick to a fight over here, I think he's not in bad shape whatsoever. No, I mean, he is going to be able to play the defense. Obviously, plus two done from Yeshi as he tries to move in. Stays well popped on just a single Zell. The reinforcements, by the way, that's a lot of units showing up that just were not here previously. So that's why Yeshi could have a good time with that upgrade lead and now better unit numbers. Can he push in? Seems like the answer currently is no. Yeah, I, like, Cyan has invested a lot. He's got double forge without the upgrades just yet. That's a lot of money. This base very oversaturated as well. I mean, shield battery overcharge is an absolute dream in this scenario. Quite a few zealots are stuck in that stasis as well. Supplies absolutely neck and neck. But Jieshi, he has the army numbers. Those zealots are going to be free from that stasis as well. Both micro in their absolute hearts out over here. But again, Cyan 
huge investment that's not yet online with those forgers. He's got a Nexus on the way as well. That's not going to kick in here. You need to get out units, mate. You absolutely do. The Oracle's also doing everything they can on the back line, but Jeshi just pumping out the numbers. Big, Ooh. aggressive walk forward. Not going to get that walk prism. I mean, oh my goodness. That's Jeshi huge. just taking him to town. Yeah, not getting the prism is huge. The extra warping comes in. It was the lost damage time, and Cyan is going to have to tap GGs as Yeshi is indeed going to take it. I thought he messed up the fight too much because there was multiple points where he had stalkers stuck in the back and like unable to fire. And when you're fighting into the super battery and all the rest and against the concave, like you need everything you can get. And I thought that was going to be enough to just tip it over into Cyan's favor. That was obviously not quite the case in the end. And it was good enough for Yeshi to take it. And he is going to secure himself a spot in them playoffs. While Cyan, unfortunately, will have to go over to those two and one matches on round four of the Swiss group in I don't know if the Asia group resumes tomorrow but in a couple of days whenever Asia does go into round four that's when you guys will see Cyan again as congrats to Yeshi he's going to join Lemon Lemon and Yeshi the, the Asia uh, playoff players so far Ben maybe not quite the combo you'd expect not quite but after seeing how they played like Yeshi did look like he was just kind of meaner than Cyan right like Cyan trying to get leads in I want to say slightly tricky ways, and Jeshi just pure raw power. Like, that was two gases on four bases, which is really low. But the amount of units that he just cranked out, like, he was very decisive about it. And Lemon, to me, he looked like the most solid out of all of them. Like, the fact that he did that to Firefly, yeah. who, you know, Firefly is arguably, you kind of looked at him as maybe the best protoss of this region at the moment. Lemon absolutely had something to say about that. Cool, cool stuff. Awesome stuff. Well, we've got a couple more matches here in Asia. Mia Micah takes on Misaki as we're about to eliminate our very first player from the ESL SC2 Masters Spring Regionals. After that, yeah, uh, Jim and Max said we'll face a similar fate. So some ZVZs, then some PvP. We'll be back with that ZVZ in just a few. We'll see you in a second.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back once again. It's Mio, Mike, and Misaki to take us away from PvP for a brief moment as we're going to enter some ZVZ. Uh, I say a brief moment, I really could see this being a very quick ZVZ because Mio, Mike has been aggressive this event. Misaki has been aggressive this event. It's not landed them much success. They're both at 0 and 2. <laughs> but these are aggressive players, and you can only imagine that that's going to bleed into a typically aggressive matchup. No, I mean, me and Micah, he's. I, I was just thinking about this, you know, in the break. I was like, that guy is lovely. Like, you know, he. he I, I've played him in multiple RTS titles now. Like, he's actually very good at AoE 4 as well. Oh, yeah. And, and his aggression shines through in that game as well. Like, very, very aggressive. But I just love the fact that he just turns up to a LAN event, like... No mouse pad. He, he, <laughs> no, no mouse pad, yeah, I, I bring it up every time. But it's just, he is so chill and just obviously loves gaming, loves competing, loves aggression as well. And he's a very fun player to watch. Um, the other player, I don't know as much about, actually. Um, but be excited to see how they both do over here. Spawning over in the top left of Ghost River. It is the blue Zersaki. And in the top right hand corner, the red Zerg player is going to be Mio Maker. And I'm very much so with you, Misaki. He's not a player I even know much about either. Um, a little bit more of the unknown from him. Um, and what I've seen so far on this event is he took the map off nice. He just, again, played very aggressively, just very feisty throughout. When he played against Oliveira, he basically didn't get a chance to play. So he just kind of made mm. way too many drones against Hellbats two games in a row. So yeah, it's uh, hopefully going to be a, a bit of a show here for his potentially final round. If he loses this, he is out, of course. This is our first ever elimination match in this season. So they are going to say goodbye to the loser of this best of three from the rest of the tournament. Yeah, just to, to talk about, uh, you, you lightly brought it up. Both these players, me and Micah lost to XY before this, 0-2, and then Silky, 1-2. So maybe eventually going to make this a 2-1, and then his next match a 2-0, just to make it all beautifully mirrored. But Misaki had a much harder route. Like, Oliveira is your first match, Nice is your next one. He lost 1-2 to Nice, so uh, you get to kind of feel that, hey, he's not a bad player if you can take a map off Nice at all. I do want to mention, Misaki went for a very strange opener here. Like... He went up to 14 out of 14 on the drones, then an Overlord, then a Hatchery at 17 out of 22. So, very unusual way to do it. I'm not sure if it's the most efficient way, uh, but me and Micah went for a pool first, but a late pool, like at 16-ish supply. So, a far safer opening from him, but we'll have some Zerglings out nice and early here, we will Mio. Yeah, the typical Mio build. He did this against Silky as well. And he mind gamed with it throughout the series as well, because at some point he also went pool first, but then actually just went for like a weirdly timed queen and never made lings, and his opponent respected that there was probably lings coming, so something he might utilize to his advantage throughout the series. For now, these first few lings are going to show up, and we'll see if they can do damage. They're going to be here before there's any drones, uh, before there's any queens out to help defend. First lings only just start, and there's drones on this low ground, so that's going to be potentially easy grabs as we do morph Ooh. in the spawn, but we can actually out DPS the spawn build time here, and that's a kill on the spawn. That's worse than just letting the drone die. Because now you paid for this drone to die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a funny way of saying it, actually. Like, that is 50 minerals plus the 75 for the spore, then losing a drone in the main. Hey, I tell you what, that's kind of a dream start there for those four links. Yeah, they really got overlord done. lost. This is... Oh, man, this is this brutal. Is, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, this is a lot of... Uh, bad turns here for Misaki, because by the way that he's playing, by the way he's setting this all up, very much looks like he wants to play a normal backer game. And me and Micah, I'm seeing that he wants to stop droning and wants to pump out a lot of units. Like, he's already got quite a number of lings on the field. Granted, Misaki has a few as well, but Roach Warren, that is very nice and early. Yeah, no third hatchery as well, right? So just going to absolutely send it here. Um, and to be fair, already did a bit of damage. This also fits into me and Micah's playstyle, so I'm, I'm completely behind it. I understand where he's coming from. I understand his plan. I guess we'll see how well it works out in these next few moments. Did you see a few lings? I'm gonna jump onto this hatchery for a couple of moments. Gonna turn back around, hit those other lings as well. Just for a little bit. So, certainly is gonna do. And this forces out a lot of units, a lot of lings especially, but I, I'm i not sure. I don't think Misaki has any idea. Remember, he lost his scouting overlord. Like, he has no idea. He's still droning up. He's getting his own Roach Warren now, probably thinking like, oh, 
one thing I might die to at this point is a bunch of roaches, and there are five roaches finishing up. Uh, do you think he's just going to make ravages to make them move across the map faster? I, this is dreadful, Misaki, man. Yeah, this is so bad, man. I mean, this is just... I mean, this is miserable. You're going to lose your third hatchery that's built in here. I mean, surely we cancel that. We do, but... Yeah, everything has just gone extremely wrong, extremely early. These lings are even going to get in. Uh, are we about to type GG? Are we going to give it a go? He's building two Rotrons to try and help wall off because he hit one in the background. I mean, he is, I think, as you say, dead as a dodo. I do say dead as a dodo, Wardy. This is, this is brutal, man. This is very brutal. Like, he can produce stuff. GG. He's just out of there. One of the quickest games that we've had to date so far. And Mia Micah doing Mia Micah things. Just kind of took it, took him apart from the very beginning. The first four lings already had extreme success, and uh, never really turned around from there, did it? So there you go, GG. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I, I love StarCraft, man. Like you play against players where they're notorious for certain styles or you know aggression, defense, and you 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 play against them. It, it, and you almost expect it to be like, oh, they're not going to do it this time, right? Just it's it's like a. I always love those guys that are big fans of the the BM gamers. Like they'll they'll watch the BM streamers and then they'll be like, uh, "Oh yeah, I, I'm gonna play against you now." And they play against them. They get BM. They're like, "Oh my god, I didn't think you'd be like that, really, to me." And it's like no, they're like that to everyone, man. Like you, you got to be ready. You got to be prepared because the person that you know, the Mia Micah that is aggression personified, he is gonna be aggressive all the way to the bitter end. Oh, very true. So, yeah, uh, ready up, by the way, from me or Micah. So, he readies. Waiting for Miss Saki to give us a good little bit of go-go action as well. We'll get that going here. A couple of moments, and we'll be absolutely on the way into game two of this CVZ. Um, yeah, I mean, me and Micah show no mercy. He's like, oh, it's elimination match time? Well, I don't mind if your final match of the tournament is six minutes long. <laughs> Um, so yeah, because uh, I can 100% imagine me and Mike coming out with something very aggressive here again, especially when it worked so well just now or two. So uh, yeah, me and Mike, by the way, perfect record against Misaki. They've only ever played once, but he went 2-0, so me and Mike are looking to keep that clean slate as well if he can get the 2-0 here. Absolutely is. I, I you got to remember, like this is kind of like a pressureful or very, very high pressure situation. Like this is the do or die part of the tournament. Like. We saw the players making it through and then going 2-1 in the group. Now we're seeing the guys that are s literally life is on the line right now. And spawning over on the top left hand side here as our Red Zerg. I described him as lovely because he is. It is Mia Micah. In the bottom right hand side, we have Agathal's the Blue Zerg player, Miss Saki, looking to keep himself alive. He definitely does his build funny, man. <laughs> this is uh, going up to like 14 out of 14, then making the Overlord and things like that. Just, I don't know. I don't know. I, I remember playing against LZ Gamer and we were both in the EG house. I think I've probably brought this up to you as well. Have these kind of builds that are like slightly less efficient, especially when there's so much info out there of what is like the mm -hmm. most efficient build to do. Because uh, back then, it was like, you know, start off with six drones. You either do the the nine overlord or ten overlord extractor trick. And he just went ten overlord, no extractor trick. And I was like, what are you doing? Like, this <laughs> this is just like, I'm, I'm getting to his base with the proxy two racks. He's got way less than he should have. And I'm like, this ain't good practice. I'm going to stop practicing with you if you don't do a proper build. And he's like, but this is my build. And I'm like, mate, it doesn't matter. Like, if you've got... Like, if you link yourself to a terrible build, people aren't going to like it. They're just going to know it's your bad build. Um, so I'm always a little bit extra critical of uh, things like this, where you just get a little bit uh, behind because of it. Yeah, man. No, it's, uh, it's one of those things where, like, you need to show us the advantage of doing it, right? To uh, mm -hmm. yeah, really uh, you know, show us the advantage to basically uh, <laughs> make, it, make us believe. I guess, as the spawning pool is about to be done. So, we'll finish the spawning pool up, got the queens and drones all continuing through. We got ourselves all settled down. Oh, at the moment, pretty, uh, pretty comfortable stuff right now, right? I mean, you know, Mike is not being overly aggressive either, so at the very least, we're going to see a bit more of a game than what we saw in game number one. Yeah, me and Mike is keeping drones all on the gas, so that is highly, highly 
significant here, and he's getting a good overlord scout on this third base going down. I would not be surprised if Mia Mike is... He's going to make a third base, so it's not as crazy as the first game, but having all that extra gas, you want to do something with that eventually. I'm, I'm very curious what it's going to be from him. Yep. Yeah, he's uh, he's going to have it banked up. He's going to have money to spend, so... Again, for me and Micah, that's kind of typical as well, right? He's like, okay, well, I'm going to have this gas just because I want to tech at some point. I mean, me and Micah's build is not exactly the most efficient of all time oh. either, right? As he's going to get an overall kill again early, so just knocks that down, and that's such a bummer for Masaxmore. He doesn't know what's going on, right? Like, he's just... Yeah, he, he doesn't get to see what's coming. He doesn't know if this is a big attack. Lacking info is, is really sad. It's really sad, especially since you just... Like, life is on the line, and yet again, like, he's 1-0 down. Oh, oh my god, is this going to be Overlord number 2? Absolutely could be. Like, there's no Overlord for Mio, but he needs to get on top of that pillar, but probably thinking an Overlord will come soon anyway. Yeah. And he's right in thinking that there is, and... Bit of a disaster opening again for him, man. Really is, and there's a lot of lings on the way for Mio here. Granted, a lot for Misaki as well, so definitely uh, meeting the check of the lings early on. But that... He has a lot of gas, Wardy. That is potential eight Banelings going to come online here. Yeah, that's the big difference, right? He can afford a bunch of Banes from the very get-go. He's already winning this fight over here. Queen goes down. Now his own hatchery might be in some trouble on the other side. We'll see how the defense goes. He actually Oy. just gets straight into the natural. There's no Banes on the way from Misaki because of the supply block. Sorry, not Banes. No Lings on the way because of the supply block. He's defending with Queens at home. Uh, just absolutely disastrous, man. All the drones starting to drop down. Me and Mike didn't even need to morph in Banelings. I mean, he could have maybe morphed in a couple so that he could deal with the Lings more easily at this point, but that's just not necessary at all. This game and this series is done and absolutely dusted. Really is. Mia Micah doing Mia Micah things, man. And Misaki caught with his pants down two games in a row, loses the Overlords as well. Probably a very sad moment for him, but it will be an exit. And Mia Micah gets his first win on the board and you can feel it it's just kind of letting it sink in gg is called mio takes a very very swift victory swift victory convincing stuff just really no pushback at all from from misaki um yeah honestly i mean i guess looking back this was very similar to i guess i wasn't expecting to say this but it was very similar to his series against Oliver, where he just had no answer to anything being done throughout the course of the series and mm -hmm. he just kind of rolled over and died. And I thought he looked a lot better when he played against Nice. He had some plans. He had some kind of funky timings and stuff. But we come back to the ZVZ and he's just back to not having any way to die. I, mean, I get, you know, Mike plays more aggressively than other players and everything. But we're just back to kind of dying to the start of the ZVZ stuff. So I just, yeah. Not the greatest from Misaki, unfortunately. And that's going to knock him out of this season of the ESL SC2 Masters Regionals. Hopefully he gets to come back next season, right? You know. If this was his first taste, you know, maybe motivation to get practice and qualify again, come back next time. That would be great to see, of course, as Mio Micah will stay alive for one more round. And we only have one more round of uh, Asia today. Jim versus Max said we've been steaming through these games so far. This is going to be the PvP to wrap up Asia up next. So we'll be heading into that in a moment. And we'll see you guys very soon for that PvP.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back, everybody, as we get ready for more action here as we come to the conclusion of the Asia region today and the conclusion of their Swiss round three. This is the last matchup in round three of Swiss. Two rounds remain after this, and it is going to be Jim versus Max said up next, which is a little bit of the battle of the old guard of China, Ben. I mean, we talked about, about, about this yesterday. These guys who have just been here for such a long time, and uh, yeah, they've been playing for a long, long time. Max had Jim both. I mean, I think back to them playing in like WCS, like they played America, WCS America way back when. I'm thinking like 10 years or so ago, so yeah. Cool to see them here today, still playing, but both 0-2. I used to play against these guys back when I was competing. I, I just want to see if I actually do have uh, matches still listed. Like, yeah. I've obviously been inactive on a Liggy Lack for a long time, but I do think I used to play against both these guys even, but they've been around for such a long time. Like, when Max had played and uh, Jim, it was very much around the time of, um, like, two base Colossus All-Ins. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I, played, um, I played Max Ed in 2010. <laughs> so, for, oh my 14, God. 14 years ago is when I played Max Ed. Um, I, I, I won't brag about my results, Wardy. I won't brag. I, I, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I did win 1-4-1 to four, or four, one back then in a best of seven. Haven't played Jim officially, though. But, uh, yeah, these guys, absolutely old guard. And now they're fighting life on the line and yet again. Sporting over the bottom right-hand side as the blue Protoss here on Golden Aura. It is Max Ed. Top left, our red Protoss player here is Jim. Jim, Jim, Jim. Yeah, like, of these players, like, I, I remember, like, one of the first Chinese greats was Lona. I don't know if you remember that name at all. He, that means nothing to me, actually. Oh, really? Okay, okay. So, Lona was the, the first, the very first BlizzCon that we had. It was kind of... It was a weird BlizzCon. It was like a, an invite. So you had like the top two players of each region. Yeah. Um, and it was like Eastern Europe, Western Europe. So I think I, I went with TLO for mine. And then it was like White Rod to Marga. But Lona, he came second to Genius in the final. Uh, it was like one of the first big Terrans. Super damn aggressive. But both these guys were around uh, around back then as well. I, for some reason, I've got a feeling they're competing like WCS Europe at some point as well. Which, yeah, just absolute uh, powerhouses back then very much into the colossus pushes but obviously it's a different era of protosses these days i do remember jim playing i know going back to the wcs americas and being like he was like the colossus man like sit back colossus every single time felt like almost no matter the matchup as well and uh i remember a lot of that back then as obviously here in pvp in this day and age the double gates are very common and uh, the setup looks normal, apart from obviously we are seeing the one gate from Jim. This is becoming more and more normal. One gate, high ground, get some sentries out and just expand off the back of that has become a very common occurrence. Absolutely has. Max out going for the two gate. Jim, the one gate. It. And we're going to see, because Golden Aura, it's a fairly big map. It's been around for a while now. It's kind of hard to attack into a three base setup just because of... You know, it does have these nice ramps, these nice chokes to take advantage of. Jim just being here. He's got his nexus up very quickly, by the way. Like, producing a sentry first with that gas that he has a lot of. And he sh that obviously gives you a lot more minerals to spend. So Max said, probably getting uh, the worst end of the deal so far. Probe, not long for this world. And will most likely start up his own nexus era in yeah. the time being. I mean, it's just a later Nexus. You're doing it off an extra gate that doesn't really net you too much. Jim goes Robo Facility, though, so we're going to be seeing the Robo as the choice right now. That's kind of cool. You got the Robo Facility up. You can get that Prism out to harass with early, and then you can obviously go for a couple of different uh, options from there as well. So, yeah, I think that's going to be an interesting one. There's a couple of sentries nibble at some rocks, and just going to see the Hallucination popping out and going across the map. Yeah, we do see big differences in tech choices here. Like, Jim gets that scout off nice and early with Hallucination. Max Ed will join him as, so far, we've got almost nothing but sentries being produced from these players. Three, three on Max Ed's side. This is the one stalker that he has. It's going to be three sentries for Jim as well. And in a robo this early, that really allowed... Like, we, we talked about it a little bit. He was the Colossus push guy. 
and the fact that he kind of dives into the robo first and foremost, that to me feels very gym. He likes these big stocky units and always has. Yeah, I can get behind it, playing the less mobile, more defensive setup generally. We have seen, though, I always want to call this Robo more defensive, but it actually is very good offensively as well as what we've seen lately because you're getting these sentries out early anyway, so you'll have those to help you kind of dictate the push. It's actually become a pretty powerful way to play, although as you take a third Nexus, that's going to take away any suggestion of the idea that you might get pushing. A third's very early, but it's almost early enough that maybe by the time Blink is done, you'll have some stacked defense on it too, so then I don't mind the fact that you're going for an early third with a less mobile army against a highly mobile Blink. I will see how Jim approaches the defense on that, because I think that could be a very telling point of how this game is going to twist and turn. And remember, like, we, we also talked about how it's not the easiest map to attack into. Like, being in the right location, he Jim can kind of meander in this area that he is now from left to right. He's got an observer on that left side as well, which means that his opponent will be spotted if he goes up that path. And yeah, Max said it's not going to greet him with, like, all-out aggression. He is going to take his own third as well. Uh, both of them neck and neck on probes. It's, again, a very honest Protoss mirror, which, y y you know, this, this matchup can be played in so many different ways, but we've been seeing a lot of the honesty out of these guys today. Yes, we have, as the couple of depths move up. Stalker warping in, Blink is on the way now from Jim, but Max has going to have Blink much sooner. Already showing up on this base, so we'll put some damage onto it. There's a couple of force fields to help you out that will not help too much against Blink. We've got our force fields now, actually going to force field the immortal in with these stalkers, as Max said. I mean, that is going to net him a little bit of an advantage. Meanwhile, the adapts in the main base get a couple of pros, but yeah, more interested in how this fight is going. And that fight is since reasonable, Ren, right? I mean, actually, Max said and Jim both lose a fairly sizable amount as they continue to skirmish here. Looking for one more sentry, we get that. Is that the end of this? Yeah, we've got Blink now. Going to get one more stalker and then just Blink on away. I don't even know who I like that more for. Uh, I, I think that Max had handled that pretty nicely. It was a nice little adept attack into the main and did get an immortal for his troubles. Jim doesn't really have any potential to move out against him. So if I was in either player's shoes, I definitely feel Max said feels like, okay, okay, I just keep on macroing up. I can maybe use, he can use Chrono Boost however he wants at this point, be it on probes, upgrades, you name it. It's doing it on the upgrades right now in his main base and a massive gateway explosion as well. Losing a few immortals definitely takes the the wind out your sails as a Protoss going for it that early. Yeah, I mean, especially when you went for the immortal and now you've lost it, so you lost some of that defensive capability. And as you see the rest of these stalkers, immortals coming out from the left-hand side. You have a blink about to finish, the prism coming up, extra gates coming through, and it's plus one in charge also on the way right now from Max. Let's continue to bring that through as well. Absolutely is. Charge very quick for Max Ed here. And I do like the fact that he's kind of utilizing this map control advantage that he has in a good way by taking a very quick fourth base. And when charge is online, I mean, oh, shouldn't be too risque about taking fights over here. When charge is online, he will have a nice answer to these immortals. But I tell you what, Jim is moving out across the map with quite a feisty number of dudes. And he had, they both have eight gateways currently available. Yep. That's a lot of gates, but uh, I mean, as Jim comes in here, he only just has a slight army supply lead. I guess he has got those two immortals, and they really do pack a punch. That's why the zealots are important, right? If those zealots need a lot of the immortal shots, he can really negate the power of those. Force field's coming down, though, and that's going to work against those zealots. So the zealots, unfortunately, will not get as good a fight as they want. However, we get rid of one immortal during this already. I think Maxed is doing the, the right things to give himself a good shot at closing this one uh, out defensively for the moment, at least, as Jim is getting ready to go for round two. Yeah, I mean, Shield Barry Overcharge has been used. That Warp Prism is quite far away for Jim, so wasn't able to actually pick up his Immortal and save it, which that would have definitely helped you a lot. And Max said he's doing a good job of just buying time here. And remember, all the Sentry energy gone, all the Sentries gone, in fact. And now Max said feeling so confident to just go back. No more reinforcements for Jim, and his minerals are sky high. His army is getting absolutely cleaned up. Max said actually handled this overall very, very nicely and very smoothly because it wasn't the easiest situation to get yourself out of. Yep. Well, we just have ourselves the, uh, the Forge, the Probes all coming through here from Jim. Stalkers and Zelda still making their way up to the top. And again, that's a Prism and a few more Stalkers coming up from Maxed. Charge starts from Jim, but this is just going to feel way too late. I mean, the fact that Maxed can instantly come across the map and be like in your face aggressive already. Like he has his own two Immortals mixed into this now. So he's the one that's now packing a punch. 
And Jim, this game has just not gone well enough for him. Max said, he's just taking the better fights throughout, and with those moves, he's absolutely looking to solidify himself into a 1-0 lead in this best of three. As this fight over here, just again, these moors have gone untouched completely, so they are not going to have any issues closing this out. GG's, and Max said, takes the lead. Uh, that was actually good. Like, overall, Max said looked like his, his build was far more of the meta, getting the Twilight Castle early, and utilizing it really well as well just being able to feel so safe against your opponent like don't get me wrong robo first can do something but you have to have like either a warp prism nice and early with like adepts in the main or use using the warp prism to its full potential there losing the immortal just kind of sat there in the front line not really doing anything that was sad especially when a warp prism is just like a screen away could have been a bit closer you know um so max are definitely outperforming jim in the first game Absolutely, and uh, time for Jim to step it up a little bit because down one, life on the line right now. He did take a map off of Firefly in this event, so his PvP has some amount of potential, but then he did get toured by an army as well, so... Like, he's got potential there in the PvP, just needs to find the, the spark again a little bit, perhaps. Like I said, looking to again get his win and get back on track here in the Asia region today. As, yeah, he's one map away. Again, the players into the lobby. It's Oceanborn for map two. But honestly, I feel like I may as well make a soundboard bite for this. Oceanborn map two, because it feels like this is the case every day, every series. We've seen this so often uh, since we saw Gas in the last couple of days, Ben. It's actually kind of crazy. It is really crazy. But I'll tell you what, I've been... And it's, it's the Chinese region, again, that's been very much about, like, oh, let's not let's not be too risque, eh? Let's not be too risque. Eh? Let's uh, stick to what we know, stick to what we know. Which is kind of funny, because I've always thought of this region as the I'm going to be gigger aggressive in your face. And they, I guess they still are sort of like that, but it's not as uh, black and white as it used to be. No, this matchup is... Um... I love the Sentry Chain, it really mixes so much up in terms of what you can do and how aggression works as well. Oh, it's, it's fun, as we have Oceanborn about to pop into play. Max and Jim going up against one another. Let's kick this off and see who is going to take down a game number two. Will it be the Red Crawlers play on the top left who needs to win this, keep that ESL SC2 Master Spring regional performance up and running? It is Jim. And spawning over the bottom right-hand side, as our blue Protoss, it is Max Ed. Been a lot of two zeros today so far. I do think... I do think the play that we've seen from a lot of these players, though, has just been good. I, I, I especially yeah. can't stop thinking about Lemon, man. Yeah. Me too, man. I'm sad that Lemon's gone for the week. Well, actually, I'm not because I'm not here for the rest of this week after today, so... I'm glad that I'm going to be back when Lemon's playing again. <laughs> Yeah, it's just cool. Like, I, I I keep, whenever I'm casting days like this, where, you know, they're long days, I'll walk away in my break of four minutes and just be like, man, that was really nice to see. Like, very often when new players, or when I say new players, when players are rising and it's like, you really want them to do well, and you're like, hey, now's your time to show me how well you play. And it's like, holy crap. Yeah, you did it. You, you hit the mark. You did everything right. And... It's just gorgeous to see. It's and it's hard, man. That was a high pressure situation. Like you beat Firefly, or you potentially, you know, start your road to elimination, and he absolutely met the mark. Uh, Jim going to be going for the same sort of opening that he did in the previous game here, where it's just one gate on the high ground. So most likely a very quick expansion from him, and yet again. Yep. Sniper core coming up on both sides. A lot of people, like I say, have been adopting this one gate play. Just the single gateway, kind of playing from there, and uh, just kind of getting a fast expansion up, utilizing the ability of these new sentries to just be a little bit more kind of stand on their own, so you can just produce sentries and go from there. You don't need the two gates of production. It's been cool to see, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By the way, Wardy. What? How's the RuneScape going? <laughs> you finally found something that's not a disaster for me to talk about. Is that what it is? You've been hunting. Oh, really? I'm, I, I've been I've been throwing darts at this board. All things I'm like, what oh, is good at this, right? What oh, is good at this? No. Is it going well? Yeah, risk is going good, mate. They just released a new like. Are you still? Well, well, they released like a new like hard end game like challenge. And I just beat it the other day, so <laughs> I got my new <gasps> best in slot range cape. 
so... Oh my goodness. Yeah, pretty good, I guess. Are you still way better than Loco? Yeah, Lo Loco's a scrub, man. It's not even a, com not even a competition. <laughs> I, I love that Loco is getting involved in some of the things that the other yeah, casters I... like, <laughs> and he's just worse at it than everybody else. <laughs> well, Loco is Loco's like an, an everything man, right? Like he does a bit of this and he does a bit of that, you know. Like now he does his Warhammer painting, just sits there streaming it, chill. It's a good life, mate. <laughs> yeah, like he, James came to my stream even like Laris because he was the one that got him into Warhammer a bit, right? And he's like. Ben, look at this. And he just shows me this blob of red paint just smashed on a, a, a model. And he's just like, this is a disaster. And I'm like, this is the best. This is the best timeline for me. Just <laughs> Loco taking on all these things, literally being the jack of all trades kind of guy. You know, like, <laughs> oh, anyhow, anyhow. This game, Jim, bringing a totally different gear here. This is a very aggressive proxy gate, although it's not super damn close. But it's close enough that you know that he wants to deal damage and he has no other tech. This is a four gate against a blink opening into a fast third. This is this has a lot of potential. Yeah, man. It is uh it's gonna have some possibility right here as an extra sentry warps in over on that natural, and we do have ourselves the power coming in from Jim. Just absolutely sending it off of four gateways, just going before any techs available. And Magus is building a third base and all sorts. He is not ready for this at all. As the stalkers and the sentries come through, I'm just going to move past this uh, expansion and in towards the natural now. He's not. What? Okay. I was oh. like, Max said, were they your force fields? Okay, just wall him out, gets the sentry for his troubles, but did lose a few units. He's buying a lot of time. But he's on two gateways against four here. Like, that's a lot of shield batteries popped up. Nice force fields. And yet again, shield battery overcharge is used. Jim, do you stick around against this? No, no, no. He moves away. And remember, he's kind of on a bit of a clock here. Like, this is going to be a lot, a lot of yeah. units, but with no blink very soon. And he's even getting his own aggressive shield batteries here in front. This is really cool out of Jim. Yeah, Max is going to have a real army supply issue, but again, it's about Blink. The problem is it feels like Blink is just a little bit too far away. I don't know if he's been able to get any Chrono Boosts on it recently. It feels like it could have maybe finished up a little bit sooner, and now it's just not been the case. It looks as though this is going to be all trouble for Max, and his gym just continues to look very, very good here. And by the time Blink is done, there's basically going to be no Stalkers to Blink back anyways, especially with the reinforcements that Jim has coming in. He's going to knock down this pylon, so all the batteries are going to be completely depowered on this natural as well. And here's the blink. It's time to make magic happen, Maxo. With a third of the supply, you're going to have to blink your heart out and more. Uh, yeah, I, I think Jim, very cool executed build here. And, you know, he was sharp. He was decisive. This is the kind of game that Jim likes to play. Just in your face from the get-go. He's the one dictating the pace and the strategy. And Max said he didn't uh, caught with his pants down. Absolutely was. Like, he was getting his shield batteries online and such, but... He did not know what hit him. Still, shield battery overcharge can work a lot of work, a lot of magic. It's keeping the stalkers alive, but nah, I think it's too little too late. Yeah, the numbers are just too high for Jim. I think Max had way too greedy, right? That put, uh, third base being on the way and everything is just way, 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 way too much initially. And uh, yeah, I mean, this obviously looks as though Max said will fight until the bitter end, but he's going to lose the natural. Jim is making a third. Jim has anything and everything he wants in this game. Basically, I mean, it'd be nice if Jim had Blink on the way, I guess, but he's honestly fine. GG is cold. And we're going to go to game three finally here today. We certainly are. We certainly are. And what a way to get there as well. Like, I, I really love the shifting gears. And I, I'm also a big fan when you get to play series against players and you get to kind of show what looks like the exact same build, like the one gate, the... You know, it, everything looked the same. It's just follow up is absolutely not. And very often when you're in a series like this, you, you just automatically assume like, OK, OK, I've got a good read on what's going to happen. And then it's like, boom, absolutely you don't. Like those builds are extremely dangerous, especially in uh, mirrors like this. Uh, admin just came out of game, <laughs> said GG and logged out. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you just wrote a question mark like, hey, what are you on about? Uh. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a new one. <laughs> uh I'll uh I'll message the other admins and uh And be like, mate, the other one just left. Uh 
Let's, uh, let's, let's clean this up. How's it going, Wardy? <laughs> it's good. I'm, I'm just best the admin, the, the, the main admin team. <laughs> Come back! <laughs> that, that is what happened, though, right? Like, he said GG. He's offline. Like, he absolutely just thought this was a 2 0. He's like, man, I just watched Protoss win two games in a row. I'm done for the day. Early finish. <laughs> yeah, you, you can. You can definitely, uh... Maybe he wasn't paying full attention, right? <laughs> Maybe not. Oh, you just, you just hosting it. Ah, uh, yeah, why not? I think we'll be okay. Why not? Why not? Yeah, Although there's actually, a, there's actually a special mod we have to use, though. Oi, oi, oi. I tell you, you know? I tell you, Wardy. Yeah, I actually don't what know what... Because there's a bug fix on the, the mod that we've been using. Oh, really? For what? One of the maps doesn't let you interact with the gas properly. As in you can't build the gas on it? Or... I, th I think, like, when you take the base, it, like, blocks the gas. But, like, but, like it's not actually, like, a map thing. It's, like, a... Because otherwise they would have to edit the map, whereas this is something they can actually edit with the mod. So it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's something like that, as far as I know. Map is hosting for us anyway, so... I think we'll Good old go. Mapu. The eyes of esports at it again. What a legend. Oh, our, our referee's back, guys. He's back. <laughs> Whoops, one more. <laughs> oh, this is funny. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Welcome back, ref. <laughs> Good to see him. Good, Good to, to see have him. you. <laughs> I mean, you, <laughs> you got, yeah. all you can do is laugh, isn't it? It happens, man. You know, sometimes you just forget. To be, I, to be fair, I think the Asia referee is not like super, like a StarCraft guy, right? Which is completely normal as well, right? Like people work multiple games or something. He's not a super StarCraft guy. Um, so he probably, he probably just got mixed up. Like he's like, oh yeah, this guy just like whacked the guy twice. Makes sense. See you later. All good. Yeah, I'm going to be in oh. game in a second. Mm -mm -mm -mm. I like. Uh, I like. I kind of want to. <laughs> he seems very serious now, but um... <laughs> I kind of want to be like, oh, you know, did you have a, like a hot lunch date that you had to get to or something? Like, uh... <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Alrighty, alrighty. I love how he's like checking. Wait, you, we definitely had one guy win game one and the other guy go in game two. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. All right. Well, Wait, we will uh, get everyone Wait, in on gym, gym as well. Oh. Jim's here. He's cool, here. blimey. They need <laughs> These to are the moments I live for. They need to do the color swapping now. Oh, they did it. That's a good job. Good job, team. Yeah, this referee, when he's actually in the lobby, he's, he's doing a bang-up job, you know. Bang-up job. All right. Well, we are going to go into game number three, the decided map here between Jim and Max, said to see who is going to come out and uh, stay alive in this tournament. Who is going to get to play Swiss round four? Who is going to wrap it up and put their, you know, hang up their shoes for the season? Hang up, hang up the mouse and keyboard, I suppose. As uh, we're starting up, ready's across the board. PvP time has been aggressive this series. Uh, I honestly kind of expect the aggression to stay the same going into a game three here. Me too, and it, it really depends. Like, what is Jim going to bring this game? Is it going to be very similar showing of an opening into like, oh my god, I'm blasting it? Like, the 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 ball is kind of in Max Ed's court here. Like, he got caught out very much. He had the he had his hands on the rain in the first game for sure, but can't be letting that happen again. What happened in game two? Spawning over in the bottom left-hand side of Alcyone. It is down to one map who stays in and who goes out. It is the Red Protoss. It is Jim. In the top right-hand corner, the Blue Protoss player from Invictus Gaming, we have Maxed. I've liked... A lot of the games today and they've all been kind of different as well like when, when i see that pvp of lemon and again lemon i know it's all about lemon just clean it looked like it was hard to exploit you know so i'm i'm curious when i see a play like that is it just one of those things where somebody's so good that they make it look so simple and so easy that actually replicating it is way way harder and i mean most likely the case. And I felt like that with 
pretty complex things in real life. Like, if somebody understands this very complex thing, they can often explain it very, very nicely and easily. Whereas somebody that doesn't truly understand it, they make it sound really complicated when they're trying to. You know what I mean? Mm hmm Yeah. I get what you mean. Like, I can imagine you talking to me about some science-y math stuff and being like, Oh, yeah. Make it sound easy, you know? Maybe, Whereas if maybe Roddy back was in the doing day. it, <laughs> yeah. Whereas if it was Roddy or Loco, they'd be like, "Oh yeah, it's the Hulk, mate." And I'm like, "Oh my goodness, what are you on about?" <laughs> is that is that what we come back to? The Hulk. Every time. <laughs> you love Every the story. Every time. Mate. Did Did anyone send you the link to the clip? No. Oh. No. no. You're gonna have to up. The, you have to up the bounty, mate. From from five a fiver to maybe a tenner. Yeah. I would absolutely pay a tenner for that clip. It is so freaking good. I I like I. I I'm I've never right heard. Now. Yeah, I've never heard anybody sound so freaking confident and be that wrong. Huh. I don't have to. What? I'm trying. I'm trying to like be smart about finding it, but it's not working. So I tried. Yeah, being smart's hard when you're not. Anyhow, no, I'll get it. Buddy, I'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, pain, pain. <laughs> oh, I. You know, I had a good rest yesterday. I'm on. I like. I, I played three ladder games this morning as well, and I went into it. This. So the other day when I played some ladder games, I went into it thinking like, oh, let's see how bad I am, and I was like, oh my god, I'm really bad. And today, I went into it thinking like, oh, let's see how bad I really am. And I won three games in a row, and I was like, oh, yes. So I'm just feeling good today. I'm feeling chipper. Feeling chipper? Nice. At this rate as well, we're going to get a little break between Asia and Europe, so we're going to be even like more powered oh. up for EU. It's uh, oh. it's wild. What are you going to What are you gonna eat on your break? Fish and chips? Uh, I don't need it. I don't need <laughs> I don't need to eat anything. I'm, uh, I ate before what? we started. I ate before what we started. You I had, a, I had a sandwich. Thank you for being very specific here what with the sandwich. I had a ham and cheese sandwich. It's very basic. Oh, you're so... You know what? It, you know what it is. Okay, this is this is a story, but I've not had a basic ham and cheese sandwich for like literally like two or years or something. And so I was in what? the shop the other day, and I was like, "Man, I really just fancy a super basic sandwich." So I've been eating basic ham and cheese sandwiches for lunch all week. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, this is like the most mirror-y kind of game that we've had between these. Like, both going for the blink. I, I think uh, Jim again went one gate, so he got his up a little bit faster. And he seems very fond of this kind of stuff. Like, very fond. And he's the one taking a very fast third base here. Kind of, kind of cool, honestly. Like, all three games, he showcased something very different, whereas Max said is a lot more linear. Yeah, no, it's, it's true. I think Max, it also just feels as though he's like, hey, I've got a good build, and I feel like if I just get into a normal game, I feel confident, so he doesn't maybe need to feel the need to mix it up as much, right? So mm. imagine that's uh, part of the idea as well. Stalker warping in, a couple of gateways, and the robot facility still building on the side of Jim, and Nexus is over halfway done as well. And, and honestly, uh, with a build like Blink, like, it's, it's so good. It's so good, and it, it really is one of those, like... The better you are, the better you can make it look as well. Like, the the limits are really endless. That's why you see players like Max Pax utilize it so often in Hero. Like, yeah, I remember back in the day when it was like, you had certain players be very force field centric, like the MCs of the world, and even parting to some degree. But then you had these players that were like Liquid Hero, and it's like, every unit look like looks like it has a mind of its own with how it moves. Max said is moving out with quite a ballsy armor here and Jim. He has a good amount of stalkers ready here. Granted, he doesn't really have any energy for his sentries, and Maxed gets on out of there. Yeah. Oh, nice adept pressure. So that was the reason he did it. Yep. Nice little uh, bit of a move on that one. Let's just have the uh, devs getting in, and they're going to be able to come through four workers pretty much straight away, so immediately diving into some damage charge on the way. Much faster here from Jim. As those gateways come up as well, we'll see if he wants to utilize that charge finishing sooner at all, or if he's just going to be sitting back chilling instead. We'll find out very shortly. He's not. He's not probing. He's not. So no. I think he's. He's Ascended. absolutely just. 
Yeah, 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 he's got to. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if he makes an extra pylon or two back at home so he doesn't have to ever worry about macro, because right now, he can't make any more units. And that is a little bit problematic, especially with him... Okay, there we go. Some more pylons coming down, because he's chrono boosting these gateways. So he really needs those pylons online very quickly. And Max said he's only on two gateways right now. He's got six finishing up kind of soon here. I mean... He's getting away with murder right now, given the fact that Jim is very supply blocked and can't warp in units, despite having like a good 900 res in the bank. Yup, Zelda's warping in the back. Super battery's activating onto that stalker as we get ready to split apart. And we're actually gonna go die for the natural, maybe? How are we gonna do it? Max said, like you said, would really benefit from spending some of that extra money. Super battery fate in here has not really been that active throughout this, so. Yeah, Jim, I like this set up, but he still needs to get more done. I mean, he's going to have a lot of warpings available right now, and that's a big deal. Maxit is still floating that cash. He's still having an immortal during this, but can he have the numbers to actually hold on? Oh, the Stalkers at the front are just struggling because they're hitting Zealots, and Zealots are just so freaking tanky. And it feels like Maxit is losing the play on both fronts. We were hitting the rope facility for a bit there as Jim. Now he's going to double down just on this third base, and the probes have to be pulled. They really do, but remember, Max said has had greater economy. Still got so much money to spend here. Very nice reinforcements, but by golly, he's losing a lot of units here. Jim powering on through. Max said he's got so like that. That plus one is still not yet done for him. And I mean, Jim, he's feeling it slow down a little bit. Maybe feeling like he's done the damage he was looking for because he starts a forge, getting sentries as well. Interesting choice here amidst all this chaos, because. Yeah, they deal extra damage now, but against the blink, oh, he's just going to go to the side. I like the choice. Yeah, I like it because you can get the robo from there, right? So I don't hate it. Wait for the batteries to fade away on the other side. I mean, we're still just about ahead on army supply, but it's getting closer and closer. And a few zelts from the top side get rid of some of the sentries, and it feels like the stalker count disappearing from Jim as well. As if the stalker count dies off, that's a problem. The plus one there from Maxed helping as well, and I think Maxed is on the very verge of holding on here. Wow. I think he is too. That's a lot that he has. That war prism, he has to be so careful. I think that was an accidental load there. And Max said, takes the pounce. And Jim has to go home with his tail between his legs. Didn't get the third kill. Didn't get the kill either. This is now looking very grimy for uh, for Jim. Absolutely it is. This is not looking pretty any longer, is it? He gets chased all the way away. Max said with the defense. And obviously Max said with the plus one already done. Feels a little bit better there. He also already has himself. I actually guess that's the only real difference. Uh, the gateway count is evened out at this point. He is going to pop out of prism very shortly and going to go across the map with that. So, I mean, he's looking to utilize his advantage and uh, rightfully so. Yeah, rightfully so. Like, James starts off his plus one now. Let's have a look at the straight up unit count. I mean, both very heavy on the zealots. There's not much in it. Like, I don't think. I don't think Max Ed can just gig a punch on through. I say that, but some sneaky zealots go <laughs> make their way very casually into this main, and oh my goodness, they're not. There's no reaction. Yep. I mean, this is just huge already. Just eight probes going is that, down. Is that an Artosis pylon? That is oh my power, power bunch of gates, all of them. Oh. Oh, that's gorgeous. Yeah. I he should lean on this now, and that's exactly what he's going to do. Nice. Nice play. Max said, takes a win 2 1, and Jim, that's it. 0 3 in the group. 0 3 in the group, and uh, you mean he took a map against Firefly, he took a map against Max said, but at the end of the day, it just wasn't enough to kind of see him through to you. Swiss round 4. I mean, it was going to be a long road, but uh, his road will unfortunately come to a close. It will be Max said that gets the shot at keeping it alive and keeping it going, moving into the. Uh, Next round, moving into that round four of Swiss for Asia, which I believe is... I'm going to double check when it is, actually, because it's bothering me that I don't know. Because it's the next couple of days are Europe and America, so Asia resumes on Saturday. So Asia, Swiss round four on Saturday, if you're wondering when these guys will come out and play next. So, uh, yeah, look out for that, obviously. And uh, congrats to Max, that he's going to make it through, alongside with the other victors today. Uh, either making it through to playoffs or making it through to round four. Let's take a quick peek at what we've seen here in Asia as we have had uh, Lemon, 2-0 Firefly. I think that's still the story of the day and of the tournament so far. And then Yeshi, 2-0 against Cyan. That's a good result for him. You know, Mika finally gets a win on the board, knocking down Mosaki. And Maxa gets one on the board, taking out Jim. And now only 2-1 here in Asia. I mean, it has all been about that Lemon talk, right, Ben? Uh, yeah. If there's, if there's any series to watch today where you just want to watch clean play, Lemon. <laughs> it, was, it was really good out of him. Yeah, I mean, 
The guy, the guy's solid. Like in this region, you got Coffer bringing out clean builds, and you got Lemon being just. Hey, he is absolutely. If he keeps this up, like I don't want to jinx him at all. If he keeps this up, he's absolutely looking like a contender for this region. Oh no, absolutely! Like right now, he's been absolutely great. He's took down a lot of the top names, so been absolutely awesome to watch that so far. Uh, well, that leaves us with obviously the uh, the break before Europe because we've just finished that quickly. Europe's not officially allowed to begin until 4 p.m. CEST. That's 30 minutes from now, so we're gonna go to a 30 minute break just because well, all the games were kind of fast today, as we saw. Um, and when we come back, we've got a bunch of great matches coming up from Europe. If you're not sure what that might look like, uh, can I get that schedule up for you guys? You know what? I can. Give me two seconds, guys. We'll just have a look at the schedule live instead of just talking about it without a graphic. So give me one moment. Nope, that's not the button I want to press. <laughs> I was about to say, you're amazing, Wardy. I'm amazing. amazing. I was like, nope, that ain't it. <laughs> uh, whoops. This is Oopsie. it, though. <laughs> this is it. We're going to be starting the day on the left side with all of the players who are 2-0 and oh and looking to make playoffs, similar to what we did for Asia. Just obviously there's two groups, so twice as many. Which means we're starting off with Clem versus Goblin, Skillers versus Spirit, Raynor versus Hostum, and Showtime versus Max Pax. And then we go to the elimination matches. Petit Drogo battles Aristori. Nico Rack takes on Rodzin. DNS battles against Milky Cow. And Fordjumi will play against Geralt. So all of that is coming up when we return from this break. 30 minutes, a bit longer, simply for the fact that Asia finished quickly. We'll be back with eight best of threes of Europe when we return.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. We're back and it's time for Europe. We're going to be kicking off with a banger because Goblin had an upset the other day against Hero Marine and that means he now gets to come in and play against Clem. I'm really excited for this one. Um, I think it's going to be a great way to start Europe as we do have eight best of threes in this region. We did show them a little bit just before we went to the... Uh, Went to the break, we can have a quick peek at them again to see what's coming up just as we get into game. Clint vs. Goblin, Skillers vs. Spirit, Raynal vs. Hostum, and Showtime vs. Max Bax will be the first four coming up. Everyone's 2-0, and looking to make it to the playoffs. Ben, how are we thinking about this first TVP? I mean, if you were to tell me, like, before going into this tournament, these two are going to end up in a match at 2-0, I'd have been like, you're having a laugh. Like, Clem for sure, Goblin? Ah, probably not, because... He's been fairly fortunate to get here. Like, even that series against Mana could have gone either way. But the fact that he is here is impressive, because Goblin is definitely a guy that likes to turn it on, and when he does, he does it in Goblin fashion. Like, he was one of those Phoenix lads for a long, long time, and he was very, very good at it. So when it, when he is on point, he's a fun player to watch. And spawning over in the bottom left-hand side, as our Red Proros, it is Gobbers. Gobbers. Top right. <laughs> I don't know. I really like the fact you called him Gobbers. <laughs> <laughs> In the top right, our new Terran player from Team Liquid is Clem. I, I don't know what we call Clem. Clem has. <laughs> so ah, really Clem is a good one. Uh, it, I mean, Gob Gobbers is obviously top that's, tier. That's, that's top tier. Yeah, that is uh, top tier nonsense right there. But um, yeah, this is probably. <sighs> I don't want to jinx Goblin, because this absolutely, like, Clem is one of the best DVPs on the planet, and he gets to play with one of the best PVTs on the planet literally every week with Max Max, right? Multiple times, be it on EU, NA, you name it. That's a lot of good practice. He's practicing a lot with Mana as well, just, like, training him up in his PVT. This is a, a seriously scary opponent. Probably the scariest, well, I would say the scariest opponent Goblin could run into in this group. Yeah, no, I mean, Clem is, in my eyes, he's genuinely the favorite to just go out and kind of win this whole thing. I mean, there's no several this season. Reynolds playing from Korea. Yeah, Max Beck can absolutely kind of take it out against Clem, but there's just something about Clem when it comes to these events. But he just steps it up that level, right? So, and yeah, I feel like, you know, Goblin takes a map every now and then off of um, Max Beck's and the PvP and so on. But Clem almost always is just going to be like a difficult one to take a map off, never mind a full series. So I do think there's going to be a challenge. I do think there's going to be tough for Goblin. I I'm very curious to see if he does just kind of approach this in a very standard like, hey, I'm just going to macro away. Or if he is more so going to be like, oh, dear, like this is not going to be pretty. Let's try and get the cheesy uh, playbook out and, you know, call up a couple plays from there. Yeah, like the, the Goblin that I know is a guy that even though he can be cheeky, like he has done in the past. For me, he's very much a guy that, hey, he's liked Stargate play uh, a lot in the past, but he does tend to follow like a similar pattern in his games. Like he has a lot of faith in his builds, plays a lot of games with the same builds, but it's because he's good at them. And right now we got a double Cyclone opening from Clem with a CC on the high ground and starting up a second barracks very early as well. So it's not going to be like uh, some three CC play just yet, but. It is going to be very, very heavy emphasis on minerals uh, for, for the time being. And so far, just looking at how these builds collide, I definitely like where Clem's going with this one. Yeah, Cyclone pressure against Stargate almost always feels good, right? I mean, you build an Oracle, Cyclones will push that back easily. Phoenix, not necessarily as much. And that's simply for the fact that obviously the Phoenix can lift the Cyclones and take some of their DPS away. Uh, but obviously it really depends on how early it is, because right now we're only just about to have our first Phoenix. 
the uh, Cyclone's actually back away from the center there. The Adept does not shade. And so Clem will continue to the bottom left and look to apply this pressure in the next couple of moments. These Adepts are about to walk into trouble, but they make it a shade, and so they will actually keep themselves safe. This is a moment where Clem does have to be careful, because that Phoenix has not revealed itself yet. And I mean, Clem, he, he's one smart cookie, man. Like, I think he's done this build because he kind of knows what Goblin does tend to go for, and we'll see it for the rest of the series if he does similar stuff. But this, putting on this kind of pressure against a Phoenix opener, it is something that, you, you, as a Phoenix guy, you want to have your Phoenix across the other side of the map. Because if you actually look at Goblin's vision at this stage in the game, he doesn't know what this is being followed up by. And, and Phoenix need to know. You need to get a grip on what's going on behind this. Yeah. No, I mean, he's uh, he's kind of blind in that. You're right, because Clem's going to have all the pressure here. It's going to be very tough for him to find that out. Super Battery does just about save that Stalker. So just going to be... Uh... Yeah, nicely handled as we just have Stim, Combat Shield, all of that coming through. And obviously Clem very ready to play into that bio play nice and quickly. Yeah, and this, this is really the kind of freedom that you get when you go for a very... Oh, I mean, uh, it, it's like a trapping opening, really, from Clem. Like, if you played against Blink Stalkers, would you be able to do this? Absolutely not. Like, it's... Yeah. It, it feels like he had a good read on what was going on. And maybe Goblin will finally be able to get out on the map, but he has to be careful with these Phoenix from this point on. Like, they're a very valuable valuable unit, but he is going up against a guy that I get the feeling has a very good read on what he's up to. Clem's getting these turrets as well, which is like, has he seen anything? Remember, he didn't scout with a, a Reaper or anything like that. He just came across the map push, but he's already getting turrets in place here, so... This makes me think that the predictability of old in Goblin is something that Clem is very, very aware of and very capable of being uh, the leader against. Yep. <clears throat> no, I'm with you. It's uh, really looking as though uh, Clem is looking comfortable. I mean, now pushing in just a game before Goblin really is ready with anything, so this third base is in trouble. The Phoenix are out across the map. A couple of SCVs go down, but now we're going to have to recall this. The third base is cancelled. I'm going to go ahead and say it's a disaster. Cancel third, but two SCVs is just not pretty at all. It's not pretty at all. And PVT is a brutal matchup for a lot of reasons. Like, Terrans can have a whole array of openings. Some of them can fall absolutely flat if against the wrong thing, but some of them can absolutely reign supreme. And I think Clem knows that this Observer is here. I mean, these Cyclones uh, kind of give the game away. And again, Goblin is just... You want to be on three bases right now. Like, you, you don't want to be the defender with Phoenix. They are a great unit, but they're a great aggressive unit. And the first Colossus is halfway done. And you see here, Clem's got a few of Marines in position here if the, the other third is taken. And Goblin is just getting absolutely strangled in this game so far. And I, I don't know what he does from this point on. Just too far gone, right? Like, you can't let your third base get cancelled this repeatedly against a Terran who, okay, isn't on the fastest third base ever, but it's not like Clem was, like, overly aggressive here either. This was not some crazy two base all in and Goblin had to give up the third. No, this was just pressure, and it's pressure that's resulting in such a high amount of value from it. It's difficult to see where you, you're right. Where, what do you do as Goblin? You try and take the third again, you just tech up, and I guess you hope Clem takes a bad fight. You do not have a lot of control in your own hands, though. This is kind of waiting on Clem to make a mistake at this point, which is never a good feeling. Ooh. It's never a good feeling. And th these Phoenix are starting to get a little bit of damage done on the other side of the map, but he needs quite a bit more, considering how delayed this third is. So let's have a look at the probe count. 53 to 52. Clem reaching his 1-1 upgrades. Goblin's done a good job of macroing just on these two bases, uh, to be absolutely fair to him. And that... Phoenix count getting up to eight is scary. Like, that absolutely can turn a fight if utilized very, very well. And Clem, I don't, I'm not sure he wants to take a fight out in the open here, especially not with all these chokes available and stuff. And he does need some more meat in his army, like the Marauders, which he does back up with. Um, and now he's going to start going for the Ghost Academy as well before the armory. So, very much about getting three ghosts out very, very quickly. And that will absolutely spell problems for Goblin. Because Goblin, I don't think he's thinking too much about five minutes from now. He's more thinking about, okay, okay, I've, I've got to go. I've got to go and sort him out. So he starts getting this warp prism to reinforce. But 
once those ghosts are on the field, that's <laughs> that's going to make short work of this army. Yeah, no, Ghost Viking is the combination that really just shuts this all down, and especially when Goblin hasn't been able to kind of, you know, beef up his own army himself because of that lack of economy early, that delayed third base has that knock-on effect. But yes, what he has right here is not bad. But again, the size of it is about to become a problem when EMPs land on it, the Viking count gets a little bit higher. Clem is on the verge of being in a very good position against this, and I think that's something which uh, Goblin is very close to realizing as well, which he's, you know, he's going to take a fourth, he's going to take extra gates, but I like that he stays on the map, because I feel like he does want to try and poke and find something before he kind of falls back and just tries to play the rest of this game. Absolutely. Uh, there are four Vikings being made at a time, so this number from six to ten. And then com in combination with uh, the EMPs, these Phoenix, all the energy that they have that they haven't really been able to use, even these Cyclones sat in the main base over here. I mean, oh, has to be careful. Oh, one of them almost biting the dust there before any kind of fight begins. And that ghost count's climbing, Wardy. It really is. There's a bunch of ghosts coming up as the Argonne can see a few Zelds already charging forwards. Turning around, a couple of EMPs dropping down. The Phoenix is going to come through as well, going to go jumping onto the vikings so a little bit of action on that once again plus two attack comes in comic comes up got all that on the way and the next from goblin is about to finish so yeah he wants to i mean he's trying to progress his position he's getting the templar out as well but the problem is i feel like clem's army has already progressed it's already ready and i think clem should be ready to move out on the map in a moment and take advantage of all these things that we've been building up for him also, if we look at the work account here, Clem on 69, nice. And Goblin definitely trailing behind. He's got quite a lot of investment into upgrades on the way, but it really does feel like he's he's banking on these Colossus really being his backbone. And Clem just has a counter to everything in that army right now with a superior economy as well. It's, uh, it's a tricky one for him, man. It really is. Yep. Tricky, tricky, tricky. As a couple gates come through, the plus two attack, arm um, upgrade, blank all coming about. As we have, again, the army continuing to the upper left hand side. The Vikings are looking for a chance to maybe get onto these Colossi quickly. Any free shots on Colossi is a big plus. So we do EMP the Archons initially, too. Uh, just because, obviously, if you knock Colossus down early, you don't have to fight through the Phoenix to get them in the actual fights. So. No, I mean, if Goblins to take a fight right now, it just got kind of EMP'd, <laughs> wounded down quite a little bit. I like this little run by from him. We'll get some Zealots cause a bit of distraction but Clem quick to react it's just even though Goblin's army is absolutely huge it's not necessarily the biggest tech army is it like no there's six Phoenix left on the field three Colossus three Archons 28 Zealots and this this Terran army it's 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 terrifying absolutely is like Goblin's gonna want to be on the map look for trades with those Zealots so we can actually get out some very high value units but he has, to, he has to do it in a, in a nice sort of way. Like, he does have Clem pinned back, which is fantastic for him. But Clem, it's not as if he's slowing down in any department. CC is coming down, third starport. He's going to look into getting range liberators as well with this, getting all the upgrades he can think of as well. He's sitting very pretty. Yep, looking very pretty indeed as the bike comes through, knocked down that dead. Vikings going to go for the Phoenix, shooting away there. Let's see the rest of the bio stamming up. These Zelts are going to charge forwards. The Phoenix still taking a bunch of shots. I mean, the cutting backwards from Clem so far is just great. He's going to knock down so many of the problems. I mean, the Colossi have barely fought in this fight so far. Uh, and, and these are just trades where Clem is going to win out pretty much each and every time. Uh, so far looking very good there. Oh, I, I like the attempt from Goblin there. The, the Disruptor in the mix. Very hard to see, but Clem... Yeah. Responding very nicely, and now these Colossus. This is a Clem special where he's just marching backwards, just picking off this army. And even though it doesn't look that terrible for Goblin, you look at the supply and you're like, "Oh my goodness, it is working out for Clement." Yep. And we do have the uh, the libs on the way as well. So his army's only getting better. So if he is going to have to face disruptors, liberators help a lot with that because it just zones the Protoss army. And then it's very difficult for the disruptors to ever sit in a far enough forward position to be useful. Goblin's going to attack in, but I mean, you're attacking into EMPs and Vikings and all sorts. I mean, it's just, I get it, like, he's probably feeling a bit desperate and he needs to find something. That disruptor shot wow. is good, so that helps, but it's a long way off what he needs. I mean, if he can get a good three or more like that, and he does have quite a few disruptors in the mix. I mean, he's working with mobility here, but 
Oh, is this the fight you really want to take? That's a lot of disruptors. It's a lot of firepower as well. Blinks under the Liberators, but there's not enough anti-air here, Wardy. His army gets absolutely butchered, and Clem, I think he's just going to chase this one down. He's looking for it, getting a big wraparound. Disruptors will get some okay shots off, but Clem, he smells blood. He does indeed, and he's going to chase it down. I mean, we kind of saw this coming, and especially Goblin just trying to force the fight himself. It was kind of doomed from the very beginning as Clem now can just come all the way across the map. Disrupt a shot Ooh. there, dead center. I mean, that's something that does buy Goblin a few more moments and maybe a bit of life in this game. He gets to chase the air units down, so a bunch of free supply in Clem. Oh, I thought he was just going to walk across the map and win. He's going to get held up for the moment. He certainly is. He's still ahead on SCVs, and, you know, he's keeping up in bases. In fact, he's very much keeping up in bases on 5 CC behind all this, and... He's got more <laughs> orbitals to make if he does so, please. But again, what? how does Goblin Remax? He's got three Robo Facility, which he's absolutely been cranking out units on. But the gateway mass that he has, oh, it, it, it's very problematic because right now, Clem, he can produce like five ghosts at a time, six libs at a time, and that will make short work of Goblin's army. Goblin does have, again, mobility. And how does he use it? He goes down this right avenue over here. Wants to keep Clem away for him. Yep, absolutely. If he can, uh, if he can just, he's playing this army right now where, yeah, you can kind of poke in and get out free. You don't have to be fully committed to a fight. So that gives you the time to build back up, right? And that's what he's going to aim for a little bit. He can disrupt it to force Clem back again. I like that, even blinking forwards. Goblin, really not afraid of the situation. He will play for every possible unit he can grab. Uh, so that's good to see. Clem is still chasing this. He believes he can get something of a catch, and he is going to find one disruptive for target fire and is there, but he actually decides to just keep fighting the Stalkers instead. It's a lot of disruptors, and that is going to keep Clem at bay for now. Clem has to be careful here. Like, he's ahead in supply, but it's not all here. And I mean, this stutter step in, he will pick off these Zealots one by one, but these Blinks forward are getting some high-value trades. Now more Ghosts join the army, and EMPs are magnificent. Their regular damage is so good against the Zealots as well, though. Like, Goblin is trading, but he, he definitely needs more, because once these Liberators come out and are fully online, he needs that army far away from him. Like, he can't get pinned back. Yep. I mean, this uh, army's actually in a bit of a weird spot. The Stalkers was blocking the uh, units from getting away through the gold mineral gap, so... For a moment, we got kind of held up. Clem keeps on splitting. He's been dodging most of these disruptors. They're starting to come off cooldown again, so Goblin gets a few more shots, but he lost a lot in that fight because a lot of the Stalkers went down, and that's going to kind of bring us to this point now where Clem falling back once again, but has been, uh, again, definitely trading decently. Uh, resources lost is actually only just in favor of Clem, but he's also sitting on the five bases. Uh, yeah, I mean, across the board, honestly, you look at everything, it's fairly even apart from the actual numbers of what's up and arguably the army quality of Goblin, but he's also now on his way to Colossi again. And I like that because that's something which provides stable, consistent splash damage throughout a fight. The only issue I see for Goblin is plus, well, it's 3-3 three, three bio, which is scary. Granted, he does have 3-3 three, three on his units as well. It's just plus two liberators. He's absolutely banking on being able to get a good fight against them, isn't he? Like, absolutely banking on it. Positionally, if he gets forced back on his side of the map, which is where we're fighting ourselves, this is where he doesn't want to be. This is Clem's playground now. There's choky avenues. He's also able to harass these bases with these lips. This this is the problem area for Gobbers. Yep, I would agree with that. As our Stalkers blink through, one, two, and three Liberators go down just as they get uh, sieged up, though. So that's a good start to the fight. Going to be seeing our stalkers Colossi going to fight as well. A couple of Marauders, Marines getting chased away. And a couple of those libs getting shot at it as well. So, again, Clem just can't seemingly get into the position to kind of truly end it. Which, to be fair, is kind of meant to be the problem against an army like this. That's why Goblin is on this army. It's very much so that scrappy army that keeps you alive and keeps you in it for an extended period of time. Even if, overall, it's maybe not the strongest of armies in a straight-up fight because you're so reliant on the Disruptors land. No, I mean, Goblin's actually holding his own. Like, I I've been expecting Clem to just kind of run away with any one of these fights. And you do see that he's got libs set up on bases that he expected Goblin to have, but Goblin's very much taken the south side of the map. Lots of sensor towers. <laughs> Finally gets to see that observer that's been there the whole game, and he's now got quite a lot of Vikings online. They do have good upgrades against these Colossi, but that's a healthy number of Protoss. It, it really is. Yep, there is a lot of it. 
As the battle continues in from the upper right, we are going to see the CC landing down. The Vikings still coming through, the ghost coming up, planetary fortress building as well. Another CC is also producing. Just going to be seeing the stalkers there, going to get rid of that orbital. Now the double liberator going down as well. Turning around, Colossi like getting rid of a ghost as we go, and a couple more SCVs now getting dropped also. This is actually getting really scary for Clem. Like, these disruptors making magic happen, and his army that he has, he has to be so, so focused on it, doing all the right things at the right time, because Liberators on Siege, we've seen quite a lot of them go down, and Goblin's doing a good job of just utilizing his mobility here. It's, it's like the one true strength he has. If he starts teching into, you know, the Blink DTs of the world, it's going to be hard for Clem to really settle, because that, look how much Brodos that is, Wardy. It's a lot, man. And there's so many disruptors too. As the Vikings are going to try and make a dive on the Colossi, and he is starting to get them. It's again those disruptors. They constantly push Clem back. So every time Clem seems to be kind of stepping forwards, the disruptors are like, no, no, no. You don't get to just jump on me like this. And those Vikings are going to be with the Bioforce backing away there. But they got rid of the Colossi, and we're back to Zealot Stalker Disruptor. I love the Dark Shrine from Goblin. That's the kind of chaos later in this game that could absolutely go a long way, right? I mean, just having DTs harassed with are such a huge deal. DTs are massive, a massive thorn in the side of any Terran, and EMPs are kind of, you know, landing very sporadically here. We do have a few liberation zones here, so it's hard for Goblin to move forward, but I like this choice by Clem, just kind of expanding closer to where his opponent is expanding as well, because having the fights where the bases, which your opponent would definitely not like you to have, allows your rally to be there. These disruptors definitely a pain, though. Yep, they're still moving about. We see a couple more stalkers being shot at. Bio still firing. Another disruptor shot comes through as well. Not quite going to land just yet. It's another disruptor shot, and then Bio Force has to dance to the side one more time. It's such a low marine count for Clem. It's just all value units. Like 18 rows. That is a lot of stalkers blinking under a lot of libs, but they're all EMP down. They're also accompanied by a bunch of marauders and. Clem is splitting all over the shop. Oh, I was going to say mitigating as much disruptor damage as he can, but Goblin absolutely fighting back. Resource was lost is so damn close as well. 33 apiece, but that's a big disruptor. That, oh, that absolutely had potential to swing this fight. And now Clem has to be very careful about this wraparound here. Yes, he does. A couple more libs getting served to the top side. Just trying to kind of play this from all directions. And obviously it's difficult to get the libs to jump. It's funny because... The libs play so slowly in comparison to the Stalker Disruptor. We're actually going to go blinking forwards here, so Goblin believes he's got enough. Clem has quite a few Marauders under there, but as the Zealots show up, maybe not enough to keep it going. Clem's Bioforce in general could do with a few more reinforcements as these Stalkers will take down Liberators one at a time. Obviously, we fall back to a Planetary Fortress that will help against these Zealots as well, but then there's going to be Disruptors that can hit the Mineral Line. Clem already evacuates the SCVs, realizing that that was going to be a problem. Yeah, Goblin, he's actually... Clem's probably got not the best read on this situation. Like, he is kind of struggling for supply. He's constantly spending all his bank here as well. Whereas Goblin, his pro count's decently low at this stage. And Clem does get to spot this little base down here. That is a nice spot for Liberators being able to find out about. But I, I think Clem, in his mind, he's like, you must have lots of workers here if we continue fighting. But it, it's not actually that bad. He's just got a massive army supply. So these fights for Goblin, as long as he keeps not doing bad in them. He's actually, he just needs to keep Clem on the move. Can't let that Liberator count get too high. Well, Stalkers blink across the right-hand side. Bio will stim up again. A bunch of these Stalkers continue to drop. The Vikings are going to be here as well. And we just have Clem I mean, again. It feels like right now Clem's army is quite small. You just need some reinforcements to come across, I guess. Obviously, this is a fight on one of these Protoss bases, although that's a place that Clem eventually wants himself, most likely. This time, a lot of the Liberators are preemptively sieged up, so it's going to be a lot more expensive to come pushing into this. The Disruptor shot still forcing the Terran player to take steps away. Another Liberator has gone down, and this just continues. These two just dueling until the bitter end in this game one. And resources lost tab, and yet again, 42.6k versus 42.8k. Like, they're trading so damn closely. It, it, it feels like Clem's economy should be better, considering that he has how many orbitals at this point? Nine orbitals on the map. But Goblin, he is just a, a real warrior with this army. Like, seven disruptors, lots of zealot stalkers. It's a very simplistic army in that sense, but he is absolutely throwing everything he has at Clem right now. Yes, he is. The bio gets the disruptor. A couple of zealots going down. Another disruptor shot up the ramp. 
We see another one flying through as well, trying to get as much done as we can. Libs will continue over to the right-hand side. So many zealots warping in suddenly from Goblin, as he's also going to try and expand to the left, somewhere he's not really been to yet, so would love to try and grab that. There's a couple of lib shots coming through, probes taking damage. The fire of course backing it away a little bit as well. Yeah, you, you can really feel like uh, Goblin's doing a good job of just buying time. Like the constant disruptors, it is going to be the liberators that, you know, the disruptors can't shoot them, meaning that the liberators are the absolute best unit against them. And the thing is, it's a brittle army. Like one wrong move out of Goblin, and that's it. All those stalkers just absolutely bite the dust. And you see, everything's getting shredded. Lovely flank attempt, though. That will keep the units in place here, and Goblin gets a fairly decent cleanup. It's it's not. It's not a cheap cleanup, but at least it gets him some more very valuable time. Yep, yep, yep. I mean, time is uh, kind of something you need on your side right now. As uh, time is uh, really your best friend, the triple obs over here, man. We are going to see Alcyone with every single map taken. How about that? As uh, th th every single base taken. I, that's not really what I expected coming into this at all, especially the way this game started. Need I remind us that we started off in such a rough spot? Poor Goblin. That is crazy. It's really crazy. Nice disruptor on the left side there. That's the kind of stuff that Goblin really needs. And disruptors getting sniped before they get any sort of pop-off here. And Clem realizing, okay, okay, that's a lot of explosions. But I think a good seven or so died just then. Now the DT Zealot hit squad over here on a PF base. Not, or at an orbital base, not a PF base. Mind my uh, language there. Uh, lots of liberators do show up, though. They will absolutely make short work of this run-by attempt. Resources still so close lost between these two, but Goblin is definitely mining more of this split map scenario. He's playing like a Zerg here. Yeah, no, he uh, he really is playing a bit like a Zerg, isn't he? He is just, I mean, he's just taking so much of the map. He's playing all over the map as well, right? I think is what this is coming down to, so. Oh, oh disruptor shots <laughs> still hitting. It, where, where's Clem's army? Like, it's, it's, not, it's not over here right now. It definitely feels like the warping mechanic here, being able to warp in on the left or warp in on the right, is helping Goblin out a lot, but he's the one utilizing that very, very nicely, fighting on two opposite ends of the map right now. Clem making lots more Liberators, lots more Ghosts. In fact, Liberator count is getting grossly scary. He has to be careful with them, obviously, but soon he can potentially put Liberators at every mining base while still having a good like eight or so in the actual fight. Yep. That's a lot of libs currently spread out all over the place. I mean, libs have been the problem for Goblin away. Like, he's able to clean them up, but it always costs you a lot to play that cleanup as well, right? So that has consistently been a part of the problem here, as we see our Stalkers and our Zelts continue to hang around. I'm just going to be seeing there's a little bit of bio. He's actually going to be able to continue chunking through the DTs, just getting chunked down as we go as well. It really hasn't felt like Goblin's been behind 50 supply this entire time, but... He has. He's he's a real warrior, man. He's fighting against the best tech Terran that you can find, and he's still been trading pretty damn good. But I feel, I feel that Clem is finally starting to break him. And seeing that recall on the left side really opens up the shop over here. And big pickups against these disruptors. Big warping as well to try and keep them alive as much as possible. But he is getting broke at this point. He's utilized that whole mineral bank he had and fighting into liberation zones over here. This is a great position for Clem to be in and. I think this is the beginning of the end here, but Goblin, what a performance he's put on in map number one. Yep, no, absolutely. He really held on. He really made it a, a game because this really didn't feel like it should have been, right? At the end of the day, this didn't feel like we were kind of aiming for that at all. As we uh, now have ourselves a chance for game number two and get this underway, get this set up and uh, see whether Goblin can actually take a game. I mean, it was such a bad start. What do you think happens if Goblin gets a better start? Surely such a better uh, setup, right? Uh, you know, Goblin, he's, he's always been a player that I've looked at and I've been like, he is incredibly good at doing what he does. Like, incredibly good. Like, the, the Phoenix Colossus stuff, he's always been a massive fan. When it's in the meta, he's one of the, the, the leaders of that meta because he's been doing it even when it's out of meta and stuff. So the fact that he had his third denied for a good like three or four minutes and then made it like that. Because remember, like there was a point where I was saying, I don't think Goblin's really thinking about what, what happens five minutes from now. He really wants to make something happen right now. Mm -hmm. But then it didn't quite work out. It got cleaned up in the middle. But then it's like, hold on a minute. I can actually 
go toe to toe with a fully fledged Terran army with gateway units and disruptors. And he did so damn nicely. Like, it wasn't an easy map. And once it got to a point where it's like Clem was fighting in that that corridor in the bot in the top left, it made it very hard because that's where liberators shine, right? Where you can't get these flanks on them. And I, I think that's where Goblin started losing out quite a bit. But it also wasn't the cleanest game from Clem. Just because you did sometimes see like an overextension or a big disruptor hit, which let's be real, we've seen Clem so often these days just making disruptors look like they're a terrible unit. But Goblin, the fact that he had so many launching so many all the time, that was just cool. Yeah, it was just non-stop, right? Like he just started firing away and he just kept it going. And that was uh, very cool to see as we now happen to game number two. I'm very impressed that Goblin just able to keep it going for so long because Clem is not an easy player to play against when it comes to that regard. I mean, you imagine taking someone to a scrappy game. Clem is such an active, busy player. He's always all over the map, right? So, uh, pretty big deal. So we're going to start off in the bottom right side this time around. Game two. Can he find himself a game win? It is Goblin. A uh, really good player, a Goblin. Honestly, I, I'm, I'm impressed. And spawning room top left-hand side, representing Team Liquid, it is Clem. What do you think of a game two? I mean, Clem had such a good start. Kind of wild, though. It was a really good start. It was a really good start. It was a, a gas first opening, so it was very much banking on getting out those four cyclones very quickly to do what he did. And they did a lot, and then the bio push afterwards. So it, was, it felt like every choice that Goblin made up until that point couldn't really deal with what Clem had until a much later stage. But I'm, I'm, I'm honestly not sure. Like. I've been out of the top players on the ladder in Europe, so haven't got to play against Goblin a lot uh, over the past uh, few years. But when I used to play against Goblin, I used to feel that, okay, if I can get a good read on what he's doing, then, then maybe we can have a close game. But if I don't, and it's like, you know, I just do a regular opening, I'm in a lot of trouble. But I, I'm very curious about how Goblin's future builds are going to be. I'm also, Clem has a whole array of uh, special tactics like he can play the one with a mine drop the two with a mine any sort of scary opener a, a single uh marine and barracks on the low ground after all this but I i'm not sure like so far they're playing on very regular maps that we've been uh, seeing quite a lot too so i i think this is more chance for clem to take the 2-0 here playing on a another regular map yeah i think the size of the map obviously uh was a big factor right so the size of the map being so large last time gave Goblin a lot of chances to play all over and to take all the bases. Illusionborn's not a small map, but I think it's a lot more easy to kind of direct traffic in a certain direction, which should take away a lot of the potential that Goblin was playing with last time around. Yeah, like, it, it does look like um, Goblin is still Stargate Boy, um, which Clem is, a, again, a smart enough player to realize these kind of things and do builds that are specifically good against Stargate. It does get confirmation scout just to be like, all right, okay, now I know what I'm up against. And for a Terran, knowing exactly what you're against, even before you scout it, it's so good. Like that second barracks starts up very nice and early, meaning we're gonna have a lot of bio out nice and early. Single Cyclone as well, just helps with initial defense. But I think Clem, like those Phoenix builds are if you do do a heavy barracks play with like any sort of tank push it's it's really hard for the phoenix guy it really is yep no oh, it's uh if you know your opponent's going phoenix there's a lot of things you can do to really be successful against it and that's why i mean we already saw last game how good clem was able to be now we have those extra barracks now we're going to have the bio play going big in the early stages Goblins have to going to have to be very safe early on you know yeah and this game is very different in the sense that Goblin will be able to get out on the map with Phoenix, which is a big deal, let's be real. It, it's a very different scenario, but third barracks coming online now, and it will be the tech labs going down on this factory and the barracks, so quick, quick transition to tech. Once Goblin finds out that this is happening, then, it's, then I'm curious what he's going to do. And is Clem going to go for the switcheroo from that factory? Uh, he actually is. He actually is. So he's going to be using that for a reactor for his starport later on instead. 
a massive emphasis on just a lot of bio. So I, I'd, I'd imagine that as soon as this robo is finishing, it's going to be a robo bay coming down very soon because the Phoenix, they won't be able to get too much done from this point on. Nope. I mean, you need that robo bay. You need to move into that Colossi quickly. Otherwise, you're going to be in trouble. Unless you want to play like Charger so I feel like that's not a good thing to be doing against like a mass bio player here early on. As uh, that is going to be the robo bay coming up. And the Stimpak and Combat Shield coming through. Get that all on the way. Waiting to see yeah. what the plays are going to be. I mean, honestly, as, as the buy upgrades finish, you expect Clem to be aggressive, so that's probably our next stopping point in this game. Yeah, it's, it's just about how do you do it? Like, because these Phoenix, they do want to be on the aggressive, and oh, that is not what you want, though. And oh my goodness, a, a flawless game one uh, <laughs> dealing with a horrible situation. That is not it. Not it from Gobbers. Not it at all. That is going to be the Robo Bay finishing here then in a second. But yeah, one more Phoenix down is not pretty in the slightest. So that ain't great. And uh, we do just see Stimpak and Combat Shields about to finish up. So this is what yeah. I've been waiting for. We're waiting for this Bioforce to come. It's going to be that time in a couple of moments. Yeah, and Clem is going to go for the reactor on this factory. So I think that usually sig signals that he's going to be doing quite a lot of drop stuff. Um, in the near future, like tanks, they're good for the blob army. Wooden mines far better for the drop stuff and getting nice defense set up as well. This observer comes in fairly late because he's been scouting with the Phoenix and will be in a nice spot at the front here just to check on what's going on. But these medevacs, they could be very scary if left untouched. And Goblin has to be very quick and make a lot of judgment calls here because those Phoenix, they have absolutely missed this move out. Yeah, he's completely missed these two medevacs, and the Phoenix aren't going to be at home. The Colossi, well, there's one out, I believe, so that's nice. But I actually think there's a little corner here we can drop in as well, where you can just unload. But he's going to unload right in the mineral line. The probes do pull instantly. That is necessary. Then begins to stim. And what's he going to target? He could go for the Robo Bay, for example. He's just going to take down a couple of units, warping in. The probes oh. come back. No, Goblin, no. He's just going to gift his opponent an opportunity. And that is now suddenly 14 workers down and the rest of the army moving towards the third base. This is going to start looking scary as Goblin's completely out of position. And Clem, oh, there's not even a... Okay, there's one battery to the far right side, but that means Clem can fight over to the left without the super battery reaching the army. Yeah, and this is a scary Terran army. Like, plus one's about to finish up. All you need is a handful of marauders to really make short work of those Colossus and just tank the damage. And look at this. He's just like, all right, which, where do I want to fight exactly? He's got one medevac with that army. Goblin knows there's a lot of bio on the map, but work account, it's looking bad for Goblin this game. And he moves over here. He's like, oh, there's an army here, right? And it's like, yeah, there is, but where's the rest of it? And boom, into this natural. And Gobbers, uh, from, a, from a, an amazing first game, look at the resources lost up this game. This is, this is far more in line <laughs> with what I thought would probably happen, but... My goodness, it's, uh, yeah, that first drop getting away, the Phoenix, you can't allow that to happen. You really can't. A Reaper, two Marines, and just now a Widow Mine died as well. I mean, that is a ridiculous set of trade for everything that Clem has found so far. That is uh, actually a little crazy. Yeah, and, and th this is some of the power of kind of knowing what you're going to be playing before you actually play it. He probably had in mind that, okay, I'm going to go for three racks before the game's even begun against Goblin, just because having a lot of bio is good against Phoenix plays. And, you know, losing that first Phoenix really puts the the fright in the Protoss in what you can do and get away with. And, yeah, we're looking at this kind of scenario now. Yeah, I mean, kind of surprised. I mean, I guess I'm not surprised that Clem didn't really kind of keep the pressure going. He's still on the map. He's still going to be able to look for opportunities I mean, Goblin's going to get some more uh, uh, splash units out with the Colossus Count still growing, and we also have the Temple Archives coming in. The Clem is also hitting that kind of double tech moment where you get the Vikings and the Ghost out, so his next push is going to be powered up with tech, and that might just be the road to victory for Clem here to kind of take this series and just run away with it. Yeah, even though the start wasn't as bad for Goblin this game, uh, if you ignore that Phoenix loss kind of situation, it definitely hasn't been a, a nice situation for Goblin at all. Like... He is so behind in every field, and he's he's stuck on three bases as well. Like, he wants to take a fourth base right now. This army looks amazingly uh, meek and meager, doesn't it? Like, it's just not big at all. He's, he's really relying on something going terrible for Clem, and even getting these Archons on the field, it's like, okay, that's good, but 
There's ghosts, and, and plenty of them as well, just marching across the map. Yep, I mean, everything's here really already from Clem. He's going to open up some rocks. He has a more direct reinforcement pathway as well. And, uh, well, again, a couple of items coming up. Armor upgrade coming through. This army starts to press in. A couple of archons at the front will start taking some damage. Widowmine clips off over to the side. I mean, again, show me the numbers here, Goblin. Show me the army that's somehow meant to survive through this. The prism's about to go down. The cloth I already hurt, and the EMPs have been great across the board. Everything will melt, and this is very one-sided. Clem did way too well in this game, and he is going to be able to take a 2-0 here. No way to draw this out or to buy time like he was able to in that last map, Goblin. So, Clem. 2-0, and you'll be our first player in Europe to make it through to the uh, next stage, which is the playoffs, of course. So congratulations, Clem. One of the most expected players to probably make it there. Unfortunately, Goblin will have to go and try again. But he's still got two more shots. Very good opportunity for Goblin. Taking down here and reading that previous round has really set him up well. No, I mean, that. I, I'm actually happy for Goblin that he got to showcase a really good game one, because then you got to see what Goblin's actually made of, because that was a really uncomfortable situation game two though it felt like clem just being the i want to say the faster player because they both played really fast in that game one but he was smart and he has a lot of builds up his sleeve as well just to put himself into a good reasonable game and it it, it does feel that the same issues that hurt goblin in the past such as being a bit predictable are still kind of a bit of a thorn in his side when he plays against the real tip-top echelon of players we're going to go into Skillers vs. Spirit up next. More TVP for us here as we continue through the winners' matches in the groups of Europe. We'll be back in just a few.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back to the ESL SCT Masters Spring Regionals We're in the European region. It's Swiss Round 3, and we're in the matches, which is going to start sending players to the, uh, to the playoffs. So you can sit back, relax. We've got seven more best of threes to go today. And it's going to continue through with this TVP. Featuring Skillus and Spirit. Bottom right corner, Red Protoss player representing Team Liquid. It is Skillus. And spoldering over in the top left-hand side, representing very cool Ukrainian team, Na'Vi, it is Spirit. It's so nice that you've got all of these very, to me, old-school big orgs just stepping in. Some some for the first time, some again uh, in StarCraft 2, and Na'Vi obviously home to a very, very uh, highly... Uh, Highly reputable uh, CS uh, team, and you know it's just really cool that they've seen the seen the amount of value you can have from just having a top player like uh, Spirit on their roster. Yeah, no, uh, it's cool. I mean, we we've talked about it a lot, right? Top teams picking up players, sometimes even multiple. It's just good to see, you know, a good little injection of life into the StarCraft scene as well. Uh, these teams which have sometimes had pasts in StarCraft 2 as well, and some of them it's their first foray into StarCraft, but there's obviously so much, you know, potential still in our scene. We've got great games, we've always got ourselves a whole bunch of awesome action going on, so it's always good to see. How's that Proby? It's just checking across here, by the way, so not too much crazy going on. The probe just wants to double check it's not a proxy or anything, and uh, yeah, Spirit is not going to engineer in Bay Block at all himself. He's just going to stay at home, and he's actually going to high ground CC as well. Does not want to mess around with that probe or any potential aggression at all. Yeah, and uh, like this this matchup is, even though it's PVT again, this to me is a very different one on paper because Clem, I think he's like seed one or two for this uh, regional. Like he's absolutely won the most European regionals of any player, I think, at this point. Uh, just a tip-top contender. Uh, these guys, on the other hand, are both absolutely top eight capable. Absolutely are. Like, um, so this is a very even match. I can't say that either one was super happy about meeting the other, but I think they're both very happy that they didn't have to play Clem, uh, being like 2-0 in the group, you know? Yeah, that's very true. I think at this point, you can't really complain about who you meet, right? You're 2-0. This is your chance to make playoffs already. You know, if you don't make it through here, I'd really favor either of these guys to have a good shot in the 2 and one matchup as well, so... Unless they play Gabe, maybe? Gabe's probably the toughest opponent that they're going to meet there, so... Yeah, this is a, um... A cool, a cool opportunity for both, actually. Very evenly matched, all-time match history against one another. Um, they just play a good series, you know. To me, they're a good match in general. They're both these players that continue to rise up through this European scene. They can both, you know, contend on the higher levels as well, uh, but they're both missing that kind of bigger finish, so... Uh, really cool matchup when you kind of look at the uh, the stats between the two, and again, the recent matches that they played against each other continuously are just, like, very interesting, back and forth, good battles. It's really cool to see. Yeah, like, to me, um, Spirit, I mean, he is a greedy Terran, but I feel like he really reeled it in a lot. Like, this game, he's very blind, but it's a very safe build he's gone for. And it's uh, a fairly orthodox build as well. Going to go for the two Widow Mind drop eventually, I would imagine. And Skillish just on his side of things. Ooh, was going to go for a cheeky Widow Mind explosion and dodging it with a shade. But Spirit quick to lift it up. And it will be a tank follow-up as well from Spirit. So looking to be very aggressive. Uh, or in fact, maybe he's just going to be safe because, I mean, that would be nice, wouldn't it? But... What's he doing with his medevac? Whereabouts is that lad? Okay, okay. Does pick up those Widow Mines eventually and... He has no idea what he's going to be flying into with this, but like <laughs> this is uh, definitely quite brazen, but it's uh, a solid way to start things off. Yeah, no, he's uh, he's going to be blind attacking in, but to be fair, the Wooden Mind Drop can also be seen as a chance to scout, right? So you're going to find out what kind of units are here. You might get a spot on the tech structure. In this case, he's going to see Stalkers. You might not be able to real blink off of them. Depends where the Medivac is at and how quickly it gets shot down, I suppose, is... Let's see our blink about a finish and our nexus coming through yeah and it's going to be two tanks might be more a lot of terrans have been following suit with uh, maru because uh, again this this matchup goes in waves i feel where 
Protosses will be more gas heavy, going for like the Stalker Colossus big mix of things, or slightly less gas, going for like more Zealots. But we will see what's he doing with the factory right now. Still got the tech lab on it, is available for any of those barracks units. This is very much like a big gay push to me, where it's just like a lot of power. Oh, oh, has to be careful with that Widow Mine. There is an Observer chasing it as well, so that Widow Mine won't get much done. The one in the natural also, I think, only killed one guy. The, the, the engagement in the middle of the map was a Stalker that did die for the trouble, but Spirit just goes back on home and... I think he was looking for quite a bit more from all this. Yep. I, I, I think so too. I think he wanted to try and get like a bit of a combo push going. That's now not happening. Skillers is going to be looking to play uh, into that third base. He's getting a Robo Bay down. He's obviously got Blink already, so he's got map control as well. So, uh, yeah, in that regard, it is going to be uh, feeling as though Skillers is in. A pretty comfortable spot. You just lose this observer, so the Raven is going to be put to use right away. They got a scout on the fact that upgrades are coming in, though. I mean, there's not really much to confirm there. The starboard's going to go to a reactor. I'm going to get back to that factory on a tech lab. So more tanks on the way from Spirit, so he's going to really solidify his defense and that kind of sieging power, which is good for an extent in TVP, although it typically does run out of steam once more and more charge shots come up. The tanks just can't trade well enough against them, so... That is uh, something that's typically on a timer. Sometimes you can play tank styles all game long, but then you again, you need other answers to the zealots usually. Yeah, I, I, I like this position that Skellis is in. By the way, really nice what Mappa just showed us. Some pylons scattered around in the north there. So there is that raven coming in, but it goes in with a, a big notice over here. So Skellis, I think he will have spotted it. We'll get units in position. He does exactly that. And that raven... Most likely won't be able to get much done here, but does show itself, doesn't waste any energy, which is nice. And just five Stalkers at the front here. Oof, make that four. Just keeping Spirit honest over here. Just making sure that he doesn't take that third too early, just slowing him down, because Skillis right now does have a little bit of an eco lead, and his army is absolutely getting chonky as well. Yeah. It's getting stronger and stronger. Spirit's going to try and tech up with those ghosts. That ghost academy finishing soon, so that will be a pretty big deal. You got some ghosts out, get some EMPs available. I imagine that's going to be a huge factor here for him. So getting that extra tech available, get that underway. This concussive shell and the plus one attack upgrade is going to be finishing up. Yeah, Spirit was quick to get his five barracks online. Not before making the third, obviously, but quick to get it online. And it looks like he's got a little hit squad over there in the north that wants to clean up a few of those scouting pylons. They are accompanied by a medevac. But Skillis, he knew about it. He had an observer over there that did get to spot that move out. In fact, oh, look at that from Spirit. He's very quick to just be like, okay, okay, I got a pylon, get out of there. So they're both reading each other very well, taking it very, very cautiously. Absolutely. As the Raven comes back Ooh. along the right side, the Stalkers are looking to get the catch on that Raven. Oh my goodness, how wow. did we miss that? I have no idea. And Spirit's probably like, ooh, dodged a bullet there. I definitely dodged a bullet because that that Raven has a big role to play, man. Like, it's Colossus. There's so much power in those Colossus. Keeping that alive, like, he wanted to bring it back home, but realizing that, okay, okay, I'm, I'm fairly blind on the map. It's going to be a hard journey to get it home uh, safely. Yeah. No, that's... Um... <laughs> that that's really something well spirit is just sitting back at home by the way he's so just chilled out here right like he's not pressing into anything too eagerly it's just a widow mine drop coming down the left hand side you see a lot of terrans definitely being a much more out on the map by now but he's playing a very slow going setup so just chilling back prism speed is on the way from skillers so that's going to give him a lot more harassing options too so that'll be something for us to keep our eyes on as that's how is going to grab a marine and here comes the raven full of energy still is going to decide that that just ain't it with the battery there he's not going to drop any turrets he'll just wait even longer look at all these red dots on the map by the way like skillers yeah. it feels like he sees a lot like he he's feeling comfortable behind this he's also getting ready for a stage in the game that if Spirit was on the map, he would not be getting ready for. Like, Dark Shrine early, Double Forge on the go. He's feeling all right. This Widow Mind Drop comes in and will be able to get quite a few probes. First one getting yeah. a nice shot here. And this Widow Mind, oh, a little bit slow to get the Burrow on and will get it. Oh, I, I love the retargeting. Yeah. Really good retargeting. Just being annoying, obviously. We can blink away with these Stalkers. 
It's a little bit of a shame. I think if I wouldn't mind burrowed faster, I might have had a good shot on that third base because the probes got stacked up on the stalkers trying to get away. So uh, either way, we are going to see these couple of mines getting cleaned out. And that is going to be that fourth base completely cleaned up. Plus two attack and plus one armor, by the way, still coming up from Skillers. So his upgrades continue to come through as he attacks into Disruptors and that Dark Shrine. All these later game units that are such a headache for the Terran to deal with. They really are. And now Skillis is getting his own War Prism in a pretty nice location here. Remember, there's actually not one single Viking on the map. And this Spirit, he's been defending the whole game or getting ready for an attack, but it feels like the one attack that did come in this third base felt like it, it kind of caught him off guard a little bit. Yeah, he's, he's really just been sat here just waiting, to, you know? Like... He's been super defensively set up. We are going to be seeing this bunker going down. 15 SCVs have fallen, so 15 workers drop. CC is going to move down to the fourth base location. We will have ourselves the army of Skillis ready to pounce elsewhere in the next few moments. This army in the center, I mean, three Colossi, three Disruptors. Lots of potential, but there is the danger of those tanks because attacking into that siege position is not easy. Spirit will ask for a quick little pause here. Hopefully nothing too major. We had a couple pauses yesterday with some lag issues, so... Hoping to steer clear of those today and keep the games moving. Absolutely. Because right now, we're in a pretty damn close game. Like, if I just kind of relay what units they have. Five Disruptors, three Colossus. A lot of Zealot and Stalker. But those are big units and get a lot of damage. Raven did make it back home. Seven Ghosts, three Tanks, 16 Marauders. I mean, those Colossus can be kind of taken out of the fight decently quick. At least for a moment. There's no Vikings to truly... Uh, whip them out of shape. So Skillis doesn't have to be too worried about that. And his probe count still is 10 ahead and he's producing five at a time while taking a sixth base. It's a fun situation. But if you were to tell me which player is feeling more comfortable right now in this game, I, I, I'd say Skillis any day of the week. Yeah, I think so. He's gone up to his bases very comfortably. The aggression from the spirit has been non-existent, really. A couple of Widow Mind drops. He's just done a bunch of damage. He's got map control all across the board. And he's honestly poised to, to go in and potentially take a fight as uh, Spirit, <laughs> Spirit takes about a minute to update us on the uh, reason for the pause. But uh, I assume it's just not resolving as quickly as he thought it might. So a moment or two, hopefully not too much longer, and this will settle down. We can get this resumed here in this game. Number one of Spirit versus Skillis here. As, like you said, Ben, it is looking good for Skillis. He's definitely got to be feeling comfortable. Do you think, though, Spirit's about to get up to Libs and so on? Is that going to be more of a challenge for Skillis? Like, is Skillis okay just letting Spirit be on four bases? Or, you know, because I'm thinking very soon it's going to be very tough for him to actually go attack him in, right? It, it is. The problem area for Protoss is when Terran's on five and, like, very mm. secured on five. Like, I feel that's where it starts to get, like, oh, goodness, we're, getting, we're going there, aren't we? Like, still we're in a spot where... Spirit's gas count is going to be incredibly low. I don't think... Let's have a look. Is there a fusion core online? I actually can't see the building tabs because there's the big pause sign in the way. Um, <laughs> no, no fusion core on the way either. Um, so, like, we're quite a, quite a far bit off where this game does get very, very scary. Um, but Skillis, right now, it's, it's his playground. And remember, he's got that dark shrine as well to make full use of. Are we still cameraed in the game? Or yeah, we're the game's game. just about to get going. All right, yep. all right, nice. We are good, so we are going to get 3, 2, 1 and get it back underway. And obviously just a little like spike to come in also to calm down. But now it's calm and we're back on track. And uh, like I say, Spirit's getting to those libs. Skillers is spreading out and just figuring out if he wants to take a fight in noise. Sends a bunch of units home. I'll also keep in the majority of the tech units out on the right side. Stork is going to find this Raven, so full energy does go down as the ghost on the right side are very exposed the disruptors are gonna find every single ghost oh my goodness that could not have been a better start of this fight for skillers and spirit supply just plummeted i mean we actually got zealot showing up on the left hand side disruptors are still keeping these colossus alive it looks as though skillers is just good as we basically just come out of that uh wow we come out of this pause and skillers is just gonna win the game man mate that was a disaster for skillers like ghost cost <laughs> about as much as disruptors do and the fact that he killed a good seven of those i mean skill uh, spirit is dealing a drop at the south part of the map but still that is so much value right there and now skillis his army is fairly brittle over here but these disruptors man they have been absolute value in these series that we've seen so far today yep disruptors have been absolutely the unit of the day for the Protoss players 
Skillers does get that drop on the bottom side of the map under control. And as he gets that under control, he is going to continue pressing on this top side. Still looking pretty comfortable over here. It's going to be a stim in from these bio units. So in we go. Disruptor shot fires through. Boom. We get rid of a couple more orders. To the south we go and we get rid of a couple of units as well. I mean, that disruptor Oof. goes down. So we're finally going to get cleaned up. Spirit pushes this back. But the numbers are there for Skillers. Obviously, he denied a fourth base. He denied a ton of workers during all of this. He is 100% still set up in the better position. I'll tell you what, Spirit, like everything we've looked at has been really bad for Spirit, but this counter drop that he did actually kind of kept him in it. Like it, it, it stopped the aggressive warp-ins. Skillis was probably a little bit distracted by it as well. Absolutely worth its weight in gold, this drop that he had going, but still Spirit's very much on the ropes. And remember, he did lose that fourth amidst all this, so every minute that goes on skillis is getting way way bigger we're seeing disruptors die randomly on the map as well but he's getting bigger man this is very very bad for spirit now he's on the absolute back foot here yeah he is going to win this fight in the center against those few zealots i mean skillis only ha i mean look at skillis's armies like it's three disruptors and zealots basically a few stalkers a dt to harass with the actual army of spirit is Maybe got a chance. I mean, if he can avoid the disruptors and if he can deal with the zealots somehow, some way, maybe I'm grass mad straws. But I feel more hopeful for Spirit than I ever thought I would be. And I love the counter attack here from Skillers. Anything to slow Spirit down. He does catch another disruptor here with this force. Again, his economy is in absolute shambles. The reinforcement should surely just be able to clean this out. But the uh, upgrade so far allowing Skill Spirit to keep on trading with those zealots. And yeah, I mean, he has to keep dodging back. But. He will go until this army gets cleaned up, which is what currently we're struggling to do. As Skillers is going to lose both attempts oh, of warping oh, oh, oh. in here. That's actually a big deal, man. It's a big deal. And this army that he's got is very brittle. Like, he's had quite a bit of friendly fire on these disruptors. And supply is very deceiving because they're about neck and neck on armies right now. Skillers, again, can make more. He absolutely can, but he has to be careful. Yeah, he really, he really does. I mean, he should be fine, Skillers. I don't agree with him building a Stargate right now. Right now, he's just in, like, if he just lives, he's fine. But he's building a Stargate as though this game needs to go on a whole bunch longer. He just needs to spend money on defending. A few more warpings come in. This base is going to be in trouble. This is, again, the issue with Disruptors. Disruptors being used as kind of this kind of attacking into the Terran because the Terran's already in position. The Disruptors are really weakened a little bit. He gets a catch there as the Terran had to come around the corner, walking against the edge, allowed skills to close the distance. This Disruptor has to back away because it's about a friendly fire. And in the end, Spirit is going to be pushed back by Skillis. But man, the Spirit made Skillis sweat for it in here, here in the end. I mean, again, Skillis is just too far ahead to really lose, but Spirit had me with a light, slight bit of belief. It really felt like these last few minutes were all about how well Spirit, Spirit was handling the fights. And Skillis was, you know, I, I think a bit surprised that the, the bear bit back so hard. And these disruptors, nice dodges out of Spirit. I think if Spirit goes into the next game playing like he did over the last few minutes here, uh, uh, Skillis could be in some trouble. Yeah. Yep, yep, oh, yep. The, these single zealots we've seen in mineral lines have been really good. And even though Spirit has taken his fourth base, it's with his main CC. So it's not it's not as good as you'd think if you just kind of glimpsed at the minimap. Yeah, no, he's he's really hanging on by a thread at this point, and we're really just one good shove from Skillis away from kind of seeing this game wrap up. The Zelds have consistently been active on the other side as well, so Skillis has made sure that Spirit's never been able to, you know, think about truly rebuilding an economy, and that obviously goes a long way too, right? If you can't ever, you know, keep your economy alive, it should simplify things, and so in the end, we do get the victory for Skillis. He does get to go up 1-0. to zero. Like you say, I mean, he played very well, and then Spirit kind of came alive when he was losing. So if he can kind of harness that energy, take that into game number two and be like, hey, you know what? I'm going to be a, you know, a strong, you know, I'm going to play like this game two from the very start. Like I played the game one at the end. Maybe Skulls does end up in trouble. Maybe that does become a problem. Again, can Spirit find that energy early enough? Will be a fun map going up next, though. Crimson Court, the map of yeah. two valleys down the middle, and then the extra valley on either side as well that you can open up for yourself. We haven't seen a lot of TVP on this map. I'm 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 interested. I mean, the the length of the map it feels long. So in in that respect, I think it's nice for Terran, at least Spirit style of Terran. It does slow down a lot of the uh, 
kind of funky builds you can do, but Spirit that game was very much about just sitting back and just waiting for something to happen. Although when something did happen, he, he wasn't ready for it, it seemed, which was kind of funny. Yeah, well, we're going to head into this game too. I, I'm thinking about how this is going to go. I think the last time I saw Skillers playing PvT this map, he was mining the gold minerals and like going down the side for his expansion, which I think makes a lot of sense. Take away any sort of sieging power and pushing power for the Terran. Because the Terran's going to... I mean, usually it's the pros who loves being clumped up and not being able to be flanked, but a Terran, if they can get up to the libs and tanks, well, how do you do anything through the middle of the map on this map? So I think opening those doorways, opening those avenues to the side is perhaps going to be one of the goals of Skillers in the early stages. We'll see. I mean, like I say, this map, as we've both mentioned, right, this map has really been one where you can play so many different styles on. And so even kind of game by game, you can play something different. Maybe Skillers knows something here that would work well against his opponent. In the bottom left, the blue Terran from Na'Vi. It is Spirit. And the northeast side, the red Protoss from Team Liquid. It is Skillers. Whenever I see a map like this and there's a lot of area to blink into that main. I'm always like, whoa, whoa, whoa. they kind of scare me a little bit, you know? I like, granted, there's a lot of uh, building space where you can make this kind of nice barracks factory wall to kind of defend and put the tanks behind, but you're yeah, definitely tricky uh, going into it. So I've, I've automatically got that as a threat um, for Spirit, but I do wonder how he's going to scout this game, if he's going to take the same approach of just being very, very blind, but Hmm, uh, curious. Yeah. Uh, that's actually very true. He just did not really care what at all what was going on last time, right? He took that full risk of just being blind and it was fine. You know, at the end of the day, he didn't really get punished by much. The Widow Mine drops were honestly pretty decent as well eventually. Um, so yeah, maybe uh, well, we'll see. I mean, you might just feel as though Skillers... I mean, the thing is though, I, I don't think Skillers is not a cheesy guy. Like, Skillers will crank out the all-ins. He will be a bit cheeky sometimes, so... I don't think you can just be like, oh yeah, Skillers is like a showtime. He's just going to macro up. He's always going to be expanding early. So you get away with this lack of a scout. Um, so yeah, it's very interesting that he chooses this against Skillers of all people. I, I don't actually agree. I think Skillers is probably one of the pros players I've seen most often cranking out like a proxy Stargate all in or something along those lines. So yeah, interesting choice from Spirit. But I mean, so far it's working out because once again, there's no immediate aggression at least. So yeah, Marine into factory. Off we go. Even though he's not scouting, Spirit has been more than capable of shifting it a gear. Like, uh, I, I, it was definitely a few years ago where he wasn't quite as good as he is now, but he went up against Showtime, and it was one of those series where it was like, okay, Showtime's a beast. I think he, he lost maybe game one in a normal macro game. Then he just did, like, the three most random all-ins you've ever seen and killed him. Like, one base, super giga all-ins, you know, and, and took the series. And it's... Uh, a. It, it, so he's not as predictable, you know, really not. But going with a Stargate opening this game, Skillis is, he's going to use a different tech of choice here to crack him. Yep. Stargate is uh, going to be coming up. We'll see how Spirit deals with this. He's opening Cyclone Marines. Always feel like this is a good combination against the Stargate, right? Really gives you units that can fight against the first Stargate units and hold them off and fight them back. I think that's always a step in the right direction as those couple Marines come over. Adept will be chased down just a little bit here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, annoying little buying time there, just stopping the CC from planting as early as it wanted to, but Cyclone will be on the map. Now Skillis knows it's a different opening from his opponent, and Skillis going for the Phoenix route. And if you're going for Cyclones with quite a bunch of Marines, you do have to be a little bit careful. You definitely do, and this will be a, a pretty damn good number of Marines out. Like, it's going to be a lot of firepower. But Skillis is doing what you talked about, where he takes out those gold nice and early. And it will allow him to take a relatively safe third. Granted, the Terran can drop on over, but he's not really got that much firepower just yet. Yeah, I, I do like that third for that reason, especially just having to drop over, because it's very rare that Terran has more than any medivac early in the game, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, while they can usually push with like a medivac of units and extra, Dropping over really does limit how much they could get on top of a third base. So I do think it's a very safe approach. You see, Spirit is going to mine out down to the south. So that actually could make Ooh. me make a way for him to push towards that third if he would like to. So that's a possibility. Skills gets the robo on the way is the next step of this. So we are like we see Phoenix Colossus. And Spirit, I'm getting the Liberator too. Yeah, he's absolutely, he's going to push down around this side. He knows exactly what Skillis likes to do. How about that? He has done his homework. 
He definitely has. And right now, Skellis hasn't taken the third just yet. It's just a pylon over there. So you get over here and you're like, wait, there's no third? I mean, you do take the third a little bit later when you do go for a Phoenix Colossus. But, yeah. And it does look like it has been spotted by Skellis where his opponent is, but that doesn't mean he's going to get like out once. of there scot-free. Let's have a look. That is... Oh, Ooh! Just gets so away. damn close. Yeah, just about gets away with that. As the command sent a couple more SCVs and the Viking continue up from Spirit. The tech lab coming down. And um, yeah, I mean, at this point, Spirit's not going to push if the third base isn't there because that basically says, hey, I've been building units and only units and a bit of tech, but mostly units, right? So if there's units on the way, that's not something you typically want to try and fight into or fight against. Let's just see a couple more barracks coming up, the engineering bay coming through. And still has finally put the third down. Yeah, Spirit would just double check that the third isn't in the triangle. Yeah, I like Skillis has to be careful. The fact that this army is out on the map and he's out on the map with his Phoenix, this actually could be kind of tricky to hold. What does he actually have in the main here? I mean, he's got he's got five aggressive ground units, does very quickly recall here. And I even like the pro pulling there, getting all on the same spot could have dealt quite a bit of damage. But Spirit, look at this. He's at the front as well. This actually, I think Skillis is defending this fairly nicely, picking up Lots of Marines all at the same time. Definitely lowered his firepower with the Phoenix, but he's going to clean this up. So he's got away with the Phoenix opener against a lot of bio, and he survived without taking too much damage. This is definitely a nice little advantage here for Skillers. Yep, doing a good job of it. And uh, I actually think very beautiful defense, right? All said and done, he just holds in every position, doesn't take too much damage. Losses really were kept to a minimum, and... I mean, we lost one Phoenix, a battery. The OBS went down across the map. This really wasn't bad. He's killed a Lib. He's killed a Medivac of Marines. I mean, Skellis has a good defense once again, setting up well from the start. And that's going to put a bit of pressure on Spirit to maybe do something, because that's similar to how this last game started out. Skillers got off to a good start because the aggression never found anything, or there wasn't any aggression. And now Skillers gets to play his game. It certainly does. And Skillers, like, the third base is only just finished, but... Very quick, starting a fourth base. And now these Phoenix, they're where they want to be, you know? The, the army is sort of back at home, but in the wrong place. And these Phoenix can just start having a whirl of a time. The turrets from these players have been kind of like on the aggressive locations to stop the Phoenix from flying in. But they weren't really ready to stop the Phoenix from flying with him. Which, uh, yeah, I, I, this is the kind of game that Skillis really likes to play, where he just gets the freedom to do what he wants. His opponent has to sit back for a bit. Nice one. Yeah. I mean, Spirit is going to be forced to sit back as the upgrades finish from Skillis. Is there any point here you think Skillis is going to feel comfortable to start moving out and attacking? Because I know Spirit obviously likes to sit back defensively as well. Is there a moment where Skillis says, okay, well, now is my, my time. Is that just when he gets to, like, three Colossi? Or is that tank line always going to deter him from being able to push in? So, in my mind, if you're in Skillis' shoes, poking with the Phoenix is fine, and maybe opening up some rocks to allow your army to be in multiple avenues is a big deal. Because if you get stuck in one corridor and your opponent's in the other one, that's where problems arise. And tell you what, he has eliminated those rocks over there. Yeah. So he's done just that. He's getting lots of upgrades online as well. He's opening up other avenues here as well, just to make the map a little bit more, a little bit bigger for him to play around with. Because one thing, he doesn't want to, get, want to get stuck against these tanks in a direct engagement like this. One interference matrix is used. The Cyclone's still being useful. That Raven has to be so careful against those Phoenix. Yeah, the Phoenix is going to threaten the Raven every single time it gets close, right? So it's not the kind of unit you can just let kind of wander into the Phoenix. They will get rid of it quickly. Uh, so that's definitely a big deal. As the Ghost Academy about to finish up from Spirit. Combat Shield about to be done. Marine, Marauder, Medivac. All popping out. We do see Marines continue to unload in the main base once again. It's more probes going down. There's a Zealot that's going to be taken out as well. We got a cheeky little recall off as the Zealots continue to just be brought across for the moment. Our Marines are going to come in once again here. Just dropping back down and the Zealots are going to get back onto those ASAP for the moment. This is kind of tricky for Skillers to deal with, but he's doing a fairly good job. Like... He's getting Blink online, so keeping these Phoenix alive isn't as important now. And he is up to, well, taking his fifth base. He just has to make sure he doesn't take damage. Like, mm -hmm. he's got a large amount of investments here in tech, like plus two, plus one. Blink, uh, getting the the nice... Is that the Observer speed as well over here? No, 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 it's the War Prism speed, actually. Um, 
but Spirit's doing everything he can to just harass with these little squads. It, it's a cool game. It really is. Spirit coming alive a little bit and getting some damage done, but now Skiller's coming across here. Uh, okay, I was gonna say, I don't know if he's really got enough, but that's a big warp in. Ah, okay, now we hit the Matrix on the Prism. Well, now we definitely don't have enough, right? This really shows how important that Matrix was as the Prism survives. Okay, we did a few more Marines out. They will be able to take that down. Stopping the warp in is huge. Skillers is ahead in supply, though. He is going to finish a blink and about a half plus two as well. His reinforcements coming from across the map. Man, the Prism Denial was absolutely massive. It was huge because that's kept Spirit in the game. Granted, he's uh, pretty damn wounded here. And Skillers is just getting to that groove, man. Like, he's feeling confident to take the sixth base in the middle which is very, very far forward. And Spirit is going to keep on doing what he's been doing, just expand kind of slowly, trying to do a drop here and there. But again, Skillis' vision over the map is just absolutely huge. And he can run down the each valley, threaten pretty massively in each one as well. And honestly, his army's very solid. Deals with the drop as well. Ah, uh, this, this game is looking pretty brutal for Spirit. Like, I, I don't know how he tries to get a footing here. Yeah, I, I'm with you, mate. It's, uh, it's fallen apart, hasn't it? I mean, he had this moment or this spur of aggression that kind of looked kind of hopeful, but Skillis' army's looking good. He's going to back up right now, maybe get a couple more rounds of reinforcements. He's about a max. Once he's max, I would not mind if you see Skillis go, go, go. Um, he's going up to, you know, six bases behind all of this as well. I mean, you could argue with, because of that he doesn't need to go pressuring him, but I just don't hate the idea of him. Just, again, he's got the army that can kind of fight from the far with those Colossi and so on, right? Yeah, and he's got two sensor towers pretty pretty closely positioned here. And even utilizing that little gold gap from earlier to try and run Zealots in from here. And we're, get, we're getting to that army that... We're getting to that army that's hard to deal with, man. You have to be so ready. A little pop in here and there to try and dodge these disruption shots. I'm not how sure how good it was. Like, Skillis lost a lot of supply doing that, but does take out the PF. And at this point, if we look at Spirit's actual mining bases here, it's looking rough for him. Like, third yeah. base, second base, they're, they're starting to run dry. There's not enough places to put these SUVs soon. Yep. No, this is... Um... I'm going to say, right, it's, it's getting to the point where this is probably going to be kind of difficult to stay in it because losing the fourth is such a big shot to your economy. You've got a new CC building, but it, it's taking quite a while. Obviously, it starts to float over there once it finishes as well, so this really is away from being done. And again, Skillers just has so many bases himself, so even if you replace the fourth, it's hardly like that is the, the magical answer for you here. As uh, Spirit ends up with a scrap here. Skillis backs it up. He's getting the Dark Shrine. Extra reinforcing gateways as well, so he can really build back up on the back of these fights very comfortably. That's going to be a big part of his plan now. Yeah. Zealots don't want to be taking that fight, though. That is one chonker sat there blocking the whole lot. And Spirit, his army is growing. This Ghost Count up to 10 right now. That War Prism does have... Well, no. does it have long to live <laughs> against that little army? And these Zealots, like... Right now, again, it's the same thing. Skillers takes a little bit of a beating early on, but then he kind of finds life. He's, he's getting online a little bit. Granted, he's still got a long way to go, and Skillers is getting very rich behind all this. 85 probes, 3-3s three coming online for both players, but there's a lot of very scary stuff coming out for Spirit as well, like 3-3 three three himself, plus 2 on the air weapons, getting the fusion core, more star ports as well. I, I, I don't know, man. Like, Skillers has been throwing absolutely everything at him and the kitchen sink and it's just spirit is weathering the storm he is weathering the storm but he, he still needs to come out of it you know with the sunshine and rainbows afterwards Ooh. right like he has no fifth base right now and this time we actually do successfully break into this location so that's going to be a base but it's a base for a base well one for one is absolutely a fine trade for skillers uh, skillers can recall back home if he feels the need to to take on this army but spirit's just going to go for one base and then back it off and like i say one for one is very okay when Skillers has so many more bases than Spirit, so that is absolutely fine right now. Yeah, I feel like the real trouble is going to come online when these DTs come out in big numbers. Like Shadow Stride is a huge upgrade, and that can really start to make the Terran really tax the multitasking. It really can, and Skillers, he's, he's just making Nexus everywhere, man. This is true Zerg style, and this is what we've seen from a lot of the good Protoss players today.
Protoss is even pretty good against Terran in this event, man. It's, uh, across all the regions, the Protoss have got, uh, having pretty good results. Obviously, you know, Clem took out Goblin just earlier, but that's kind of the expectation. And Goblin obviously took out Humorine to get to this point, and it's cool. It feels like the Protoss are really finding their feet on these maps and in this, uh, current meta, on this current patch. And, uh, definitely mm. figuring out PVT in a big way. It's very cool to see. This base over here should not stay alive, and Skellis has done a good job navigating the avenues, the corridors on this map. But when you see that much Terran in one place, you know they're going to be weak in another. Like, that was such a huge amount, and he's down here with a very guerrilla war squad. Going to take out quite a lot of SCVs. And Spirit, again, what's his orbital count at? It's just three this game. Just three. He's not, he's not a rich cookie behind all this. Like, his losses absolutely hurt. Yep. They, uh... They hurt a lot, man. They hurt a lot. I mean, 12 SCVs when you're the one in the weaker position. Disruptor shots coming in from the side there. One Liberator tries to see Jump to take position here. Those Disruptors keep on connecting. The Colossus I can fight from away from the Liberation Zone and do a lot. 16 SCVs dead. Once again, it's a group of units moving through on this other direction. So they're going to come back in once again and just see them already. Again, succeeding, honestly, at this... Spirit isn't dying immediately, but again, in the long term, he is not Gosh. mining enough to really stay in this. And now the disruptors start to find some connections too. Now we're losing the ghost, the important tech units. They're going to be so much tougher to replace. I mean, to be fair, Skullis is actually losing a lot of his tech units as well. Spirit will make a good cause for this. He just cleaned out a bunch of Colossi and the Immortal and the disruptor along the way. Unfortunately, again, this little hit squad continues to have so much success. And there's a big opportunity to blink in the main here, like with the DTs as well. And getting on production is such a big deal. Like Skillis, he has not been trading so well. He's actually behind in resources lost this game. And some of these some of these uh, disruptors have been whiffing or not being as good as they could have been. Uh, again, kudos to Spirit for trying to make a game out of this. And if he can get all these Liberators together, he's on three so far, six in production. Whew. Yep, six libs all on the way out. I mean, this really is the, the way to kind of hold down the fort, right? And to try and maybe take advantage of some of those narrow entrances to the bases. I mean, this is where Skillers may be able to even go further in overdrive when it comes to kind of splitting up and attacking everywhere. Still has so much of the map. I keep looking at that mini-map, I just see so many pro bases. And okay, he's not traded the most efficiently, so he doesn't need these bases, but it's still kind of wild to see as DT Zealot sets up in the center, and of course those counterattacks have continued to be pretty darn deadly as well. They really have. They really have. Like, Skellis is going to keep on looking for ways to crack his opponent. And there's nine Liberators on the map now, six more in production. And he's going to start looking to deny Eco here. And with the way that most of these bases are situated on the edges of the map, it can get tricky. Like, it really can. And remember, they're plus two libs, so they will two-shot stalkers or one-shot them with EMPs. And I'm seeing those little blue dots at the north as well. So Skillis, he's going to have to start looking at every base just to find out where he can actually mine from. And right now, Spirit, he's looking as solid as he ever has in this game, which is wild to say. He has weathered the storm, and he's starting to see the rainbows on the other side of it, mate. He is alive. He's got to keep this base over the bottom right, apparently. He's afraid it's going to get denied. It's not going to land it just yet, or just miss Rally, perhaps. But he continues to float it into the corner after stopping. Uh, apparently, he's going to fly it over there, then turn around. And now he's actually going to start pushing some of the Protoss bases. I think it is the one thing that Spirit is missing. Denying some of these bases is a big deal. Because by denying these bases, he really opens up the game where you know, Skillis can't actually afford to take, take the trades as he's been taking them. It's a bunch of probes going down, and Skillers is not rich, by the way. He has basically no gas banked up, only minerals. As he's going to try and wrap around this army and fight where the Liberators were not siege, but man, it is just so many Liberators. And, and you know what Skillers didn't do? Because he's always been fighting, he never slowed down and, like, built into further tech. Because he could have very easily built into an army that really deals with Liberators fine, like, you know, Stargate units. And he had the chance to do that. Like, he was ahead enough in the game to just stop and, you know, make that happen. He chose not to, so he's kind of put himself in this position where now he's genuinely bleeding out. He's rooting out of probes. He's running out of economy. He's running out of supply, and Spirit is actually looking to tie this up. I, I'm, I'm, I'm thoroughly impressed with Spirit because this game did not look pleasant for him for a long time, but he has absolutely got to the stage of the game that he likes to play. 
And That's crazy. Skillis just hasn't known what to do. He, he tried to crack him all game long for a good 20 minutes, and Spirit just... <laughs> yeah, he just... It, it was like that unbreakable cliff, man, where the water keeps on smashing against it, but just... The, the level of attrition was just huge for him, and even these disruptors getting some nice shots on, but it, it's just not enough. Man, it just felt like Silas was in such a comfortable spot, but yes, yeah, Spirit just refused to die. And in doing so, has led us to this point where he gets the GG out of his opponent. Spirit is going to take the win. And Skillis has to look back at this one and be like, come on, like, I was in such a good spot. There's a point where he had killed the third, and his opponent was on three mining bases. He was on, like, five, six. Again, this is definitely the point where he kind of... He was doing it in the first game, by the way, where I was like, I actually hate that he's building the Stargate, because all he has to do right now is survive. In this game, he could have absolutely built a Stargate and teched up a little bit, right? Or the Fleet Beacon and teched up a little bit because he had enough of a lead to just stop and go and tech. And so that's a, a pretty big deal. So GG's and uh, we are going to get tied up one-to-one -one and getting ready to go into our next map in a couple of moments, which will be Side Delta as the decider map here. So Side Delta to kind of figure it all out and send one of these through to the playoffs. <laughs> I, I just thought about this. Like, uh, so Spirit asked for six minutes, very specific. Yeah, he's not um, allowed six minutes. Man, that's going to turn <laughs> no. off. We, we, we got 12 series today, Spirit, you know? Like, jeez Louise. <laughs> six uh, minutes is actually more than we take between series, Spirit. Like, we can't just do this between a map. <laughs> actually, yeah. Uh, but I was thinking to myself, of all people that ask for pauses, Spirit and Skillis are high up there on my list, you know? So I, I, it had to happen at some point between them, but... Yeah, Spirit played a really good game, man. Like, um, that was that was a tricky one to get himself out of. And I, I wish I looked at how many workers died that game. Mm. But what what an army he got to. Like, six Liberators at a time. Stocks up a lot of gas to do that. And booyah. <laughs> Skillis is not here either. So they're actually both AFK after that game. I mean, obviously, important matchup. Chance to move through. Guarantee the playoffs. Not have to kind of stress yourself out with another play day in the next couple of days. Just make your life a whole lot easier so understandable that they take a moment here just to play at their absolute best when we do get this underway so yeah and and the way it's going as well you can see it's well matched skill is definitely getting into better spots he was able to finish it off in game one but this game two yeah he, if he gets into a good spot again i'm pretty sure he's going to take a pretty different approach when it comes to kind of how he plays the game out because there's no way he's going to keep throwing units at spirit and unsuccessfully breaking through when he could just tech up and have a much easier time so I imagine he'll switch that up after the experience of game two. Uh, but first, we got to get that. I mean, maybe Spirit actually has a successful early game. Skillis' defense early has been great so far. But Spirit is absolutely good enough with that aggression to kind of manipulate the game into a different pathway from the early stages. So that's also something else to uh, to look at. Yeah, and I'm just thinking about that map in general. Like, the amount of valleys, like the, the corridors, having liberators, like, that's kind of a dream scenario like trying to flank him and get in between spots it's it's very hard it's not like the alcyone where you can kind of wrap around pillars and what have you but oh i mean um it's it's i'm already happy going into this series because i thought it was going to be close between them but seeing skillis have a really good game one he absolutely looked like he was pumping in game two but spirit managing to come online and really showcase what he's good at as well uh, that's what we like to see. Yep. As we uh, have the players all readied up, we should be good to go. Any sec now. There we are. Always ready. Third map of the series will be Site Delta. So uh, a step back to normality, almost, uh, between these two. Far more common map that we've seen. It is a good map for getting a drop in the main base, the big game special, even a drop into the national and stuff, so Protoss, you have to be careful. Uh, Skillis has showcased uh, two different openings so far, the Stargate play, the Twilight Council play, and Spirit thus far has showcased that he's very willing to play the game blind without an SV scout or even a Reaper scout, which is uh, very, very risky, i got to say. Yep. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's very true. He's been playing kind of greedy in the early stages and trying to get away with it. And so far, that's been working out for him. Will it work out once again, or will he go scout? And the Terran player top left is Spirit. And spawning over in the southeast side 
And remember, the winner will be out of the groups, as in, you know, making it through in 3-0. It is the Red Protoss, it is Skillis. So a lot on the line here, being 1-1. Because this will make your life so much easier. And you mentioned it earlier, having a player like Hero Marine, which uh, at 2-1 kind of waiting for potentially you, uh, you, you don't want you don't, you don't to start making things more difficult for yourself. Yep. No, you want to make sure your life is as easy as possible. You're already going to be stressed out as one-on-one. -on -one. Try and, uh, you know, make it as chill as possible. Does look like Spirit is most likely going to go for a very similar opening to what he's been doing. It will be enough gas to pump out a Reaper if he does so, please. But when you win a game like that, after being in a tricky position the whole time, it does make you like, oh, yeah, I, I, I knew what I was doing works. And yeah, I'll keep on doing it. Might as well. Because it did change what units he was making early on. And I think going for the Cyclones, that game was a good call in that situation because it was against the Stargate opener. Yeah. I, I mean, it definitely felt like the opening had a lot of potential, right? Definitely felt like there was some opportunities there. Um, yeah, honestly, I was very happy with what Spirit was doing, what he got up to. And just, uh, I mean, he really tried to kind of find an opening, but Skillis was very safe in that last game. He was very late to expand, right? So that was a big deal. In this game, Adept to start things off for Skillis. He did get confirmation that it was a Marine. So it doesn't have to think about, oh, do I need a shield battery? Do I need to keep, keep the Adept at home? He can throw everything that he has across the map again until he gets confirmation on what he's truly up against. And he's going to go with the Stargate again. I don't think that's a bad choice in this situation. Skillis does like to be aggro, but he doesn't have to put all his eggs in one basket and just be like a, a Blink Stalker guy. He's good with the whole whole arsenal of what Protoss has to offer, I think. Yeah, Skillis has always been like that all around Protoss. Like he's, like I say, he was, to me, he's also the kind of guy who will be cheesy and aggressive if he sees the situation present itself. So. Uh, maybe this is too big a stakes to kind of crank it out right now, but yeah, he, you know, he's not just limiting himself to one style. And we do go into the Phoenix again this time. Um, but yeah, but obviously potentially, you know, the last time was Phoenix Colossus. This time we could play Phoenix Charge. It's not a terrible thing on Side Delta, actually, so we'll play a bit more aggressively there. There's a lot of possibilities. Certainly is. Guess to see that it is a Cyclone on the go and this adept maybe it's going to be the same fate as game two i mean the damage done i like that he broke the lock on there with the high grass meaning that it will stay alive a little bit better than what happened in the previous game yep. robo being the tech of choice looks very similar to game two thus far yeah that robo facility coming straight down looks like those skills is very happy with the opening which to be fair why wouldn't he be right the opening of these games has been absolutely spot on it's not the early game he needs to fix up. It's closing the game out from that advantage that he needs to fix up, if anything. So, uh, kind of taking mm. that ride as we see more Cyclones here from Spirit. So, the more Cyclones he gets, Lip coming up definitely looks as though he wants to push. Never found the chance to commit in Game 2. We'll see if he finds an opening that he likes here in Game 3. I like this from Spirit. This is really cool. This could actually be the kind of move out an army that could really punish Skillers. Like, Skillers getting out of that immortal is absolutely 100% what he needs. And these Phoenix, I'm I'm very happy for Skillers that he's fairly close to base. Like, you can see that he's, he's like, where are you? Where You have to be somewhere. Like, you, you have to try and slow me down. But so far, spotting nothing. And Spirit, he's just like, you know what? I'll meet back up with these two Cyclones. I don't think either one of them got to see the other one there. So <laughs> this is... This is about as kind of single player esque as you can imagine. And the third base goes down right now. And unfortunately for Skillis, he's just missed the army at every point. Yep. And here it is. I mean, insta kill on the third. That's going to be not insta kill, but insta cancel on the third pretty much. Reduces the Phoenix going onto the SEVs. But this is already a delayed third, right? So to then have it delayed even further because this unit show up. And now actually going to drop two Cyclones in the main base. There's one Phoenix here, a couple Stalkers. We can lift a Cyclone as well if we need to, just to guarantee the kill. Nice. Now I can't go into the Medivac. That's a pretty good shutdown because otherwise this was uh, not necessarily doing too much. Cyclone and lock on to help, but oh, the Liberator at the same time shows up on the right side, so Spirit's going to find 
A little bit more damage for himself, getting a couple more workers, but now the Phoenix is on that lib, this should come to a close. Should do. I, I like the fact that he turned around here to fight that Phoenix, just because he could potentially... He is he going to get it? I think he might get it here. Oh, oh. very, very close. I, I, I like the choice there, because it was going to die if he just kept on running. Um, Skillis did get to pop into the main and deal a little bit of eco damage himself. Also got to see that tech lab being made on that starport. Now, that is a very juicy target on the map that's very easy to kill if you're in the right location. And all things said and done, Spirit does have a third CC in his base, but no stim tech or anything like that available. So he's absolutely set back to where he kind of has been playing from in these games, where it's like, you know what? I'm going to sit back and see if I can survive and get my game going. Yep. Yeah, I mean, just... Uh... Boy. He gets it up as well. He keeps being aggressive with these Phoenix. He keeps finding value, man. This Phoenix may be a little bit too aggressive, of course, with the uh, uh, Marines nearby. But, man, not bad at all. Knocking down the Cyclones. And that obviously just opens the door for the Phoenix in the future. Because the Cyclones at this point probably would just stay back as, like, anti-air base defense. So, actually nice to knock down a couple of those. It just gives you more possibility further down the line here. Yeah, those Phoenix have actually been really good. And it's been just a low number of them as well. Like... That single Phoenix back at home defended so well. Like, yeah. I, I was kind of worried about it dying, but it did everything it had to. Um, and here, where he just oh, has to be careful. Has to be careful. Bunker and turret do make short work of those Phoenix if in the wrong location. But we're, we're getting to a spot that we've kind of found ourselves in most of these games where Skillis is just in a nice location, gets to roam the map. But then it's about, all right, all right. How are you going to take this third against this? Because maybe this is the worst spot that Spirit has found himself in within regards to trying to get that third. I, I don't know, man. It's 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 hard. It's definitely ain't easy. <laughs> um, yeah, this definitely ain't easy as Spirit is uh, going to be just trying to press forward. I mean, maybe now he can move into position here, but I mean, his economy is trailing heavily. Like, Skillis is just on four bases. Again, the control of the map, the early game is almost always in Skillis' favor, it feels like, and this is very true as well. As he finishes up Thermal Lance, he is a bit behind on his 1-1 upgrades. That's the one thing that Skillis is really lacking. But otherwise, I love everything about this from Skillis. I mean, the base set up, all the gates now coming online, charge done soon. He's really well set up for the future. Yeah, and the supplies again, a little bit deceptive, like... Skillis just spent so much on infrastructure and tech. So like 10 gateways are going to be online. Dark Shrine, Double Forge pumping out upgrades. Got Warp Prism on the go. Charge as well. So he's he's ready for like a minute from now where uh, <laughs> whether he wants to try and crack Spirit or whether he's comfortable defending his eco advantage here. He's kind of sat in the middle of the map. He's got red little dots everywhere. And Spirit looks like he's finding the one little nook there into that fourth base. Totally uncontested. He's going to, yeah, stim straight on in here, and he's just going to try and pick up the cancel, which he will get, so cancels up the fifth, and now, yeah, on the right-hand side, jumping on that location as well, and that is going to be the double whammy push. I mean, cancel one base, he's going to recall no. a Colossus into the second base. I mean, that's not exactly ideal. His Bioforce can stand and fight this. Honestly, a shame the Matrix went down the Colossus that was going to die anyways. Uh, if it went down on the other one, Spirit might have just kind of stim straight through and won this out, so... Great aggression, and you've got to kind of push forward here, Skillers, because Spirit's about to kill your base off. He cannot afford to lose this. It was all looking good for him, but he's just not had an answer to stop this army getting in position at all. Oh, my goodness. This push, both of them came in without Skillers really knowing about either one of them. And these tanks, if they, they can take out that Colossus, they really can. He just target fire at the end here, but oh. will stay alive with... Oh, just a... A very small smidgen of health, and these feet. Oh, this is a disaster now. This feels like Spirit just weathered again the, the brutality of Skillis and just comes out swinging like true rope a dope style. Well, now Skillis has 80 probes, but he can't even really use all 80 probes, so he's not benefiting from that work to lead right now. So Spirit has the army advantage to so start moving forwards. This time, Skillis is going to pause. As, uh, Told you, man, they're the. the the, the pause bros. The pause bros. The break bros. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 whenever, whenever either one of them is in a series, you know it's going to happen. So when both of them are in a series, it's going to happen twice. Guaranteed Absolutely. breaks. Absolutely. Guaranteed <laughs> breaks. All right, well. 
Take a couple moments then waiting for Skillus, whatever is the issue to be resolved here. And we do have again, obviously just to just to recap the game. It's 2-2 coming up on either side. So upgrades are fairly even, slightly Skillus favored. He's got more workers, but he doesn't have the base to use them. And Spirit is the one with the army, ready to go and pounce again. So uh, definitely a little bit of Spirit favored right now, because he's also going to have the map control to freely take a fourth base as well, I imagine. So I can only think that that's going to be in his favor. Is We should probably check that Spirit's ready too before we count down. <laughs> Mapu on it. Go, go, go. Players are ready. There's a lot of gas for Skillus to spend, but the mineral count is looking pretty low. Neck and neck in supplies here. Raven is still on the map, by the way. And now we've got ghosts in the mix as well, or soon to be, three at a time. Skill is trying to double expand to try and get back into this. Yup. I mean, this is a nice little double drop. They're actually going to miss the prism. So the prism doesn't see it coming. The manifacts don't see the prism. I think that's okay for Spirit, actually. The fact that he's going to get a double drop across the map unseen is the Raven still about, by the way. Drops that Matrix on one of these Colossus, and that just makes this a much easier push in. Because now you're really missing the DPS to kind of punch those Marines. And so you get able to push in, and like I say, that drop on the right side going unnoticed until right now as we unload onto the warp in. I mean, I don't think that's going to do too much. The battery isn't going to be able to heal all of this up. As, yeah, there's just not enough units here. Now we start warping a few more Stalkers. Zealot's on the other side, though, so action just come through from Skillers as well, and he will start to get some SCVs to at least make up for some of the damage that's being taken. He does force this drop back, so he finally cleans up. And 13 SCVs died to what didn't really feel like that much of a Zealot attack, so Skillers actually taking a pretty big shot of damage there. And he's going to lose this medevac. He's going to lose these units. His army supply now going to drop a little bit. He's still in that lead, but it feels as though he's maybe starting to run out of time to go and make something happen with the lead. It... I tell you what, this uh, this is very back and forth, man. Like, it looked very over with Skillis being in the lead, and then it's like, you know what? Uh, Spirit's in the lead, and now, now this last minute looked like it was in favor of Skillis. Oh, this is this is juicy. 2-2 Two -two is about to finish up for Skillis, which is a huge deal for these engagements, but he's got a lot of units out of position. There's no shield battery to overcharge here either. Big warping does come in, but those slow. Vikings going totally uncontested. It's a slow warping now as well because the Nexus dies. So the pylon wasn't connected anymore, so it took even longer for the Zealots to show up. And that gives Spirit even more of a chance. Now, Zelda's going to show up on the other side again as Spirit learned his lesson. It looks like it. EMP into a few battle units, but there's still nothing on that right side base, so he will take a few losses. The planetary holds its own. And I think, in general, comfortable cleanup from Spirit, and Skillis just keeps on gifting supply away to his Terran opposition here. Now, all the Zelda's come back through. The mule will go down, and the Bioforce back over to clean those Zelda's out. Yeah, absolutely. Like, Spirit is definitely just withstanding what Skellis is throwing at him. He, he's doing it better every time, it feels. And now his army's actually looking really scary. And Skellis' eco lead that he once had just just isn't it anymore. DTs will absolutely be annoying when you're only on how many orbitals right now? We're, we're at three orbitals. So not enough to keep the scans consistently going. But Spirit's side. across the map with a massive army. You know, his army's always been huge in comparison, and it's even bigger right now. 30-plus army supply in the lead. This is the point where Zelda's just don't really seem to get the job done, right? Where it's like, they just run in, they just melt. They can't ever really get enough of a surround. Fire Force is just going to come straight through, knock down that Nexus. A couple of pylons and a battery that we can pick on through as well. So we knock down all of this and potentially get up to that high ground, chase some of these other Disruptors down. Now oh, the Disruptor's already <laughs> backing it up, so he might just give up another base. Those Vikings are brazen, man. Like, they just charged in there, and they're like, we haven't been get shot by any stalkers so far. And they run in. They're almost to get a Colossus single-handedly. But Skillis, he, he's got 3-3 three, three on the go. That's a big investment. He's got a Void Ray in the making as well, maybe to try and help deal with this large number of medevacs. But this game is all about spirit right now. He's just be making a lot of right moves. We'll have to back off most likely just because this is a very strong army. Col oh, Marines from the north. Maybe he can pick off that Colossus. He does just that. Supplies very close between them. I tell you what, this is an absolute blood fest on both sides. <laughs> the blood fest is, yeah, he's gonna lose himself on the other side of the map. Uh, sorry, losing SCVs. Two Zelts on the other side of the map as well. I think Spirit just, the reinforcements running in, losing that chunk of units was not helpful. Now DT's in the base as well. Oy, oy, oy. So Skillers is going to do a lot of damage. Spirit is down on workers. 
Skillis has got the right side base up and running, and Spirit's going to have to take a few moments here. DT's blink away, but they are caught on the Zealot, so they're still going to drop down dead. I mean, this is now a lot of army supply of Skillis going down, but Spirit lost 23 SEVs, down by 20 workers right now. And a few units on the right side here just going to jump onto this bio ghost force. And 3-3 is now coming online. Disruptors taking the wrong path through town. And I mean, Spirit's doing everything he can here. He's sniping Zealots. He's going to be losing a lot of his main base to this Warp Prism. That Warp Prism, absolute MVP in this scenario. Disruptor gets shot off <laughs> right as it casts that spell. And the Colossus, don't think that's going to make it out of here. I mean, oh my goodness, this is... This is carnage. Absolute carnage. We're back into the position where Spirit just has a lot more army supply than his opponent. That was kind of true earlier, and then it kind of dropped away from that. Can we get rid of this prison, man? Like, one Viking, please just go and shoot this down, because it is causing you so much trouble, Spirit. He's across the map at the same time. He's going to check the right side base. There's nothing there. There's a pile on there, but I don't think he wants to waste the time going to get it. So get, instead, he's going to try and take down this base, which is taking down many a time. A scan against the DT immediately. There's the gateways he can knock down here as well if he wants to stay on this position, if he feels like he won't be punished for it. Nice to get rid of some production, because right now anything counts. He's still losing out in the main base. I can't believe that Prism has been allowed to live so long. I mean, Skiller still has a lot of work to do, because even though he's taken out a lot of the uh, reinforcements, that army of spirit, how do you beat it? I, he's fighting with shield barrier overcharge here. There's a couple of disruptors in the mix. Oh, oh. my. Okay, it's not a bad shot, but he's going to need a couple more of those to really get it done. And oh, I, th I think Spirit's broken, man. I think so, too. There's an extra disruptor shot. We should uh, never go off. The Void Ray shows up, but there's Marines and Ghosts that should be able to shoot that down. So the Void Ray is going to fall as well. The Robo Facility is again depowered. There's one more DT we need to scan. The fresh base here from Spirit is already under attack, but yeah. Skillers has 11 army supply left. He's got nothing across the map anymore either, so he's missing out on that aggression that has been so good for him throughout. And it does seem as though we are probably getting to a final GG right now. Spirit is going to take down a bonkers series over Skillers. Really felt like he was dead in game two. But man, he, he, he picked up the pace and he played like that in game three. And I think that made the difference because that's what Skillers just could not deal with. Every game felt so good for Skillers early. But Spirit gets to that point where once the drops start working, it's like, man, he was all over. And then Skillers couldn't win a fight to save his life. Absolute madness. There was one real defining moment in that game for me. It's where Skillers kind of had units all over the map to see an attack coming, but kind of missed that attack in the bottom, which was just a double drop, by the way. And it was for his fifth base that he was making. And then it's like, oh, it's there. Sends his whole army over there to deal with a double drop, while Spirit's main army went over to his already established fourth, which was way more valuable. And then he recalls into it, loses a Colossus straight away, and he ended up losing both the bases, which was just... That was a, a game-ending mistake, and that allowed Spirit to get more more into it, like, uh, far more into it. And I, I think overall Spirit just showcased that he was, he was very solid and... Just great play overall out of Spirit, because these games, if he can sort out that early game situation where he finds himself in some tricky spots, that's a scary TVP to go up against. That's a ter terrifying TVP to go up against. He will be in the playoffs. Two Terrans here so far have made it out of Europe into the playoffs. Up next is going to be a ZVP. Reno or Harston will book themselves into the playoffs with Showtime and Max Packs to follow. And then we are going to be going into those matches where it's elimination time in the second half of Europe today. So plenty to come. Uh, we've obviously been having some long games, so we're going to swing it over straight to the break. We'll come right back with you guys with more SE2 in the form of Reynal. This is Hostel.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. We're back and it's ZVP time. As uh, yeah, Zergs and non ZVZs do exist, it is going to be up next this Renal versus uh, Austin series. Apparently, my one of my things didn't update, so give me a second. I'll try and fix that. I have no idea why. What match is this? Is this match 8? Really why? This is... 6, 7. Yeah, the it is 8. Third one of... Uh, wait, is it 8? Wow, yeah, okay, eight, okay. 8th match of the day. Nope. Yeah. No, it's not. 7th, no? 5th, 6th, yeah, it is 7. I don't know what's happened to my... I, I've just lost the graphic. <laughs> it's just gone. <laughs> don't know where it is. It doesn't exist, apparently, so we'll just go in-game. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely... I, I changed it. I must have saved Spirit and... Uh, Spirit and Skillers twice instead of Rhino versus Halston. Oh well, that's a, a mild error that we'll sort out later. For now, let's get into it. In the top left hand side, our red Zerg player is Rhino. And spawning over in the bottom left has our blue toss for the Shopify Rebellion. It is Halston. Yeah, I prep all of the, right. the graphics like at the start of the day, right? So like, I, I just have them numbered. So like, I delete one, I make the the new one the live one. I definitely did it because mm -hmm. I, I stood up and walked away, so I did it before I left. <laughs> and, then, and then it was still said Spirit vs. Skiller, so I just, yeah, it's just gone, man. The Raynal Harston <laughs> graphic never existed. Yeah, I did. this is definitely a match that I've been looking forward to, and playing on Amphion as well. This is cool. Like, it's the first time we've seen it today, or over the last couple of days, that I've been casting with you. So I'm, I'm, I'm very curious how this one's going to go, because PvZ, it has had its kind of, like, zooms and grooves where it's like okay we we went through a phase of sky toss a long time ago when it was like jagannatha and whatnot but now there's quite a few avenues for pros to go down obviously they love the stargate openings and whatnot but this is a very funky map so i'm, I'm curious how they're both going to expand and take this unit wise yeah well i think what's uh, kind of cool on this map is that pvz was really good on this map in tlmc there was loads of um there was just loads of like really cool games, lots of Stargate things, like lots of Air Protoss. There was just those just really cool games. It just works out really well because the layout of the bases just isn't super punishable on either side in PvZ. So you can just play kind of very interesting long games because the map in itself is like a cool shape and a cool format. It's just tough to make it work so much in TvP and so on. But PvZ, it doesn't feel like anyone can really uh Yeah. I feel like PvZ, no one can really punish the other guy super hard, so it makes for a fun map because it is different and uh, everyone gets a chance to play the game, which is always a good thing. Yeah, this matchup in particular between these two, so obviously Raynor is playing from Korea or China, wherever he is at the moment, so we'll obviously be playing with some delay. Um, but this, for me, is one of those where it's like, I remember seeing Harston beat Raynor in some pretty big like best of five best of three situations but I, I just looked at the recent results between them and it's still very massively rain or favored and a lot of people have been like oh harsome's definitely uh the favorite here given the recent history and i'm like that is just because of how our brains work like we're, we're so easily swayed by having a big upset in our mind be how it's been for a long time but Obviously, Harstam is a guy that can take out Raynor, and also with the ping advantage, he can, but you can never sleep on Raynor. Like, yes, he's had a few bad results, or at least bad for him results, like the whole uh, Atlanta situation, he was sick, the Katowice situation, kind of maybe a little bit burnt out, so to speak, but whatever he's been doing recently, I do feel that Raynor spent a lot of time taking it very serious, and we all know that he is a guy that can peak when he wants to. Mm -hmm. But it's it's getting to the point where he has to start making it happen, right? Because he's absolutely a player that you see him in a tournament, a major tournament with all the top players. He's a top four contender every time, but he hasn't looked like it as of late on the land. But this is this is time to start stepping up again for him, I feel. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, he's obviously having career right as well. So it's like, it is time to... It's time to commit, like, you know, it's time to show it again, right? To, to kind of pop off. I mean, obviously he won game as eight last year, so it's not been that long, but I think this is his time where he really believes in himself to kind of get as good as he possibly can once again, so, yeah. 
it's 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 one of those like gamers eight like he legit looked the best didn't he like nobody was yeah. touching him that tournament so the oh, fact yeah. that you know he can look that good and right now these links these are getting quite a bit of damage done probably a lot more than harson was thinking the two oracles are recalled back home to try and help deal with this actually so harson's taking this very seriously and Raynor, i don't know if this was his plan from the get-go but after dealing this much damage and maybe causing this much mayhem on the other side of the map nidus on the go here wardy and i mean it was a very quick left timing from him yeah uh, nidus comes up immediately so gonna be uh just kind of sending it just wants to be aggressive i mean gotta remember he's playing with ping right so he might just be the more aggressive player in this series. He might just want to send it, do things which do not require as heavy a set of micros, such as longer games, any sort of late game stuff. Uh, so yeah, Nidus in it right now and looking to get lucky as obviously if he gets it off that left-hand side, you basically Nidus straight into the natural. Harstam just does not have vision there. The Oracles are not going to find out about this. They don't even have much energy. Uh, this feels horrible for Harstam. He has absolutely no way to defend this right now. Lings are going to stream in. He's got one Stalker, no Blink. Uh, yeah, this is this is this is bad. It's really bad, and hearing that noise, you know, that's where you take a big gulp, a big swallow, and you're like, oh my goodness, the one spot, new maps, not had this truly done to me yet. He's gonna get. Oh, he can actually get in with those links as well. He kind of hesitated for a moment wow. there. He's in. The creep isn't on these queens, so he can't transfuse to keep them alive. Nice body block in here. But those probes are falling, and the amount of firepower that Harsom has available is severely limited. I think this, I think this is down and out for Harsom here. He was caught with his pants down pretty damn massively. Going to try and keep that shield battery alive with a force field, but the queen DPS is there. More Ling streaming in. Harsom was very greedy this game, and none of it paid off. But he is now starting to hold, and if he holds at any point, his work count is mm. still okay here. There are Ling's up in his main base. He might be losing production, which will obviously be pretty disastrous for him. Yeah, okay. Now, that's obviously not great. I, I, the army supply started to look okay, and then I was like, okay, well, with Flink done as well, maybe there's something more of an opportunity, but it's not there at all. Uh, for, for half a moment, I believed. But, uh, yeah, the, the production being shut down in the main base and obviously just having too many queens on the low ground just kind of kills you, so... Never mind my hope. Just trying to have some hope for a friend, but... Yeah, it wasn't meant to be. Yeah, I've got no idea. I mean, that was... That was a really nice uh, attack, and I, I don't know if it was pre-planned necessarily. Like these two have definitely duked it out a little bit, but I tell you what, that was uh, that was a nice one, man. That nice execution out of Raynor, and obviously on a new map, utilizing it like that, uh, just smart play. Yeah, no, good to good to see. And it was the perfect position. Like Carlson just had no vision there to preemptively stop the Niders or anything like that as well. So. I'm just uh, getting the uh, getting the thingy up, the graphic. Sorry, mm -hmm. fixed. I wondered why you were oddly silent. You know, I yeah. can't I can't see you during yeah, this moment. So <laughs> I was uh, I was like trying because, like I said, I usually I prep these at the start of the day. So now because it wasn't it it's just disappeared or whatever, I had to actually go and like select the races and type the names in and type something out. So yeah, just took a moment. Oh, oh the God. difficult life. It's the tough, The difficult man. life of Wardy. Oh. Yeah. It's actually not that tough this season. Turns out observing really was the worst part of, of doing the production job. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Just I, changing the scenes know, ain't I, so bad. Yeah. When I've seen Harston go up against people that he tends to be not the favorite against, mm -hmm. like, I've seen this so much against uh, Showtime. It'll be the guy, and I think this is actually very smart of him to do, He'll be very, very greedy. Like, he'll take big risks where it's like, if he gets away with it, he'll be ahead. But if he doesn't, like, he'll get punished. But why would a quote unquote better player be the punishing guy? You know what I mean? Because then they're risking it by doing something like that. I, I think it's a smart way for him to play. But this game, he obviously did get massively punished by Raynor. And I think that was a good um, gear shift by him to do something like that, especially on a new map. Yep. I think it's a cool time to do it. Like you say, just kind of take advantage of the fact of that the idea. The last few times these guys have played, they've played pretty straight-up games. And Halston really just fell into that trap completely. Reno top left, Halston bottom right. And game number two of this best of three. After you had... My, my map, it gets like 36 seconds. He's like, nope, that's it. No longer waiting for the intros. 
<laughs> alrighty, alrighty. So we've got Harstam again with the probe early on, getting the nice block action going. Rainer is a guy that's mixed up his drone timings um, within regards to how he does take his natural, be it like, you know, you go for that 14 uh, extractor trick out of 15, get the hatchery nice and early, and Proros's early probe feels like, damn, I made this journey early for nothing. But still, it, it kind of puts the... Uh, it's a little cost for the pro, uh, Zerg player. Oh, got getting all scrambled over here, Waddy. Um, but yeah, this game, not going to go for it. Just going to go for a nice, safe third over there. And behind it, Harstam. He's a guy that tends to follow very similar builds in a series. So I'm, I'm, I'm expecting like a Stargate, but maybe not being so crazy with just uh, two oracles on the aggressive. Yeah. I mean, honestly, yeah, I mean... He just needed a bit more information at the end of the day, right? And those oracles kind of just got stuck on the map as well, not even, like, looking around the base of Raynor. They were, like, stuck, like, seeing the lings constantly being out the front, so they kind of stuck with them. So he just never really got that scout either. So definitely adjustments that can be made going into this game number two. Honestly, like, I mean, Halston has lost to Raynor the last few times they played at ESL Open Coast, but he was giving him such a good run for his money. I mean, playoffs of this event last season, of the regionals last season, was an amazing Halston Raynor series. Austin beat Reynold in Atlanta, which was obviously, uh, and Reynold was feeling a bit sick and so on as well, but, you know, Austin has been playing well. You know, he has been looking good in PvZ, so it's not an unwinnable match. It's kind of a shame to see the first game so it goes down so quickly. Yeah, definitely. And it, was it was it the Star Wars qualifier as well recently, or was it not uh, that match that they played? Uh, I, I can't remember. I'm feeling like it was something quite... Oh, I might not have no, seen no, that maybe, one. Maybe that was Showtime, actually. Maybe. Yeah, I don't think I, I just remember. Was in it. No, I, I seem to remember a Protoss definitely doing it, but I think it was uh, Showtime, actually, now uh, yeah, looking back. Makes sense. Harstam yep. will get nice scout off with this Adept. Might get to get some damage done early on. Nice drone micro so far out of Raynor. Couple of drones are close to dying. Raynor's usually very quick about the spore. That might be the ping going against him here. Still, though, manages to keep one alive over there. Not bad, not bad. Not bad at all. Well, Oracle is continuing up on the side of Harstam, so he brings that through. Chrono boosts it along. Link Speed is going to finish shortly. Evolution Chamber and additional drones all building from Raynor. I mean, we'll see what he gets off the Evo Chamber, but otherwise, we're in for a pretty standard setup here so far. Uh, obviously, Raynor not layering it up super quickly or anything with that Evo Chamber on the way. I very much so do see him looking for a more standard game. Yeah, the Evo Chamber is at the back, though. It's, you know, sometimes you find Zerg's getting ready to wall off with it. And I mean, that's an incredibly quick plus melee, like incredibly quick. I, I yep. dare say he might be looking for some shenanigans here to really hammer on down on that third again. Because like, if well, there's any... Ling Bane Queen all in. Could be. Could be. You, you you can never count everything out, man. Like, especially if you're playing. Like, you, you got to remember, like, Reyna's mindset right now. Harstam is a guy that's very comfortable playing these longer games where it gets a bit finessey and it's like storm here pull back here like makes it really hard for you so if you're playing with delay against that that's not a situation you're like oh yeah i'd love that with delay playing it playing your comfort zone i'll play a bit more my comfort zone and i'll make you have to react as opposed to guide me through the game but we'll see we'll see three oracles are on the map this time it's going to be a bunch of adepts there aren't that many lings out on the map just yet to deal with this, but there is a lot of queens and they're seemingly always in the right position here. So it's, it's nice defense out of him so far and more lings will be getting made. Yep, a lot more lings on the way up. Couple queens, the melee upgrade continue to come through. The adepts are going to go shading through the third to the natural. The adepts will go and uh, pick off this queen in a moment as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, we decided to recall, which is fine, but then one of the oracles got caught in that recall. I'm not sure if that was intentional. It will activate, it will help to push back, so I guess it wasn't so bad. Man. I tell you what, Wardy, that's a lot of lings in production. That's that plus one melee coming online very soon. And, and, and no lair, right? So this is absolutely going to be a Ling Pink Queen all in. Yeah, I, and I, I like this. I like this a lot out of Raynor, just because 
it, it's always good if you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable to do something that your opponent is way, way, way not prepared for. And Harston again, he's a greedy boy. He is a greedy boy. And he is getting caught again. Totally off guard here. Yep. Totally off guard. This is terrible. <laughs> this is really bad. He just lost a ton of units before anything even happens. Now an Oracle goes down as well. This is the kind of series that Harston, I can see him in my mind, right? Shaking his head like, oh, this just was not it. This was not it at all. I mean, this is going to be a less than 15 minutes in-game series, which is just brutal because, again, Harston's been playing well lately. But uh, holding this seems very tough because he's already just taken so much damage. Now, that's a good force field that helps, but then the force field does give way. We do actually have the Banes. We have to try and struggle to get through once again. Looks as though they're going to stay on the top side. Super Battery will buy some time, and the Oracles will activate. So Renault has not broken through just yet to Harston. Making something off this getting close to finishing up that Blink, which is obviously extremely useful as well. These Banes do sneak through one or two of them. Not many, though. Oh, my goodness. This is wild. All the Banes are going to go down. And now we're going to have Blink available. I think Harston might have just found himself the defense, but it will be with a dead third base. It will. I mean, he's, he's ahead in supply, and he didn't stop probing throughout all this. So that's a lot of probes that he has. I mean, now, oh, these Stalkers, remember, like, they do have Blink available, but these Lings with plus one are absolutely shredding through them. He's keeping a lot of his probes alive, which is great. And I mean, these Queens, I think this is a one-way ticket, isn't it? Yeah. I, I don't see them getting back anytime soon. And Harston? He's, he's, he's survived. He survived, but he's going to be very grossly oversaturated on just the basis that he has. Was that another Oracle just died there? Yeah, I think that was all of them, right? So, all, uh, okay, there's one still alive, super low HP, but yeah, one of them went down and fought the Queens. And uh, now the Queens do get cleaned out. Right now, Supply is not looking pretty on the end of this. Man, honestly kind of good defense because it was the force field that really bought time. I think Reno should have swung the Banes around the left-hand side much more quickly. Because if you do that straight away, you at least force another force field there. And then when the force fields expire on the top, the Banes actually can get in over there, right? I think that would have made the big difference. Where instead, the Banes just kind of derped around and eventually all they really blew up on was kind of the Nexus, which is obviously a waste for the Bane Wings. Certainly was. And Reynor finally hits Lair. But I like what Harstam's doing here. He's getting charged online, getting plus two very quickly himself. He's also got quite a quick Templar Archives here. And if there is one bane of Zerglings, it is highly upgraded Archons. And that will absolutely add some backbone to this mix of his. And Raynor, this is this is problematic. Like, he, he's going to go for Hydras, which I think is also a good choice, because Archons don't really like playing against Hydras, so they're both making the right stuff here. But... Oh, he, he's got himself into a, a lot of trouble here. And these are the kind of engagements on the map that he doesn't want with these Zerglings. Nope. I mean, right now, Reno's, I mean, Reno's in trouble. The fact that Harsom lives is just terrible for him in general. Because look at the tech. Oy. Charge finishes. Archon's up. Plus two coming through. Prism on the way. We are going to push. And it's going to be deadly, man. It really is. And it's nice getting a little wraparound and quite a few of these Zealots, actually. And Harsom a little, tiny bit indecisive on what he truly wants to do. Oh, finds another... Archon, but doesn't want to go for it. He's slowing down this push a lot. Like, he, he's he's working with what he's got, but we've also got to remember, like, he lost a good six, seven, eight queens on that front there, so it's not as if he has, like, a line of queens with full transfuse energy to work with. This is... That's a lot of Protoss. It is a lot of Protoss. I mean, honestly, as soon as Harsman gets here Wait. with a few more reinforcements, I think he should just send it. He's going to stop and build Storm and plus three, though, so... He's actually happy to play the longer game. He feels as though attacking in might be one of the ways he loses this. Yeah, I, I'm I'm a bit surprised that he's committed to the fourth. Um, I, I think Raynor, for all intents and purposes, that was the moment where it was like, he's in trouble. Yeah. If he can somehow stabilize, I mean, everything else looks awful for Raynor. Like, Creepsbed's just not there and... This army comp as well, like Storm getting online, it's really good against all this, but that was the moment for Harston to really close this one out. And the fact that he's slowing it down a little bit to get to that place where he likes to be, even though it makes sense in his mind to do this, I don't think he realizes how weak Raynor really was. No, I don't think he did. I, I mean, I, I think he's just a little afraid of being on creep to fight, right? Because he's aware that Raynor can make you know, magic happen. And I think he's just very confident in playing from a lead, which maybe just says something about his kind of uh, confidence in his game as well. Where he says, well, if I get Storm, 
And if I get a fourth, like, what do you actually do against me? Because you can't kill me getting there. And if you can't kill me while I get there, I'm very happy to play from there. You know, later, you know, a later game, you're playing with ping. Obviously, Reno doesn't want to play the super late game. That's why he's setting up to go right now. These High Templars are looking for the storm up the ramp. Couldn't really get in range, so it hits, but doesn't hit as well as it could have initially done. Good split from Reynor. The storm so far being minimized, and that gives Reynor a bit of hope with this attack, which has to do a lot of work because he cut drones once again. This is do or die for Reynor in game two. It really is, but this wraparound, I mean, the stasis initially, it's not that good. The shield battery overcharge back there is huge, though. I mean, storms are landing. There's a lot of bailing detonations, but Reynor's army is just way too small. Harsom ties up the series. Yes, he does. Mm. I mean, I like the idea from Reno. He doesn't want to play a long game, so he just says, okay, I will give it a go. I will cut, uh, you know, I'll cut units, uh, I'll cut drones, I will just send this. I think that's why Hostum was a bit afraid of attacking as well, because if Reno was deciding to do that a little earlier already, and then you attack into him, you're kind of giving Reno potentially the best chance he can have. Whereas by just stopping and building up, you know what I mean? Like, if you just stop and actually build up like he did, Reno's then either forced to play a long game on the ping, or a quick game attacking into a Hostum who teched up in a way to defend that. So, I think that was probably the logic at the very end there. As uh, we get ready to go into game number three, we're going to go to the decided map here between Hostum and Reynolds. Alcyone. I tell you what, that's uh, that's a cool map. I I always feel that this is maybe it's not more of a Zerg map, but that that gold being mm, having more potential. Mm -hmm. For Zerg earlier on, always feels quite nice. Then it really puts a bit of a clock on Protoss. If they're playing the Stargate style, they really have to get in there and kind of work on it. But uh, I, yeah, so far, I, I like what both these players are showcasing. Yep, I like it as well. I uh, I, I mean, I, I think Reno is very much so decidedly playing based on, again, ping. But I uh, get excited for this game number three. See what is going to happen. Players are both ready, and remember, this is being played on Europe right now. So, big, big advantage ping-wise for Harston. But Reyna, like most of the moves that he's making here, doesn't doesn't. It looks like he's playing still damn good, just very aggressive. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm down for that as well. Like, I think it just makes sense, and he he is capable of kind of setting up these attacks and knowing the game states to kind of set up these attacks properly, right? So, makes a lot of sense as we get ready to go into. Game number three. Set up the scoreboard. Take us in. And spawning over in the bottom left, representing Basilisk, it is Raynor. He had some sick splits, by the way, against those storms. Like, he really made it, like, closer than it should have been. Because with the amount of storms Hostum had, that army should have melted. Great splits. Top right from the Shopify Rebellion, it is Hostum. And these are all are like the preemptive splits that he has to do right now. Um, yeah. Pretty massively, eh? So, yeah, quite quite tricky indeed. Um, and he's... he's... Oh. oh! Bly, is that you? I mean, we saw this from Bly yesterday, uh, where he took that as his first base, but Rainer over here doing something like this? I like it. Uh, Hostum, this series, went with a very quick probe scout every time. But this game, not at all, in fact. Maybe the one game that it would have been really good. Maybe the one game it would have been good. Yeah, no, he's uh, going to be holding back as that gas finishes up. And so we'll get that uh, money in the way straight away here. My okay, gateway coming down to follow. And again, just going to go down and pop the next sin as the 400 minerals are available. And now... Cybercorn. Do you reckon he's going to probe scout after this one as well? Mm. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm. He will indeed. Alrighty, alrighty. I mean, this is not a bad scout timing because you're still going to confirm where the hatchery is and everything, so there's definitely some benefit to that. So that ain't bad at all. And, uh, yeah. He's just going to take the watchtower and he should be able to check the gold pretty quickly here. Yes, and he's actually going there first, which I think is smart by him. So now he absolutely knows what he's up against here. Like, um, I, I was kind of questioning if he's going to get to see the drone run by, but he gets to see it in a different way. He gets to see them when they first turn up over here. So Raynor is going to eke out quite an eco lead. Harstam doesn't quite have the gas lined up for a Stargate this game. 
Like he's getting that warp gate nice and early. Quite often players will show that, cancel it, get the Stargate down. Twilight Council, totally different game out of him as well. Yep, Twilight Council. I mean, I think as soon as you see the gold base, right, uh, just kind of tells you that uh, going for the uh, Twilight is kind of a good choice, right, because it gives you the ability. And, uh, yeah. I mean, it obviously just allows you to be very aggressive on the map. It gives you a lot of uh, positioning that you can do. And uh, obviously you can really kind of try and punish the fact that that gold is far away from everything else. So I like it. I think it's a smart choice. I think it makes sense based on what we're seeing. It is a very common way to go about it. You don't even have to be like super aggressive with glaives, right? You can just kind of, you know, put a bit of pressure on a macro behind it. It doesn't have to be full commitment or anything. So, yeah, we'll see what Hustle is going to be. He's going to be super aggressive though, like yeah, three extra gates on the way. <laughs> Like, this is a uh, Harsom saying to himself, all right, I don't like you having that gold. That is that is not it. He's got two guys in each simulator here as well, which is pretty damn perfect for constant uh, adept production upon those uh, three extra gates finishing. And there's no there's no robo either. Like, I think this probe that's just left this base here. Actually, oi, this feels Zest-esque to me, man. Yeah. Where he'd showcase a third and be like, ah, oh, it's... I kind of want you to know about this, but how much am I really going to bank in on it? It's almost like a nice warping point for me. Yeah, no, it's um, it, it's one of those, it's also this kind of like, it's a nexus, but it's not really a nexus right now. Like, it's more of a backup nexus. So, you know, you can see it, you can believe I might probe it, but the reality is I'm not going to do too much of that. I'm going to fall back to it later as the adepts do continue to gather up and one more warp and we probably send it across the map and go and see what we can do roach on stun it was melee upgrade to start though from Reynos, so any roaches he has to build here were not really initially part of his plan as 18 lings do start up so he's gonna have a very good link count really healthy link count and droning he stopped at 34 and while taking the gold that's pretty damn solid it is a lot of adepts but yeah the number of links he's gonna get to buy time here and just hopefully deal with this nice and early softening up quite a couple of these adepts but so far i think the attack's been okay for harston given that he hasn't really lost anything but that seeing that number of lings and the other adepts yeah. weren't joined up here that's not quite what you're after it's not really i mean they shade across into the natural but there's no drones here now roach is on the way Reynold might just go pure units from here on out as well, right? And just sort of send it. We saw a lot of, like, Roach aggression against Adept Openers yesterday. If Reynold feels comfortable with the Roaches he's getting, he could just, yeah, go across the map. Plus one melee there as well, so his Lings are also great on the reinforcement waves. He just killed these Adepts, so even more of a reason, I think, to just send it across the map right now. Hossum's Robo is nowhere near being done, so he is a mile away from having the potential to make Immortals. I would not be surprised if these two extra gases are not to tech up or anything just to get ravages out. Like there's there's a lot <laughs> there's a lot lying on this. Like Reynolds' economy didn't take that much of a hit, but adepts, you know, their their, their timing window is kind of gone. He has to be careful with what he actually attacks with here. He's into the natural with just a handful of links, but that's enough to get some chaos starting. And honestly, he's got the time behind this to start pumping out that gas as well for Ravagers. And that's exactly what he starts doing. And remember, he's got three hatcheries to work with here, four queens. He can get out a lot of units very, very sharpish. Yes, he can. I mean, just again, being as annoying as possible with these links. Any distraction right now is good because this large attack at the front is pretty much setting to go. So, yeah, a couple more Ravagers morph in. It's purely links. Reno added a couple of drones on the back of that adept attack, but really not many. It's all been about setting up for this moment right now and Harstam can he find a defense batteries obviously you've got to pick your overcharge very carefully here the immortal gets caught up by the way on the left side the lings are going to keep that busy and keep it away from the fight so the roaches are not going to have a uh, you know an immortal on them for a very long time as the adepts extra do warp in the roach ravager puts some damage out Harstam's army supply is what struggles here 20 to the 50 and it's one immortal still alive on the left. The probes will pull into fight. He can afford to lose some probes, but he needs an army left at the end of all of this. And I think that is truly what he's going to be missing as Arstam just doesn't really have the numbers. I mean, these are the Ravagers can do very well against the Immortals. The barrier Ooh. comes back online, though, and he's still got probes to help with some damage output. Loses one immortal, but took a while longer. And now the other immortal, healthier than expected at this stage. Although now we'll get fully surrounded and taken down quickly. So it looks as though Reynor might have just done what he needed to. Yeah, all these units are getting battered and bruised now. And I mean, 
even with Adept and Mortal, it's not exactly exactly what you want. And Raynoy's got plus one melee as well, so these Ling's doing extra damage. And I tell you what, Harsum, I he got away with it one time here against the aggression of Raynor, but this time the just the the amount of eco behind it as well. It's it's big and Reyna made a lot of good calls this game. Yep. You know, he really uh, he really did. I think he, he found the defense. I mean, the defense initially was great, right? He really lost very minimum amounts initially. Uh, and on the back of that, really has been able to just, again, justify the idea of this attack. And Dark Shrine on the way, by the way, is a very cool way to actually maybe win this for Harsom. It isn't out because there is no detection available for Reyna. No mobile detection at the very least. So if you can get DTs up, then great. Can you survive that long? Probably not, but I like the idea because it's it's desperation times. You got to start making some bigger plays, and and that is definitely a bigger play. Oh, a bit of a surround here on oh. these units, and that's an immortal taking a chunk of biles. Both the immortals falling. Lots of roaches on the front line. It's nothing but adepts and GHG. Raynor two one. Raynor two to one. He is going to get it done. And he will get the victory. He moved through to the playoffs, so Raynor is into the next stage of the competition. Halstam will have to try again later on, and that's going to be in Swiss Round 4, which I believe actually starts up tomorrow for EU. I'm not sure if that is going to be necessarily the Halstam matchup or so, but um, yeah, it is a going to be happening. So congrats to Raynor. He gets it done from Korea as well, right? So, you know, he's still very good. He definitely, I think, adapted with a lot of aggression in this series. He did not want to play later game setups with that ping. Uh, but you know what? He got away with it. He didn't need to play the longer games. So that's what really counts. And that does knock off another matchup. We've got one match left here, Ben, out of the guys that are 2-0. And it's going to be back to some PvP as we go into Showtime versus Max Packs. Then we're going to turn the page to the bottom of the tables and see who is getting eliminated here in Swiss Round 3. So five best of threes remain a day. We'll be back with more in just a few. Don't go anywhere. It's more ESLS2 Master Spring after the break.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. It's PvP time, but of the best kind, as we have Max Bax and Showtime going up against each other here, Ben. What are we thinking? I mean, this is always a fun matchup. Max Bax is, put as, you know, some of the better PvP out there, but Showtime can get his number. He does figure him out sometimes. I'm very interested to see how these two match up on this new meta with the sentries and everything. Max Pax has been high ground gateway expanding. I, I'm, I'm actually really intrigued to see because I've not seen these two play for a month or two. So really exciting for me. I think it's going to be a good time. I mean, it should be two of the best players out there. And we will jump on into it. i even give you a chance to speak. In the bottom right hand corner, the red corner's <laughs> player from Size Storm. It is Max Pax. Everything just happens so quick when we come back, man. You know, we're just ready to go. That's I know. Like, it's, it's like... We're in the countdown, coming back, like, no, no uh, halt on this train, you know? And spawning over top left, representing Berlin International Gaming, it is showtime. Showtime. But, um, oh, so what do I think? Um, I mean, of all Protoss in this region that can give Max Pax trouble, I do think showtime is pretty damn high on the list, right? Like, he's... he's He's been pretty much the go-to Protoss for a long time in the European region. Like, he, he's been the guy that used to fight with the greats of old, like the Snoots of the world and stuff, the Nurchios, and now he fights with the greats nowadays, like the, the Rainers, the Serals. Um, but he's got young Max Pax to go up against, and Max Pax, he's been such a beast in PvP. Granted, there has been a meta shift, but whenever there is a shift, Max Pax might not be the first to get the best, but you can bet your ass that at some point he's going to start figuring things out and start making it look like that's the way to play. And and sometimes he's the only one capable of doing it. So Showtime and him will be going for that low ground expansion here, which this is kind of Max Pax's playground, but Showtime, it's not as if he's a foreigner to this at all. Like, he, he's also exceptionally good at this. Yeah, uh, I'm with you. This is... um. To be fair, this is also that one map with a ramp on it, right? So this is obviously more normal to do when it comes to uh, PvP because you've got that ramp to play defensive with. So this is at least going to be the case of everyone is kind of looking at it and saying, hey, you know what? We are in a situation here where we can all expand. You know, no one should really be able to get too aggressive against anyone else. Now we're going to see Stargate's piece first. And that's scary because this could turn into Phoenix versus Phoenix. And that, when these two are playing, really kind of pinches on a knife's edge because the, you will see Max Pax play very aggressively with those Phoenix. He will try and camp the Stargate. He will have confidence to be across the map despite being a Phoenix down due to reinforcing distance. He's just that good at it. So it's always interesting to see it when it goes to Phoenix on Phoenix. I always think back of some of the games I saw in the past. Um, it could go any way, though. It's not like Showtime's never won Phoenix on Phoenix against Max Pax. It's, it's a fun one to watch. I'm just genuinely really excited for this PvP. I feel like there's so much potential to see cool games. Yeah, it's one of those where even though I'm sat casting it, I almost feel like I'm sat here with my bag of popcorn ready to just enjoy it, you know, soak it up. And Phoenix Phoenix, this isn't something you see every day. It's something that absolutely you can do and really lean into. But very often, once you see your opponent doing it, you see like, all right, they're going to Blink Stalkers, then into other things, and, you know, we're playing a different game. Where they both go, hey, I'm up to the challenge. I know what you're doing. You know what I'm doing. Let's go, go, go. I love that. I absolutely do. Max Pax will start a second gateway nice and early in this kind of situation. Damage done on both ends. Showtime does get, what was it, a zealot in the middle of the map for his trouble there. Um, not, not much in it, to say the least. Yeah clean up this probe which is actually good to get rid of because probes on the other side of the map at this point can make buildings which if we're going to play phoenix on phoenix no one's going to have anything to actually kill off buildings so uh that is a bit of a factor as obviously this is again a little intriguing because just the second stargate is finishing soon from max back showtime only just started his second stargate so there is going to be a disparity between the guys in terms of where we're at at the moment yeah there is i like Max Pax is going to have more production available, and can he use it? Apparently, yes, he can. He does have two Phoenix in production. So Showtime, 
by the looks of things, he is going for the fourth gas a little bit faster. So maybe in his mind, uh, depending on how this goes, might go for a slightly quicker fleet beacon, but have the lower count on the Phoenix early on. There's a lot of things to think about because Fleet Beacon, it's expensive, man. In fact, let me just uh, confirm. I remember it being like 300 minerals, 200 gas. It still is. The upgrade as well on top of that is it's what, 150, 150. Yeah. Long time to get online as well. So if you do go straight for that, you can absolutely be outnumbered. Now, Max Pax does go for his fourth gas here quite a bit later, but he is very ever so slightly leading on the Phoenix production. Yeah, he's about one ahead, but he can't build con as constantly as Showtime can, I think. Um, so it's it's pretty close overall. It's just that slight difference of when they've gotten that extra Stargate up, as we are going to take that moment. That's a big deal, actually. Getting rid of that uh, Adept without having to do anything. Now we're going to trade in. It's a Phoenix for Phoenix. Yeah, again, the Adept is big because it just gets rid of that before the Phoenix shot. If you lift the Adept, you shoot at the Adept, and then your other Phoenix, the opponent's Phoenix shoot at your Phoenix, you're then down a volley in the fight. That's really bad for you. So it was actually important that Showtime, he got that Adept and then got away before anything happened. In the end, they traded Phoenix for Phoenix. Now it's a Fleet Beacon apiece. We are going to see a third base from Max Pax as well, but I think Showtime is very much so coming to catch up on that. Yeah, indeed. Showtime's had continuous Phoenix production since having the two, and he did have his fourth gas a little bit earlier. A tiny lead as well on the Fleet Beacon. So all, all things considered, they're both, they're both in very, very similar positions, but... I think Showtime's way of doing things works out a tiny bit better by the looks of it. Uh, but I mean, everything is neck and neck between them, isn't it? Uh, Pulse Crystals does start off as soon as the Fleet Beacon is done. Max Pass can't quite afford it just yet. Okay, starts it now, but the Chrono Boost race is upon us. Both the players are Chrono Boosting. The absolute living, uh, you know, out of it. And <laughs> yeah, that coming online a good 10, 15 seconds faster for Showtime. If he picks the right fight, that could be absolutely crucial. Yeah, the jump with Phoenix range is a big deal. Uh, it absolutely is. With Phoenix, you know, Phoenix can't be equal. If you just get a shot off earlier than your opponent, or you get in range and can keep that distance where you're able to shoot, but your opponent can't shoot you. So this gives you the opportunity right now, Showtime, to go on the map and to try and take advantage of this. So I'm 100% behind that. I think that's the right call. Let's see how it goes. As he is going to get the fight, he gets a Phoenix. But he isn't going to be able to chase much further now the range is done for max max that's already a decent deal though like he knew it came online a bit quicker gets a few probes for his troubles as well what was that maybe a little adept resources lost tab definitely a little bit healthier for showtime here 400 to 975 and the phoenix remember he's, he's killed a couple like <laughs> some of these things have been very very good for showtime thus far a mothership for max packs here a mothership for Showtime? Oi, oi, oi. Both these players so neck and neck here on their choices. Yep. I mean, it is. I mean, they just both understand how to play this. This is dangerous, though, because Showtime is going to have one of his Phoenix in, uh, accepted. I kind of thought that maybe Max Pax could wrap around, and that forces Showtime to come back through him to fight, which would have been okay for Max Pax because he's being closer. But, I mean, again, it's just neck and neck. And we see a robo from Showtime. So we're going to start to see a bit of a difference now as Max Max adds on that carrier, you know, Phoenix shots wasted on the carrier slash interceptors. His damage done that isn't onto the other Phoenix, but then the robo of Showtime is really fascinating. But he's going to try and tech up in a different way, but also add in a third Stargate. Very cool. It really is. This is a very cool game. Like, getting the robo as well, that will help with the... Uh, detection <laughs> when it comes to uh mothership stuff but carrier so cool like this absolutely like that's a massive investment from max Pax to be getting online now both getting in the sentry out as well you might be like what's that for guardian shield very very good in these kind of situations where there's so much fast attacking in the air phoenix having uh two shots and dealing a lot of extra damage to light what a, what what a funky game I find it so fascinating that Showtime builds the Robo just to get an Ops out. Like, I understand obviously information is critical, but like, I'm just so surprised that we're going to go build an Observer, although I guess if you can kind of keep that vision up, then that's still pretty decent, like not having to have an Oracle to revelate like Max Pax is now going into. Uh, I guess because of the Mothership, right? Because you're going to have that cloaking, so 
it, it's funky because obviously by going for the Observer, it's, it's almost less reliable in my eyes than the Oracle because at least once the Oracle drops Revelation, it's guaranteed. You have protection for X amount of time. The moment you lose that Observer during the fight, suddenly you don't see things while it's cloaked. That can be very scary. That can be very dangerous. So I feel like that's walking a bit of a fine line at the moment. It really is. It really is. We do see multiple Cybernetics cores here for Showtime popping off. So he's getting the armor. He's getting the attack. He's also getting the plasma shields on that forge as well. He is getting a couple of observers out. Carrier count is leading for max packs, both on three stargates. In fact, max packs on four here. Also getting all the same upgrades at very similar times. These lads have mapped this out and they are doing it in the best way they know how. Work account 83 to 80, very close. Showtime very quick to start that plus two air weapons this game as well upon finishing it. And some cannons going down as well defensively. Yeah, I mean, we're at this point, right, where we just continue to extend into the later and deeper parts of the game. We're getting mass carriers, we continue with the upgrades, we are going to get, you know, stag defense on the bases as well. We can just afford all of this. It's 80 workers apiece. I mean, this hallucinate oracle is going to fly around. Just looking to scout it, it's going to get intercepted. We won't see too much. Yeah, I mean, I, this is just a standoff. We're about to max out, and then we might start to see some fights. But the problem is, whoever's being the aggressor is generally going to be worse for wear because they're going to attack into... A defensive setup likely with static defense so do we ever see a fight i don't know man and even if you do take a fight like is it one of those where you kind of posture forward with shield batteries and stuff you know just to help out a little bit i mean damage is done so damn fast in these fights showtime is now up to five gateways or rather five stargates uh beg your pardon so he's getting a lot of those carriers still online expanding a tiny bit faster than his opponent as well I think Showtime in general is just being a tiny bit faster. I mean, you just got the Twilight Council up enabling plus two shields to be researched, um, which but is eight funny. carriers for max packs right now, it's insane. Yeah, eight, eight but then I guess, you no, know, I guess he's also still got three on the way. I mean, this kind of comes down to kind of composition in a way, right? Because there's also going to be a few more Phoenix Ooh. for Showtime. Showtime, I think, is going to give up some Phoenix so he can build more carriers. And he's going to do it by getting rid of a whole bunch of probes. So he's going to hit the economy. And then, like I say, probably just be okay with these uh, Phoenix going down because it gives them free supply to build carriers, and that clearly is the way this game is going, more so than just Phoenix on Phoenix at this stage. Yeah, I, I don't even mind the trade-out so much. I, I thought maybe going for the gas dues just to mess things up a little bit might be the play, but yeah, now Max Pax is like, you know what? I'm going to move across the map. Like That was, that was yeah. obvious what you were doing there. Upgrades are sort of close. Showtime slightly leading on that front, but... That is an army and a half. Like, you have to be so careful about not having your interceptors out in a fight, because the guy with all his interceptors out against the guy that don't, I tell you what, brutal. And he's actually killing his own probes here. I don't know if that was to have interceptors out a little bit, or whether he just... I think it's mainly because I, I think, he wants carriers, but... Yeah, I, I think it's just, again, freeing up more supply. And because you can see Max Packs, he obviously lost probes, and he never replaced them. You know, because he just wants as much army supply as possible. Here we go. We're going to come into this fight. Revelation is down. The time warps came in as well, as we are going to be seeing this army continue to fight it out. It's Max Pax, who's absolutely plummeting when it comes to supply. The mothership is gone. The carriers are still getting to town, and this is absolutely just all about showtime. Honestly, hard to tell you what really happened in this fight because it was a complete mess, but it does go showtime's way. <laughs> I mean, it goes massively his way, doesn't it? Like every carry up falling like he just shift clicked all those down gg is called i uh i can't tell you exactly what happened it just felt like showtime's units just did way more damage than max Pax's, and he was far more prepared for that he really focused down those carriers like like crazy i was gonna say like 10 then but i know <laughs> kevin's out there somewhere making fun of everything that i say so i i didn't i didn't um but cool game it's not often you see that kind of matchup I almost want to watch that in slow motion to see why Showtime had such such a lead in that fight. Yeah, I'm absolutely going to be watching it back on the on the stream in a minute because it didn't... I mean, it felt like Max Pax got the jump on Showtime. He dropped Time Warps, he got the cloaking down and so on. I wonder... I mean, it kind of feels like it must have just come down to the targeting, right? I don't think our I... carry account was, like, super far apart. I think so. I, I think it's also, like... Obviously, targeting down carriers one by one and making sure you shift click them down as opposed to like re clicking a new target, then the interceptors yeah. don't move away very far and stuff. 
I will keep my eye on it. I'm even checking, like, Max Pax did have sentries in his army to guard in shield. Maybe the time warp was just way better place there just to slow down all the interceptors. I'm, I'm going to keep my eye on it because it is going to pop... I'm in the lobby, though. Don't worry. Yeah, I'm in the lobby, too. I mean, well, people can see me. I'm literally leaning over my other screen to watch it. <laughs> yeah, we're in the lobby, but I, I really want to see the replay. Uh, see this a second time around. The interceptors were out on both sides initially. I mean, because Max Pax was attacking the rocks with interceptors. So everyone had their interceptors ready to rock and roll. Time warp. This is the longest two minutes right. ever. Did Max Pax not have vision? He targeted the mothership first. He, he, what it looks like. he had revelation on the whole army, though. He mm. pre revelated it. I, I think, Max. But... <laughs> Great question, really. Even watching it back, I'm, <laughs> even watching it back, I'm still a bit like, why? How? We need, like, we... It felt like. We need a Protoss expert up in here, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, kudos to Showtime, though. Um, you know, going absolute into Max Pax's game and making it look like it was his game as well. Like, he... Very nicely done. Alrighty, spawning over in the bottom left of Alcyone, it is Cystorm Gaming's Max Pax. This is the moment where I wait for Twitch chat to give us, like, a good suggestion of maybe what had happened. I was like, yeah, actually, that makes sense. Literally no one knows. <laughs> in the top right slide, up 1-0, the Blue Protoss player is Showtime. Crazy, crazy. It, it really just looked like Showtime's units just did so he, much more he, damage he to the just carriers. Must have killed the right units. I guess, I guess because he didn't kill the mothership as quickly, right? Because I, th I think you did to target the mothership for a long time as Max Packs at first, and it takes a while to die. And so because hmm. of that, Showtime's targeting it, down carriers. Guardian Shield, dude. I, I think the Guardian Shield was also better for Showtime. Like it stayed alive yeah. for a long time in this fight. Yeah, that's what mm. I'm seeing. That's crazy that that has so much of an impact. That's the thing, like, if the, I could understand that would maybe give him a bit of an edge, but, like, it was a, like, this was a complete slam dunk, you know? He didn't lose anything. Yeah. His supply didn't move. It was actually huge, yeah. I'm I'm looking at a lot of it now. Like, Max Pax's army, I, I don't see the Sentry Guardian shields there, and mm -hmm. that is such a big deal. Um, That's wild. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously, Absolutely the Guardian wild. Shields, they clearly know Guardian Shields important because they both had Guardian Shield ready for the fight. They both had a sentry in the army. But yeah, if that's that, that could very well be the difference. It's just there's so much going on at once. It's like time warps, revelations, overcharges, and everything. I don't, I don't think targeting the mothership helped too much either. I don't think there was an upgrade advantage, was there? I think it was even at the point of fighting. I, I think Max Pax went as soon as his, like, plus two finished on attack yeah. and stuff. And, and it, I was think just... it was even. Oh. Well. Mm-mm. Short time of one, and, and uh, Max Pax can expand. Round two? Round two? Yeah. This is this is great. This is great. If sometimes this is what the PvP looks like between these guys. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, both heading into very mirrored builds. And... Ah, that, that's cool, man. Like, Showtime took that fight very confidently as well. Like... He knew when to sacrifice a few of his phoenix and knew when to just say, hey, I'm going to <laughs> kill a few of my probes as well. Oh, Max Pax with the Oracle choice this game. How do you feel about this one? Cool little switch up, right? I mean, something a little bit different. I don't hate it. I, th I think it's a fine thing to mix up for. Oftentimes, the Oracle can be a cool little way to kind of play. It's going to keep Showtime at home. If Showtime isn't at home, it's potential to get some damage in as well. Uh, yeah, I think it's fine. I like it. I like switching up a little bit. I don't think being down one Phoenix is the end of the world. No, no, no. Me neither. I mean, that, that single Oracle, even if you do open against Phoenix, it's really not that bad. Like, that Oracle, if it gets in and just deals a little bit of damage in this scenario, which looks like it will. Really looks like it will. It's flying into the main now, and tell you what, Showtime's probably got a little twitch of the head there. Oi, oi, oi. Yeah, the Oracle will go down at least. No recall out, but seven probes. Pretty huge. Showtime is going to know that. I mean, right now, Showtime's only supply three Phoenix to the one. He does have a chance to actually just go across the map and get something done. He's absolutely going to have to. And he does have the Adept and the Zealot on the ground as well. So there is potential they deal damage because the Phoenix of Max Packs can't go up 
lifting up a ground unit right now. Like, they just don't have the time to do that. So, my showdown comes in. He misses the Phoenix to the side. He's going to go for a probe. Now it's three on three. Ah, uh, that was a missed opportunity. He could have fought three on two initially. I guess they would have ran to a battery, though, so probably wouldn't have done too much. Now it's four on three, and he's able to camp the Stargate a little bit. But again, those batteries are going to make it very difficult, and this is actually an opportunity where the Adept gets lifted, but it gives Showtime time to get rid of some probes, so he's undoing a little bit of the income lead of Max Pax. Very different start this game. Very different. Like, Max Pax kind of playing a little bit, I want to say, unorthodox for him, going for that Oracle first, but holy cow, has it paid off. Getting a lot of probe damage. Now, Showtime isn't down and out by any means, but... He's definitely a behind, uh, which is not where you want to be. And it is two Stargates already up for Max Pax. He's sitting quite comfortably here. He is suffering from a supply block, which will slow him down. Tell you, I, I like these PVPs, man. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's definitely just a completely different kind of... Especially when these two play, they're so happy to play into the Stargate on Stargate. A lot of people will avoid this against Showtime or Max Pax because they know that they're just so good at it. And you kind of saw, like, they're both really good at it because they both really match each other for a long time in that one. So, it's going to be seeing that Phoenix getting a little pro kill there. Cleaning that out. Well, Phoenix and Max Pax lingering. He is up by one Phoenix right now, but obviously if Showtime's defensively positioned, he should be okay. And despite all the eco damage being done on either side, Showtime's caught up on the probes now. They're very, very close on the probes, actually. 41 versus 42. Um, Max Pax is in a aggressive posture here in... You might be wondering, like, why the why the big stacking there? <laughs> it very often means all your Phoenix can shoot at the same time. It's also very hard to know exactly how many Phoenix your opponent has. It yeah. just th th this like StarCraft Two is a volatile game at the best of times, and this is one of those where it's like, oh my goodness, one one wrong move, one one blink of an eye, and everything can go awry. Well. Phoenix still chilling. Got that Fleet Beacon coming up on either side. The Nexus coming in from Max Pax. Just going to get all those Phoenix on the way. And got the Fleet Beacons coming up. It's just Showtime. He's a little bit late to get to the third. It's going to be a bit of a struggle because Max Pax is out there with the Phoenix. Although Showtime actually getting around the bottom side of the map with this Phoenix could get kind of interesting. Max Pax is feeling it out, though. He's heading back down there himself, so he's realized what's up. Yeah, Max Pax with some sixth sense here, like moving back on the map. Maybe he's like, wait a minute, you haven't taken this third over here? Like, I'm very far ahead. Like, my Oracle did so much. And he is caught in kind of no man's land here in the middle. But remember, Showtime isn't exactly in a position where he's like, oh, yeah, you're uh, you're obviously here. And I tell you what, this is huge. And I <laughs> love the fact I love the fact that he recalled that quickly. Yeah, like me he too. had no idea where these Phoenix were, and he he just played it safe. Yeah, he he knows he's playing with fire, making a move like that. So he gets in, he gets five probes. That's all. Recalls out, and you know what? It's enough to even up the work count right now. Offset a little bit of the third base timing as well. So I think he's okay with it. The one thing that Max Pax knows that he's gonna be ahead on, at least for a oh, small window, is ten seconds. Any on pulse crystals right now, like that. In fact, the time is gone already. It's yeah, gone already, gone. <laughs> and he's going to start dealing damage to these probes. But he has to be careful, because if you're lifting up a probe, and all your Phoenix shoot that probe, and the Phoenix fly in right on you right there and then, you've lost the fight. You've potentially just lost the game. Yep. No, you're, you're right. It's uh, it's it's so tense. Like It's such a high, high intensity when you play in this Phoenix on Phoenix. There's a mothership from Showtime already starting up, by the way. So he will make that investment. That is a cost as it is Max Pax to get the first volley off there. So he actually nets himself an extra Phoenix kill. Now we're going to go in again. And I believe that was again. Max Pax doing decently. It's still only a one Phoenix kill difference. Four to three. As we're basically just trading Phoenix for Phoenix every single time we shoot right now. So not a big difference at all. I mean, Showtime is down by a couple. Like, of course, he's going to have that mothership a little bit sooner. Now Max Pax started his own mothership. And it is wild to see just how much this mirrors. It, it really is. Max Pack's going to start moving out to try and take a fourth base. I'd imagine Showtime's going to be on the case as well. Right now, they do not want to be getting the upgrades just yet because it doesn't matter. Like, you get plus one. It doesn't really change the outcome of how many hits these Phoenix take. But having that mothership online early and... You can just place probes aggressively, in, or pylons aggressively in this kind of situation, making the uh, fourth base 
a little bit slower. Um, but Showtime isn't expanding like Max Pax thinks he's going to expand, actually. Yep. Oh, Cloak Ooh, comes up. That's big. That's yeah, that's big. huge. And he's in range for a long time as well. Wow, that was a big deal. He obviously ran out of the cloaking range at some point, though. So the Phoenix started to take shots back. But yeah, good jump from uh, Showtime, able to benefit from that. And that is a big deal as he starts the fourth base on the upper left hand side. Max Pax is fourth coming online. Max Pax's own mothership now coming up too. Again, we're getting to the point where detection is needed. So we already have the Observer out for Showtime, the Oracle for Max Pax. It's funny that that's the one difference that they've really got between them, right? Where Showtime really wants the orbs. Whereas Max Pax mm. just says the Oracle is good enough for me. It's, it's so interesting that for everything else, they've timed out so similarly in this like mirror mm. that that is like a definite like oh i'm gonna do this and you're gonna do that kind of difference yeah and right now with the way that this is going now they're switching into the upgrades with the carriers coming online their high armor units getting out as much damage as possible is a big deal especially when each carrier eight interceptors each one shoots twice this is when upgrades matter both of them are on four bases Showtime does have that rich gas available, which will run out faster, obviously, but means you need less probes to saturate. Uh, this is as neck and neck as this game has been. Like, this is, a, again, a really cool one out of them. But if I'm Max Pax, and I'm in this situation against Showtime again, where I kind of threw my lead a little bit, or rather got caught off guard by Showtime's uh, speed on getting that mothership out, I'm, I'm going to start worrying a little bit. Oracle, boy, boy, boy. Dives in, four probes, five probes, six probes, man, it comes in and shows up again. The uh, carrier pops out, but it will not get it before the recall, so... Showtime loses a few workers, I don't think that's the end of the world territory right now. We're both on the way to upgrades. Max Pax is again a little bit behind on upgrades. He has not started shield upgrades either here, so... That's an advantage to Showtime, but Max Pax is pushing, and he does have a little bit more, but Showtime gets the jump on him straight away, and we're actually going to dive through there. It's dangerous, going to shoot down a few interceptors. Equal Phoenix count, one carrier down for Showtime at the moment, but of course we've got more in production. So cool that at this point, when my, my Terran brain is like, carrier, 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 these guys are like, still having a lot of Phoenix out and about is really important. Like, they're still both producing Phoenix at this point while sprinkling in the carriers, which is, uh, you know, crazy to me, but it just shows how important they are. Showtime doing very good at selling his plus two, nice and early as well this little cannon rush attempt over here from uh, showtime was uh very fun to see harry is being pretty much the only unit that shoots down besides the mothership yep that's uh very true that's the old kind of like added ground army there's those sentries by the way sentries time wolf so we're expecting those to be big factors in this big fight as we got a taste of last time around we just have Still the army of Max Pax repositioning back out to the center. Still holding this middle of the map. There's Max Pax's vibe at the moment. Alrighty, alrighty. The dust. It's yet to truly settle here. Like, both these players have been testing the water. Max Pax is far more in the center of the map. And it does look like he's looking for a fight here. Oh, gets to catch some moving over carriers. That is probably just what he was looking for. And Showtime heads on back home here. Not losing too much besides that. Very fortunate, actually. That could have been, like, let's say three carriers flying over at that moment in time. And that would have been absolutely brutal. Yeah, that could have been, uh, could have been rough. So, get away with a little something there. It is still Showtime. He's just a carrier behind on the map then. Building four against the building of two, though, and he is way ahead on plus two air weapons. Already has the shield upgrade, remember, too, so a little differences. Starts the plus two on the shields as well. Has the Twilight Council to enable that. That's something Max Pack still needs to build into. Oi, oi, oi. They're getting the close. They're getting close. And shield batter, or rather, sentries, they don't pop off at all. And this fight, this one looks better for Max Pax this time, right? I mean, lots of damage. He's the one with the Guardian shield this time. Nothing on the side of Showtime, and oh my goodness. <laughs> These fights are just bonkers, right? Like, it all comes down to how you initiate, and the initiation is such a big deal. The Phoenix Count's still there a little bit for Showtime on the tail end of this. He's trying to make something of it, but not sure it's going to be enough. He's shooting down just interceptors now, which isn't really killing supplies, just wasting a tiny bit of minerals. He's got his own carrier showing up. I'm just not sure if he's got the numbers. He would love to get rid of this mothership before more spell casting comes off of it, but now we've got to back away. He's getting his carrier targeted, 
And Max Pax is going to tie us up one-to-one, -one, as this time... Yeah, he got the better fight, man. He got the better <laughs> fight to start this one off. <laughs> it is so funny. When you see these fights happening, you're like, Oh, he's got Guardian Shield! He doesn't! You know, oh, it's over. <laughs> you know, it's so confusing, though, because like we've got like time warps, and then it's like Guardian Shields look like time warps, and it's like, I don't know what's why. I don't know if that's a Showtime time warp or a Guardian Shield. Like, it's extremely difficult to pass what's happening in these fights. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of a, a crazy time. It's going to go to Golden Orb Game 3. I can see this happening again, man. Oh, me too, me too. I get the feeling that Showtime thought he was more behind that game than he actually was. Like, it, it felt like he was doing things where he's like, oh, I have to make this move, right? And then I don't think he really did. He, he did have a big upgrade advantage. Um, I want to say big. The timing was there, but he fought... When it wasn't there, maybe assuming that Max Pax was just further ahead than he was, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I mean, I kind of thought... Uh, yeah, I Honestly, I think given a bit of time, Showtime gets in a better spot, because like, upgrades were like, faster for him, he has plus two shields on the way. I think Max Pax knew he had the opportunity to try and take a fight, and I feel like being that's probably what he felt in the first game as well, by being the aggressor, you initiate the fight. It's probably easier to be like the initiator versus the counter initiative right because if you pop your things too soon and the other guy hasn't actually committed into you you lose right like that's just no mm -hmm. good because then they'll just follow up when you don't have the spell cast available so i wonder if that's something about it, like why max max kind of felt so confident the first time around in game one as well as golden aura will be map number three to decide this again lots of two ones today skill of spirit two one rain or hearts from two one short time max max will be two one in these qualifying matchups winners go through to the playoffs Definitely, and both these guys, a lot of real one, I, I I can't imagine not having it because, yeah, they, they must both look at the other one as the, the other best Brodos in Europe. Max Pax absolutely been making a huge blast on the scene ever since pretty much 2011 or something, or 2021, sorry. I'm living in a time machine, Wardy. Sporting over in the top left-hand side, representing Sidestorm Gaming, it is Max Pax. Bottom right hand side, our blue Protoss, it is showtime. Do you think this kind of PvP style with this one gate expand is going to be what we see a lot more of? Yeah, I think the one gate expand is becoming a lot more popular. I think you just, I think the problem is if you open double gate, but you want to play a macro game and you don't want to like fight, like opening mm. double gate, you don't really. There's not much you can do because like one gate build in a couple centuries is so powerful. So the double gate can't do much unless you're then going to commit to aggression. So if you just want to expand, you don't really need the second gateway anymore. I mean, you can obviously still mm. expand off the second game. We see people doing it, but I think as people get more comfortable, this will be the, the absolute way we kind of move forwards with it. Of course, if you go double gate, you can threaten the idea of maybe being aggressive and then actually just expand yourself so you can play some mind games on your opponent, right? So... There's a lot of kind of guesswork in terms of how that might Ooh. pan out in that regard, as that's Nexus from Max Pax before Cybercore. So that's a little switch up there. That's a big switch up. And getting away with that, that automatically, if I'm in Showtime shoes, I'm like, all right, he's going to be ahead eco-wise. What do I do? And then doesn't go for his own Nexus this game. He's like, you know what? Second gate. This might be a proxy robo game or, or something like that, right? Yeah, I mean, honestly, like, I think he's realizing, like, hey, he thinks I'm just going to, like, exactly what we're just talking about, right? Like, hey, I'm going to play some mind games on you. You know, I'm going to look like I expand, but then Max Pax will see the second gateway. So he's got to know some amount of aggression is coming his way. Obviously, the proxy on the left side will show us exactly what it's going to be. We're in position to drop it down right now. It is indeed a robo facility. That's your favorite oh, PvP this, build, this sell up, though. Yeah, yeah this sell up. It Oh, it's not going that way, though. I'm, I'm looking at its trajectory. I mean, no if way. he runs there with a the probe, he could give the game away. Yeah. Oh, he could. Oh, <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Brutal, Treachery. brutal, brutal. Treachery. That's all it finds it. Uh, we will go build another pylon here. You need to keep power on these structures, so I don't think it makes any sense to not put the other pylon down. I mean, your own unit will be coming across the map shortly, but yeah, I think it's too risky not to put it down. Stalker showing up from Max Pax as well, so yeah, sure time. Get it down while you can, and... Now your own stalk will show up. We'll get the advantage there. The first hit going your way. The stalk continues to chase the probe, by the way. So a little bit of action on that. First pylon does go down. The second pylon will be finishing shortly. Then the robo can begin to build. 
And we just need another unit here ASAP so we can realistically keep this pylon alive. Because you do not want to let this up, not in the slightest. Uh, Crobat comes in for one more pylon just in case. This is actually really bad for Showtime. Like, or rather, really annoying for him. The fact that he's had to commit two pi or th a third pylon now to get this going. And you look at that. Max Press is going to have more Immortals on the field while having a natural expansion as well. And Stalker Trade going out. It, it, it's better for, for, uh, for Max Press at this point. A third pylon going down as well. That resource loss tab does not lie. It really doesn't. And showtime is just so slowed down here this is this is so it's even going for a robo bay here yeah this is kind of the crap it hasn't worked kind of build where now all of a sudden you're going to start heading into the um yeah now you're going to start heading into the um the, the disruptor and just hoping you can get a really good disruptor shot to dislodge your opponent and maybe still win a fight uh, that's pretty much the only route you can take here i guess because he knows Attacking in aggressively just isn't going to be working out for him, so... You know, he will poke and prod, but there's two Immortals already there, so... Yeah, we're going to be relying on the Disruptor to try and do something Ooh. to save the day, as we have a nice catch back and forth. That was actually not as bad for Showtime as I thought it was going to go. Like, seeing seeing the two Immortals there, you're like, well, that's, uh, that's not good for me. <laughs> but, I mean, he still does have two targets to go with here. Like, the, the main and the natural, especially with, like, having these Adepts in the mix. And Disruptor... You never know. You never know. And uh, I, I do worry, though, because that single probe there with that first sellout, it really felt like that did give the game away quite a chunk. Yeah, it really ruined the kind of the surprise factor. The sooner you know about it as the opponent, the better it is to respond to, right? Yeah, the Disruptor has to be MVP and beyond right now. It needs to get some huge shots off. It needs to open the door for Showtime to succeed. I'm going to build a second one as well, but... I, I mean, there's still, you're, you're definitely kind of grasping at straws still at Showtime. Like, this is going to give you the best shot at it. But you're still going to need those shots to connect. This is not going to be a guarantee by any stretch of the imagination. This is nice. I mean, he's getting rid of a few probes. So, this harassment is being a success story. And, you know, success is, you know, something you much need right now as the prism will go to the corner. Obviously, he's going to be stuck over there a little Ooh. bit as the Immortals. Going to be in the front here. The Adepts are going to be fighting the Immortals just talking down the store because the Disruptors are... Uh, it's not going to reveal themselves, it's going to hang back. Whichever fight the Immortals are in, when the Immortals are not there, they're going to win, right? Like, they're just such a good unit to have. And Max Max is now up to four Immortals here, Wardy. He can juggle those yeah. Disruptors. It, it's one shot apiece. Like, they have so much banking on them. He can... Oh! Yeah. First shot, picks up a stalk, but that's not what you're looking for. He's looking for far more than that. And these Disruptors can take it out before the shot lands. Doesn't do it! Ah, it's, it's matter. four Immortals. It's yeah, too much. It doesn't matter. GG the Immortals we'll are Max way too good in this situation, and they are going to get the series victory for Max Pax. A couple of PvP uh, air toss games that kind of go here, there, and everywhere. A couple of different players get a very quick win on the back of a long build-up, and then Max Pax defends the, the switch-up from Showtime, which is going to be that uh, attempt of obviously proxy roping, and that will uh, round us out on the PvP. Not just the PvP, though, but also these winners' matches, Ben, because now... We have ourselves a uh, situation where we have sent everyone through to the playoffs. Uh, it's going to go through on today's games. And now, unfortunately, we have to start eliminating people. How unfortunate is that? It is a, It is unfortunate, but it's also exciting. Like the, These guys are all 0-2 sure. in the group. You, you, it's potentially, well, it is your best chance to win a game just yet because you're against the other guy that's 0-2. But we'll be sad to say goodbye to some of these players because, you know, they've made it this far. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's still going to be some some good level play out of these uh, Europeans. Yeah, Petit Drogo vs. Zara's story will be up next. We'll have Nika Rekt vs. Rodson waiting in the rings once that PVZ is done. we got got DNS and Milky Cow going to be starting to wrap up the show. And of course, we're going to close it out with Fordjumi vs. Geralt at the end of today. Four best of threes remain here in the ESLS2 Masters Regional, so stay tuned. There's plenty more to come, and we'll see you for the rest of it after this.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Elimination time here in Europe. It's Petit Drogo and Aristori who are going to be going up against one another in just a few moments. Apparently, I've got this set as a PvP. My graphics are just all over the place today. Okay, well... Cool. Our story is not a pro boss. <laughs> He's cool. a Zerg. But I, I can't fix it right now, you know? Like, we're about a going game. There's literally nothing I can do to fix this in time. So, you know, like, at some point, I'm probably going to make the mistake, right? It's just amazing that now I've been missing a graphic, and now a graphic has PvP on it instead of PvZ. So, we can't actually go in game because there's an immediate pause. So, I guess I will take this time to let you talk, and I will actually try and fix it. Yeah, I, I, I would just buy. So, Drogo wasn't making a probe initially. But I, I don't know if that was part of the build. Okay, now he's making a pro. Okay, okay, okay. So lost a bit of time there, but you know he's he's going to go ahead. It's a super early probe, so it's the one that is meant to block the hatchery straight away, before even the pylon and stuff. Um, but yeah, spawning over the top right hand side as our blue toss. It is Petit Drogo. And in the bottom left, our red zerg is Aristory. A bit of a new game to the events. And, yeah, and remember, every player is 0-2 that we yeah, cast from this point out. on. So every player fighting for their life. And if you're Drogo, a far more experienced player, he's been in this position before. Well, no, it's not, not calling him bad. <laughs> like, but, you know, I, I, I think <laughs> he's, every, he's actually really every... used to be almost eliminated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, if you said that about me, then absolutely. But, you know, every, every player has come to the point where you're you're you either win this match or you're eliminated from a tournament not because he's zero two but you know eventually you get to that stage be it you get second place or whatever but drogo's been here before he's the kind of guy that takes it very chill when it comes to starcraft these days and he's had a pretty tricky road getting here so far like you look at a lot of the players that are zero two and it's like in fact let me just make sure who petit drogo lost to so it was lambo one two and you thermal one two like that yeah. It, fe it feels a bit mean for him to be here. Aristori, on the other hand, is not easy either. First match was Raynor, 0 2, then Gungfu Banda, 0 2. Um, so neither player had an easy route to uh, <laughs> getting to 0 2. Man, yeah, it's brutal when you look at some of the matches people have to play, and then, like, you know, like you're like, wait, Drogo 0 2 is like, well, who do you play? He's like, oh my god, you play like some tough opponents. Obviously, Youth Thermal played pretty darn good PvP when they played against him as well, and got PvT game 3. So, um, yeah, I, I do favor Drogo coming in against Aristory. I mean, 
This is a Zoe player who I've seen in the online cups for a long time. You know, he's always been playing the online stuff. This is kind of his biggest splash so far, qualifying into this event. So, um, yeah. Kind of cool to just see as our target goes down in the main base from the Drogo. So we're going to see him kind of setting up. Very interested to see what Alistory brings to see if he's going to play a bit of macro, see if he's going to have like an aggro side of things planned out here. Because Drogo is typically very good in PvZ. I would not like to play Drogo in a bit of a longer PvZ at all. So maybe my preference would be to see Aristory actually come in and, like I said, get a bit aggressive early. Yeah, I, like I, I don't know too much of the history of Aristory, but Drogo is extremely methodical about how he approaches uh, games. Um, very much similar to how I feel Roddy makes... Teases big game a little bit, like, oh, I did this much damage, and now it means the seven minute attack will absolutely dominate as opposed to my six minute 52 attack. But, like, Drogo's, <laughs> he's got like this tree diagram of, like, okay, I did this, it worked out very well. So it means that if I do this, it's also going to go ridiculously well in. Was going for a bit of a rotty wall over there, but does clog it up with that extra pylon. We have seen this wall so much. <laughs> it's, it's the wall, man. Right? It's the wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it was uh, Gunfu against Bly. Like, the Lynx just ran in the side, and then he had those Adepts sitting where those Adepts are now, and they just ran on in. At least he knows what's up. Oracle coming through. The Warp Gate is a building. All Queens, drones, the OV, everything getting settled here. The Swarm Crawler continues out as well. And uh, looks as though Drogo's very ready just to move straight in towards base number three. So, no messing around for him. Just get that third base up and running immediately. And, uh, yeah, Oracle shows up, gets a couple of drones. He will have more Oracles on the way still. The moment. Mm -hmm. Comes over, two drones, fresh trouble. It's not a bad start. Obviously, took a little bit of damage there. Kills the lava as well. Gets some extra damage going. Um, yeah, Drogo not being thrown off. He's absolutely getting to play the game that he wants. Aristori didn't try and slow down this third. You tend to see that a lot of players with the Lings do tend to give it a little poke. We saw it in the Rainer series earlier. Right now, these queens were in a good location. Still getting a drone. Drogo. Very, very mavericky with his uh, oracles right now. Just goes in for the zest approach. Like, as soon as one's done, go in attack. Second one's done, go in attack. Oh, Roach Warren, nice and early. Yep, get that Roach Warren down. A few drones and overlords continue to come about. I'm just going to have the Robo Facility Forge and the Twilight Building on the side of Drogo. Once again, all of those structures up and running. Next is coming through as well. A couple more probes popping out. I mean, we are waiting to see if our story wants to do anything in particular aggressive, but honestly, it looks like we're going to see standard throughout here. It really does. And again, a few spore crawlers now. Um, you might be like, hey, why don't you make those earlier? Well, every drone that can be gathering, you want to be doing that. And now that this queen counts higher, they might be getting a bit more adventurous on the map, just getting lots more creep tumors and whatnot. Uh, our story taking a fourth base and going for the ranged missile upgrade here. So not going for the melee. Um, very much going to be about roaches this game and ravages, maybe into hydras later on. I mean, very often you do tend to see Zergs go for the melee as well, even if they are going for those kind of army comps. But Drogo getting up to six gases very quickly here and a Templar Archives. Like, if there was a unit comp that I would say is very Drogo esque, it was it was Zealot Arkham. Yeah, like th those are his two big battle units that he loves to play with. Yep, and this is going to be exactly what he builds into here. So Drogo living as we knew him. Immortal coming up as well, as we do just see Link Roach Ravager building 66 drones at the moment. I mean, the fourth isn't done yet, so no reason to kind of build more than 66 workers. But as this uh, as this set of overlords finishes, we do expect to see drones. Otherwise, this starts to look very aggressive from our story. I'm not sure that I would really love him actually attacking because everything Drogo is doing is set to have a lot of units too. I'm very happy that we actually do in DC after the supply block. Seven more drones on the way. And an early storm as well. Nice and early. A couple of mortals joining the mix as well. Still not like a big army out for Drogo. He's really spent a lot on the tech and with those three or well, six gases up and running on every base nice and early. I'm not surprised this is quite a nice little grab. Will he be able to clean any of this up? No, Drogo is quite quick to get the switch going, but makes me think that he would have liked to have kept them as High Templars, just have more storms available later on. Because Drogo, I, I think he is the kind of guy that 
He'll get his army together, maybe 160 supply, and he's going to push, push, push. I, I can't see it not happening, you know? Yeah, no, I'm uh, kind of with you. Storm's going to be done. Fourth Nexus building up as well. Cannon's getting set. I honestly surprised how passive it's been thus far. I really expected to see something a little extra earlier, but I mean, Harris Story just wants to go into Hive and lurk it then. So uh, he will go towards that. I mean, Drogo, if he could go before those, you know, structures are ready, would be amazing. And unless he wants to wait for plus two attack, I don't think there's anything else to really wait for outside of just, you know, lodging in your army, right? So I guess we'll see what we do. It's going to be Hydra's, and it's a pretty fast hive on the go with a lurker den as well. Drogo did try and cancel this fifth base on the gold, didn't quite get to get it done. But I see a lot of Immortals, a lot of High Templar, Archon. Most likely, it's going up to eight gases as well. Hoi hoi hoi. A lot of gases. It's a lot of tech available. Well. That's it though. I mean, Lurker Den about to be finished, and the Hive's not far behind it, so we will be able to get those Lurker upgrades started ASAP, so that should be a pretty big step in the right direction. Uh, obviously, get those Lurkers up to speed, and then. How, I mean, honestly, with enough Lurkers, I always feel as though Mortal Archon will struggle a little bit, but of course, we do have Storms as well, so it's not just a Mortal Archon, but would like to see something that has a bit longer range, whether it be Disruptors, Colossus, something along those lines would be. I mean, Colossus don't really fit into this army. This army can fight lurkers, I'm just worried about there's like a point at which you just can't fight into that many lurkers, right? So, that's kind of mm -hmm. my concern, but we're still a ways away from that. I mean, that takes a lot of money that Aristory doesn't have yet. Uh, Nidus will absolutely throw a spanner in the works, though. Uh, so, Drogo's up to eight gateways right now, with another six completing very soon. He's got a lot of gas to spend. He's taken a fifth base behind us as well. Lots of static defense coming down. This is a very scary Pros army to go up against, and there's a lot of upgrades not yet online for Aristori here. Like, Lurker range is about to finish up. He's getting plus two. Hydra range as well. Although, he's very well situated to take it on. And that Nidus, really, if that gets in the main base or something like that, yep. could be very, very problematic. Yep, yep, yep. And is set up to potentially go into the main base. That's changeling right there. The Overseer there, too. I mean, Drogo is sitting outside the front all well and cute until you actually have to get back home ASAP. Now, of course, he can probably recall. He isn't making any progress right here. How to get Blink as well. I'm not sure how many stalkers he really wants to be utilizing right now. Our story is upgrade that tap, by the way. Adrenal glands, adaptive talent, plus three, plus two. Just getting a lot of tech online in the near future. So we are going to find a decent storm with that high tempo coming through and looking good. Drogo does have supply available to warp in to deal with this in the main, but he's just done a massive warp in on the front yeah. line, and Hasn't seen this it. could... It could be dangerous. I mean, he's got Pylon right there, and now Aristori is attacking on two separate fronts here. Drogo's going to go meet it at the fifth base. He's actually going to go attack at the main as well. Like, Aristori's got nothing on defense, really, to deal with the push, but Drogo, he's on a bit of a clock here. He's got to do... He's got to deal with everything. Yeah, I kind of like that Drogo pulled the trigger, though, because I think he realizes, like, well, you know what? These Lurkers are here. They can't be at home, so let's send it. But the problem is he's got no good way to deal with those Lurkers in the main base. So they're going to do a lot, and eventually Aristori could just bring them back. The Oracles will be the activation to actually try and push these Lurkers away. We'll force them to unburrow and move around now, so... Well, it looks like those Lurkers will all drop. Aristori's supply is only about 20 ahead. Drogo has so much money. Obviously, if he can retake his main and actually get some structures back up, he can spend that money. That would be great right now. He's just losing Archons. He had a couple in the prism as well, so he didn't have everything fighting at once. I mean, that's expensive. Oh. He warps in 10 more Zealots. Again, though, tech units just out on their own. Just lift up the Archons, pulls them back. It's a lot of Zerglings, and the Hydras will chase the prism away. That is a big set of plays just made. It really is, and Drogo's been kind of sent back to a little bit of the Stone Age. He's very lucky that his main base did not die there. Look how close that Nexus was to drop in. Gets quite a few of his gateways back online as well. Because, again, 14 gateways is nothing to scoff at. It really isn't. And that's still a hell of a lot of gas to play with. And he's choosing to go into a th three Stargate with a Fleet Beacon over here. Yep. I mean, to be fair, he's, he's getting to this, so he's like, well, what can I do to fight against Lurkers? Well, carriers would be pretty darn good. I don't really disagree. To be fair, our story doesn't have, you know, too much economy himself. He's only on four bases, trying to rebuild to the fifth base on the gold. Um, 
So yeah, I mean, I think Drogo's riding, kind of teching up towards that. He had a lot of money to spend, and he's got a lot of High Templar to help him survive until that point as well. And he's going to kill off all these lings. Aaron's story really feels to be kind of hitting a kind of a stumbling block, I guess, when it comes to his uh, supply right now. He's not been able to make any progress in a hot second, and these Archons are going to get rid of two Lurk as the prison will unfortunately fall. The Archon goes down, but hey, any Lurk you get rid of right now, I think, is a big win for Drogo. Less Lurkers really makes this a much less scary Zerg army, and that means an easier time getting up to your carriers. It really does. Drogo is oh, stabilizing to some degree, isn't he? I mean, uh, this this run by, I was a bit scared, but nice war pins by Drogo. He's catching up on the workers again. And where are the Stargates, actually? Okay, okay, they're in the natural, but they're kind of tucked away. And Aristory didn't see them, but he did get to see that fleet beacon. Yeah, information is obviously huge in that regard, as you are going to be seeing. There's a couple of Lurgus coming in from the side. Great storms. We had a couple more storms available. We only got one off before the High Templar died. In general, though, I think Drogo's going to be pretty okay with this fight, but running away, he's going to lose a lot of units as well. Just doesn't have any way to kind of really stop the Hydras from kind of getting those shots off. Ooh. Finally gets out of reach. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot more Zealots joining the mix, but a tiny bit too late. But Aristori, he is very much about this, like, kind of, I want to say lowish tech, like having lots of Hydras, lots of Lurkers, and that's about it. He's going to start having to add on some Vipers against what Drogo's doing here, I feel. Or he's going to be in a lot of trouble. Yup. I think I'm just going to get rid of a couple of these uh, cannons. I mean, these, these carriers are looking like they're going to be game winners, honestly. I mean, we're going to try and knight us. It feels like our story absolutely wants to win this game before the carriers are in too high a number, but again, three at a time. They're going to be a sizable number pretty quickly, but this Nidus is going up. So that's actually not going to be stopped, and Drogo's going to have troubles in the main base again. It's kind of crazy. Like, the, these Niduses, they've, they've not been hidden. They've been very much spotted by Drogo's buildings, and, you know, comes back with a pretty large army to greet it, but this ain't pretty. That's a, oh. quite a few Lurkers. Three Lurkers are burrowed over there, dealing a lot of damage. That Nexus still somehow staying alive. Only one carrier over here, and... He's just going, he's doubling down, bringing out more. Going to take Close. out that carrier most likely as well. Does get to fly Ooh. over these buildings. Nexus down. Drogo's supply absolutely plummeting. And where's his army? It's dead, he mate. He doesn't have one. He recalled it into Lurkus. That never really ends well. Um, I, I was I was questioning, I, I kind of understood it because I guess the Hydras were there, so the carriers weren't just going to be able to sit there and deal with the Lurkus. But I'm recalling into the Lurkus is always a brave play. And... You can see these Lurkers here right now, just firing away. There's no detection, so the Lurkers are just getting free shots. The Hydras, enough of them, do they survive to go after the carriers? We're going to try and dive for one. At least we do finish that one off from earlier on. The Lurkers are going to make a very slow waddle back into the Nidus. And, oh, two of them missed the bus. And there's actually knobs in the corner. This obs was here this whole time, bro. He could have been so much more useful. <laughs> it could have been a lot more useful, man. Oh, yeah, this is not looking promising for Drogo at all. I mean... Oh, he, he's also lost one of his big Stargates, lost his whole main here. It's a lot of production down. He's still on 10 gateways and two Stargates, but but still, but still. Aristori, 75 drones. It's not the strongest eco, but I don't think it needs to be at this point. Like this this yeah. number of units, three zero Hydras over here, they, they will. Yeah, they'll deal like the carrier number needs to be like eight plus to deal with this. And it, it's just not that. Storm's really good though. It really is. Yeah. Kind of like to see our story just add a spire just in case, you know? I don't think he needs it. I don't think this game's actually got a lot of length left in it, but it would not be a bad thing to have on the way just in case somehow you eat too many storms. You don't break through here. The carrier count keeps increasing. Like I say, I'm nitpicking because the game's pretty much over. There wasn't much else to say, but one of those moments where, like, that's the only way he could have lost if he has nowhere to deal with the carriers eventually. But obviously, he didn't know to put himself in position, and that is now going to be... Time for game number uh, two with Drogo down a map. Drogo, he's been here before though, Ben, right? Like on the verge of elimination. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's been here before, mate. He's been here before. He's got the experience. Mate, there was one point in that game where he had like 2k, 2k banked. And it yeah. was just like, uh, what, what? Definitely, you know, a, a little bit, a little bit sloppy. But it also felt like his, his first move out, he got kind of stuck in the middle of the map where I think he could have went a lot faster and it, it also felt like his immortal count in general like those kind of builds i think they are better with a second robo or if you're just pumping out immortals constantly and chrono boosting them out definitely uh is very scary for those types of zerg, arm, zerg armies but 
Ah, there was definitely something uh, scaring him that I wasn't fully aware of. And I mean, we do get to see the whole map in its entirety, but yeah, those Nidus's, man, they, they just came down and he had no idea. He went full MKP on those bad boys. <laughs> that, is a, that is a great reference. <laughs> <laughs> MKP. Mate, I never I, heard that one actually used. I, I I've, been, I've been waiting for a long time for that one, you know. The good yeah. old not not seeing the, the creep spine crawlers and... next to knocking down your in base rocks. <laughs> Mate, that 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 single-handedly is the worst thing I've ever seen. And you know, <laughs> uh, I, I still to this day cannot believe it. I'm I'm so happy that he kind of got away scot free afterwards and was just like you know never to be seen again. But that. Oh my goodness, everything about that game actually drove me insane. Maybe one of the worst games ever played in Pro League. I, I th you know, I, I'd go I'd go as far, to, and Mapu's just like, you know what, I'll do this funky little flick on these players, because these guys are absolute arseholes talking about other stuff, but everything about that game, Drogo, everything. Like, he, he, for those that don't know, there was a particular game of MKP that, uh, you know, he was playing against Beyond. Was it Be no Beal? No, Beal, sorry. Beale. Yeah. And it was this map where it was quite famous for going for a backdoor hatchery play with Spine Rush. And oh, oh my goodness, he goes to the bay, the other base, sees there's a late spawning pool, and sees there's no hatchery. And so what does he do with his Reapers? He goes back home to his ramp and doesn't check. But it turns out he did check, and he sees sees this hatchery and these spine crawlers in the back of his base, and it's like, oh no, what am I doing? I'm gonna go three CC, and then. The level of like acting, oh, it was beautiful, man. He should have, he should have won a freaking Oscar for that one. I tell you, I've, <laughs> I've never, I've never, I've never been so, oh, oi, oi, oi. Well, <laughs> we've got ourselves a cyber call coming down here from Drogo, and we wait to see what the plan will be from him as we get ourselves into this game number two. What do you uh, do? You think Drogo goes a bit more aggressively? Like I, I don't even think I was really afraid of Aristori's macro necessarily. I think he just needs to be sharper onto those Nidus's, and pretty much all of his problems would have been solved. Spend a bit of money, be on top of those Nidus's, and it's a very different game already. I don't think he needs to change too much. Like uh, being a bit more gung ho, and you know, looking at his mini map. <laughs> I, it's very easy to be um, brutal, you know, about those kind of situations, but I, yeah, just a little bit cleaner and the macro just popping out the units he likes to make. More, more immortals, too. Immortals are never a bad thing, man. Yep. No, immortals are never a bad thing. Stargate opening, so for the moment, Drogo at least will continue in a similar way to. Now everything started up in the last one. Obviously get some oracles up. I mean, his harass was fine. He got in with the oracle. He dealt some damage. Uh, so that part of it really was okay previously. As we have the uh, thing speed coming through. It's about halfway done from our story. I don't know if he's, you know, 1-0 lead. It's not really a great map to be aggressive on. I was thinking, like, if you're up 1-0, do you maybe mix it up yourself? But if anything, this is the map where you, again, just continue to play macro most likely. Because especially if you like the lurkers, there's a lot of chokes you can utilize the lurkers with on this one as well. So... I kind of feel like that might be a factor. Yeah, this was nice defense from Aristori, and it, quite a few drones there could have felt. Like, many different hits on many different drones. Um, so far, not really taking any damage. So that's nice for him. Drogo with a Stargate again. Has a nice wall off here. Only one little thin entrance, so not a roddy wall. It is a totally normal wall. Yep. Totally normal. Beautiful. Nothing wrong with that at all. As we get ready to drop a Nexus down on the third base. So Drogo will just go straight to three bases. Again, he's ready to just play round two of what we saw in game number one. So getting that settled in. A few lings looking to get across there. The Adept It's going to be able to push those back, though. Nothing too crazy there either. Definitely. Lots of drones coming out for Aristori. He's got queens in seemingly very good locations. Just going for the Spore Crawlers one by one, whereas queens are not. It looks like he's macroing pretty solid. Yep. No, absolutely. This yep. is, uh... 
I, I mean, just there's nothing to say, right? It's just a bog standard <laughs> PVC, mate. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it's uh, been. We've had some long back and forth games today. We've had some long series. I've just looked at this and like this is just straight up PVC. You know, we are just gonna sit here, chill out. It's gold Nora maps, pretty standard macro friendly. Cool. You know, you know, a lot, a lot of people call me out on things that I like to repeat to say or my random tangents, but. Yeah, we've watched a lot of games these past two days, you and I. It, it's it's 24 best of threes over two days that you and I get to commentate. And I, I know, right? Like, at some point, it's okay just to be like, yeah, you know what? You said the right thing, Ben. <laughs> or the, the the nice Wardy, uh, you wait a little bit and it's, yep. And I'm like, yes, Wardy. <laughs> you know what? Sometimes, though, that happens because I get distracted and, like, you know, I had to do a production oh, thing Rainscape. or something. <laughs> no, like... All RuneScape, all RuneScape, Wardy. Let's be real, let's be real. Absolutely not. But then the, the, there is times like this when I literally heard everything you said. I'm just like, I've got nothing to build on. So, yep. You're right. Yep. I'll just give you a good old, yep, good old cheeky little yep. Why the hell not? Charge, Charge. is on the go this game. Charge it, charge it. Now we can talk. Yeah. Well, that's what we saw last time as well, right? We saw Charge as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Much, I, I think Drogo just knows what he likes doing. You said it. This was kind of him back in the day. This is him in this current day as well, and it's a very viable build right now as well. Um, Aristory is going to play into the melee upgrade as well, so noteworthy that the Lings are going to be a bit more powerful. He is hitting the lair soon, so we'll see what kind of tech comes off that lair immediately as well. As uh, I do feel as though Drogo, I mean, supply is good for him. Worker count is good. Army supply is good. It kind of feels as though there might be a moment where Drogo, if he just kind of sends it with, like, Arc on Charger, could actually have a very good push. And that would be so Drogo in a nutshell, man. It really would. He's he's so dangerous with it. Like, one of the recent Home Story Cups went up against, like, Serral, I think, in the first game of the day. And I, I can't remember if he took a map off him or not with true Drogo style. But it's it's a very different approach here from Aristory. Like, melee upgrades. He is getting Roaches out again. Yeah. He's making it all look fairly similar. But a Spire on the go. I like the switch that up. Something that... Me too, me too. Well, I, what I really like as well is because Drogo obviously went charged last time, so honestly, the charge and actually good catch on this prism as well. Aristor is on top of things right now. If he can get the muters up, there's not going to be a lot of immediate anti air. Storm is not amazing against muters because the muters can dodge it because they're so quick to move, right? So you don't really want Archons because they're slow moving too. So there's just without blink, with you know, it's kind of difficult to deal with muters. So it's going to be really cool. And also, it's a really powerful timing where you go like seven to eight muters, you distract, you cause some trouble in the base. And if you just hit, like, a Ling Roach Bane timing behind that, it can be so deadly because the Protoss is, like, scrambling to deal with the Muters. And then your timing on the ground is so powerful on the follow-up. It's so tough for the Protoss to kind of hold it all kind of together during that, so... But I've seen something along those lines right now. This Prism finally gets a chance to drop off these couple of Adepts, and we have to actually go for three, four worker kills, so... Not bad at all. They'll lift back into the Prism as Roach Speed is getting close to finishing, and those Muters are on the way out as well, so that's probably going to be the end of the Prism. And Drogo seems to know about it. Phoenix on the way, and that is a huge setup for him. Knowing that there's muters coming, getting Phoenix ready just makes his defense so much simpler. Yep. <laughs> I had to do it. You were talking. You were on a. You were on a spree. You were doing amazing. Uh, muters are revealed now. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Still the worst. <laughs> no, I, I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I've had I've had a lot of fun today, uh, but muters are revealed. Drogo is in a lot of trouble here, isn't he? I mean, you think? does I... have storm? I I do think so. I, I think this is going to get quite a bit what... of damage done that he's not quite prepared for. What what I actually oh. think uh, would be really nice though is I actually think Aristoria needs to not make more muters because the fleet beacon in a second star gets coming down. I actually think if what I talked about comes through, which is that, like Roachling Bane timing, I actually think that would be very scary because Drogo's really doubling down on uh, Phoenix against the Muters. This is, to me, not the time you make eight more Mutalisks. I actually would have loved to see the mm. ground timing. I actually think, I mean, I get it, the Storm, and that's scary, but Storm is limited. Like, you look at what's on the ground right now. It's five High Templar, an Archon, and two Mauls. That's it. That's the, that's the army. Everything's going into the skies. I mean, we are going to just dive Ooh. these Phoenix straight up. The Muters believe, but, yeah, they probably shouldn't they have done they absolutely shouldn't. I mean, that was shield battery overcharge, and if you're not killing it in one shot, you're not going to kill it with this kind of army. He's proper leaning into the muters as well. He's soon going to have plus one, which is nice on them. Definitely helps out a lot, but as this Protoss is honkering on down on this four-base scenario, 
Uh, that's, that's fairly brutal, man. Like, <laughs> it's it's not going to be easy to crack the Protoss anymore. And as you said, it, Anion Cult Pulse Crystals coming online. Oi, oi, oi. Uh, I, I just, uh, the fact that we're still making Mutas, like, if he was going to make more Mutas, I feel like at some point you start making Corruptors so they can tank the Phoenix. He has this ground army setting up right now, but again, imagine how much quicker this could have been if he started doing this, like, I mean, he's made, like, you know, one, you know, 1,500, 1,500 worth of Mutas since he could have just made a ground army. Going to dive in mm. here. We get the Oracles. That's actually a nice start as well. Got to be careful of those stays towards when the ground army does show up. We'll see what Rampy wants to push up as well. The Phoenix come into the left-hand side. They're going to go after those Mutas as well. And those Mutas will be pushed away, and we're going to hit oh. the third on the same time as this. So Mutas taking an absolute beatdown. Here's the ground army. Gets up that ramp first. Stasis Ward is going to create a force field here. Storm's going through. Another Stasis actually saved some of those lings for the moment. Yeah, Aristory had no chance of breaking through on that one. This is going to be brutal, man. Like... Uh, I Aristory needs to buy time to get whatever hive tech he's thinking about, and he is capped out. Like, Drogo's still kind of on the back foot, but he's surviving, and that's a lot of storms available. It's also a hell of a lot of stalkers, though. Like, complexity of his army, he just blinks on top, and I mean, these muters will start getting some damage done over here, but Aristory is not trading efficiently at all, and especially with these Phoenix, that is so much supply and value, just oi. Yeah, I mean, that's just rough. As, hey, some Balins find some probes, but that feels like the first kind of real victory in a while. Aristory has a ton of money. Now he builds Corruptors. I, I feel like he's just doing everything in the wrong order. Like, if you were going to make Mutas and then Corruptors, like, make Corruptors a while ago, use them to tank the Phoenix for the Mutas to keep it doing damage, and then you can maybe, you know, make the Greatest Spire later and go Broodlord, sure. I just feel like the... To me, the game plan's almost out of sync with where the game is at. So, uh, obviously easy to say when it, none of it's really working out for him. Um, but yeah, there's been a rough game for Aristory, and I just don't feel like his decisions are making it any easier, unfortunately. As Drogo is going to defend against these Lings on the run by. There's a group of Lings heading towards the natural as well. They are going to get in. I mean, that's the chaos you want right now as the Zerg player. Try and give yourself a chance. He's going to dive on the pylon. Huge warp in here, uh, recall here. Uh, just the recall on cooldown. We didn't even finish off the pylon. Unfortunate. 2 HP, I guess, to survive. I feel like this game's starting to spiral out of control. Like, this is too much damage just not being done and thrown across the other side of the map. But, I mean, this is a nice little grab on these Phoenix. The Corrupted choice was kind of weird, just because it's like you would normally, if you were doubling down on the Muta, you'd want to have all your Mutas still alive. <laughs> Whereas, you know, they're all dead. And I, I know he's got the Great Aspire, so he can start getting Broodlords out, but... Is this a situation for Broods? Uh, he's going to spend all his gas. 11 Broodlords will come online. But... Oh, yeah, I, I feel I like know, if there's man. ever an army to have against Broodlords, 27 Stalkers, 8 Hide Templar, 5 Phoenix, and 3 Archons might just be it. Like, without having, like, the full-on Skyvtoss fleet, you know? Like, this army mm -hmm. should just be able to handle this, because there's also really no support from these Broodlords. We're going to drop the Storms on them immediately. The Phoenix can jump on them. Quinn's transfused, and the Broods barely even get some shots off. The Archons obviously deal the Brood lanes, and apparently for now, that's enough to force Drogo back. But I guess he just wants, honestly, more than anything, I think if he just draws these Broodlords away from that kind of uh, dead airspace, he could probably just kind of go for a blink underneath them. It's always nice when Broodlords are revealed and you've already got three Stargate with a Fleet Beacon available. And it's just like, start pumping out some Tempest. Like, Aristory, he's he's not wanted to really make the, the Spellcaster units with his mix. Like, not in Game 1 and not so far in Game 2. And granted, he has to get out some Brute Strength with it, but Drogo's just navigating the map. He, he's trading efficiently. He can't really fight against this just yet, I feel. Not in a little choke like this. So he does have to be a little bit careful, but... And he's, he's got a big bank to spend as well here, Wardy. Like, I, I don't mind him taking trades on the other side of the map, and he is denying bases and getting good trades at that. Yep, I mean, every base he denies is a win, and he's getting Tempest, so he's just playing the slow, safe way to kind of make sure he can close out against this army. I've got absolutely nothing against that from Drogo. This looks absolutely spot on from him. As the Zealots do get there to clean up those lanes, and he's out on the right side, hitting the hatchery as well. You mentioned he's just denying bases. He is just making this as difficult as possible. As uh, Aristory actually lets that base die as well, so no refund. Feeling rough. Yeah, this is not the I'm going to kill you approach. This is the I'm going to strangle you 
I'm going to absolutely deprive you of oxygen here, of, of resources, taking them out slowly but surely. Brutalords can only be at one place at a time, and granted, there is a lot of them, but these Tempests, they're going to reveal themselves soon. I do see huge blue blobs coming across the map. Nice little fungal grab, but a recall to get out of there. And the hatchery was obviously taken out earlier. Yep. And Tempest is going to go and uh, find an overlord of all things, but I mean, I would like to see them honestly just gather with everything else, because that feels like they're kind of giving themselves up. You don't want to see them just get picked off for free. So Drogo does fall back and grabs himself the main army. Because our story is... I mean, he's in this with this army that he's got, but the bank is there from Drogo. He has all the rebuild potential. Our story is not set up to play a long game at all because of what Drogo has been able to do over the last few minutes. So mm -hmm. it's kind of going to be this army, but pushing across Golden Order does not seem like a fun way to kind of move the Broodlords right now. We're going to try and play it a bit slower, I guess, with Neural and Burrow coming up. So we're going to try and give ourselves options, but... Honestly, it feels like that's just even more time for Drogo to dig deeper into his bank and to get even better units on the field at this point. Yeah, and with carriers coming online as well, I mean, we've got a single Viper out, a few Infestors getting... actually going for Neural Parasite upgrade over here as well. Our story's going for some very, very late-game stuff, but the Crete spread that's been getting denied here, like, his, his world right now is so claustrophobic. It's such a small map, and... He's been really struggling to stay on five bases, and this is this is a Drogo that's been kind of untouched economically for quite some time now. Yep. I mean, he's what, coming up to 4K, 4K. We've got the Tempest firing up. He's got so much money in the bank. He can really just trade as he wishes. The Corruptors coming over. Broods and Queens coming across. The Tempest do get pushed back here. The Corruptors will actually get on top of the Tempest, to be fair. It's not really a good way to deal with the Corruptors, and that's why Tempests are not always, like, the best solution. Like, yeah, they blast Broods, but the moment there's Corruptors up, the Tempests are a little bit tougher to make oh, work. Yeah. Meanwhile, though, drones are just dying. And, uh, well, that's uh, another nice warp in here as you just continue to trade out. Our story, step by step, is just losing out. Yeah, it's, it's death by a thousand cuts, isn't it? It, it really is, and... Like, it, the fights that actually do happen with the Broodlords, that's nice, but... And he is getting out of there with a recall. It, it's costly, but Drogo can afford to be costly, and he's got 15 gateways. This is amazing. Yeah. So he can just attack anywhere he wants to with that prism, and obviously this is just, again, you can't respond to this because the Broodlords are so freaking slow. So that's obviously huge as we just have the Broods slowly making their way down to the bottom side. Plus two air weapons is about to finish. Three more carriers are still in production. I mean, I like that from Drogo. I mentioned the Tempest maybe weren't cutting it. I think carriers do help against those Corruptors a little bit more. But Harris story, man, he will not give up. 28 drones is like, you know what? I've got this, bro. 11 more drones on the way. <laughs> Lovely. He's a warrior. He's a warrior. He's getting absolutely uh, obliterated everywhere we look. And now these Broodlords are taking a fight where they don't want to. Like, that is a lot of damage being done to pretty much the... The last two raw here and GG. Tied GG. up, tied up. Tied on up. Oof. That was a, uh, I mean, Drogo obviously kind of, it felt like he really won this one early. And then he did everything he needed to just shut off any possible comeback mechanism from his opponent. He didn't want to go diving on the Broods too soon. And why would you? You know, you're down 0-1 in a do or die matchup. Like, it is trying to play it safe and steady. And he did exactly that to guarantee himself the win. And that puts us at one and one. So we're going to go to another game three today. That is going to be, I think, four in a row now. I mean, our Asia matches were pretty quick earlier, but Europe is living up to the hype, getting some typical Europe games, which is a bit more drawn out. Giving us a good day of StarCraft. Again, a few best of threes to go after this as well. And we're about to find out whether it's Drogo or our story that will live to fight another day. Yeah, Drogo definitely looked a, a lot better in that second game, right? Like, the, the Muta choice was a little bit, of, a little bit risky. Didn't really pay off, and then it was like, once all the muters were dead, going into... He was just playing behind from that point on, and Drogo just looked like he was having a lot of fun with the way that he was playing. 15 gateways, just pumping out units here, there, and everywhere. But yeah. you're right, this has been a nice day of close games. Like, the, was it the Spirit Skillis was the first one to really show it off with the 2-1? Well, even Although Clem, Goblin, Clem the... Goblin was a good game. Like, the yeah. first game of Clem Goblin was 30 minutes long as well. Like, we thought Clem had just... And knocked that up at like eight minutes and then goblin just fought his way back did not win but really kind of made it you know clem sweat for it in the end so yeah i think every series in europe has been 
pretty awesome back and forth. Obviously, Reno Halston was on the faster side, but still, because it was very aggressive, but it was still back and forth. I mean, Halston, I was convinced he lost that game too when he lost all of his units and then still held. That was kind of incredible. So, yeah, no, it's it's been a great day of Europe. It really has. It really has. And we're just giving our story a little moment here to, you know, refresh a little bit. And I do believe both players are going to be ready very soon. And remember, life on the line now. Loser of this series is out of the tournament. Winner gets to live on to see another day. But I tell you what, <laughs> rough, rough situation to be in. You know, there's a there's a lot of aggressive plays available. We got to see that earlier with Reynard taking on Harston. And... Mm, with it all on the line, do you resort to risky play? Do you resort to what you know best? Ah, lots of choices. Lots of choices. Lots of choices. No, I... I mean, I, this is definitely a better map for maybe doing something aggressive for Mama Story. And if he's changed it up two times so far, maybe this would be the time to kind of go for the more aggressive route of things. And especially if Drogo continues to just do the same thing, maybe you know what it is, especially you would like to do that, so... We'll find out in the bottom right hand side the blue protoss player is petit drogo and yeah, spawning on top left as our red zerg it is aristori nice early probe scout from drogo uh, again just using one of the first 12 probes to get on over to the other side of the map starting the game off Doing something that you've practiced and maybe your opponent doesn't always have done to them. Although, you know, Zergs <laughs> do live a, a masochistic lifestyle, don't they? Like, just living the first five minutes of any game getting kind of beat up. <laughs> yeah, Zergs just want to do that thing and everyone's like, I'm going to block you and nibble you and just kind of make your life miserable. Nibble, eh? Yeah, you need probe nibbles on your yeah. workers when you're trying to build a barracks. I know that's not, ah, know that's not against a Zerg, but some personal uh, demons <laughs> coming out here. <laughs> the, the taser in, the taser in, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and that probe, oh, rather that probe, it's just going to be annoying over here. Slowing down the mineral income, just a little smidge there in the main base as well. So it does have a, uh, a second action that it does just to be a proper nuisance. Yep. Proper little nuisance. Next, it goes down on the natural. And, uh... Yeah, we got that uh, Nexus coming through. Hatch gas and pool all underway from our story. And uh, Cybercore will drop down from Drogo as well, so we get that into place. Some litter coming up. Just chilling. Okay, for this game number three. We've seen, obviously, some pretty slow openings in these uh, ZVPs, and honestly, it could just be very similar again, especially when you see that Stargate come from Drogo. And if our story doesn't want to do much, the next two or three minutes might be just very kind of... Uh, Kind of predetermined, uh, just as we saw in games one or two. Yeah, definitely. I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see very similar thing from Drogo here. Like, Stargate is so dominant in this matchup when it comes to, like, just allows you to make the moves you want to. And Twilight Council, it, if your opponent goes for something very aggressive, roach heavy early on, and you run into that, all of a sudden it's like, oh, damn, why did I choose to do this build? At least. Stargate gives you some control over your destiny, right? So it will be a Stargate for Drogo. Our story so far has showcased that he likes the range upgrades, he likes the melee upgrades. He does yeah. like a lot of those big, swell, strong Zerg armies as well in the middle. Yeah, after game one, that's why I was kind of surprised and kind of, you know, harping on a bit about, like, cutting muters and then going into the, the switch on the ground because it was kind of similar, you know, he kind of played that aggro setup in game one a bit. But, um... Yeah, no didn't uh, go that way. See what the plan is in a couple moments. I see the link speed obviously coming through. <clears throat> what does Aristory want to get up to? Does he drop an Evo Chamber here? Does he start thinking about a Rotron already? Obviously options are available. So I got a Queen. Things and all the rest of it moving about as well. And that Oracle is just going to be Corona boosting out the Stargate. So from Drogo we see exactly what we expect. The longer you don't really see anything from Amara's story, the more this just looks fairly normal because the less likely it's going to turn into some kind of big aggression because he's got nothing to set up with it aggressively. So it uh, looks as though he's just happy playing a bit of a longer setup here. Yeah, Drago keeping the first Oracle behind here just to make sure he secures getting this third down and it's not going to get cancelled. And Amara's story, he thought about it for a second, forces out the energy being used and then 
gets on out of there. So both of them look at that and they're like, okay, okay. That's kind of what I wanted to happen. Um, back at home, Arasori's like, there's an Oracle back there on the other side of the map. It's kind of less energy available for the time being. Going to get it set up going. Five to seven queens very soon. Hmm. This really is just uh, build the drones, build the queens, and set up with that economy as strong as we can early. Next is halfway done from Drogo on the third oh. base. The Oracles are just like, hey, look, queens. <laughs> They're going to get rid of one. The other queens are wandering over. They heard there's trouble in the hive, and... They are going to get there for the transfusion, so... It would have maybe been a couple drones instead, but hey, Queen is still a decent grab early on. That was definitely a nice uh, transfuse there to keep that Queen alive, because that could have been the start of... I don't want to be a, say a bit of a snowball effect, but something later on. You know, I, I talked about how Drogo likes to approach the game a little bit like big game in a sense. If he does X amount of damage, he can... It opens up this avenue of possibility. Uh, it will be a Robo, Twilight Forge. All the same stuff from him. No upgrade yet at the Evo. It is on the way to completing, along with a Roach Warren. If you're Aristory, I, I can imagine you just go back to what worked in game one and not go with the stuff that didn't work out right. Yeah. That, that'd be kind of my headspace if I was him. I mean, it's very, it, I would say it's very difficult to actually try and not go back to what's already worked once, you know? So, I'm mm. with you. The only concern there might be the fact that you think back to what worked and you're like, well, actually, is what I did, is, is what I did what worked? Or was it the fact that Drogo just denied the acceptance and existence of a Nidus network? Because I actually felt like initially our story was kind of stuck on an army that was looking pretty rough. And then it was the Nidus that really opened up the game for him. So, but yeah, obviously he did end up winning that game. It put him into the position to play the Nidus. So maybe that's still what you play for, but... It's anything but a clean slate. Uh, it's anything but a free slate if you just uh, kind of play like that first game. Because uh, I did feel as though there was definitely some timings potentially for uh, Mr. Drogo that he was maybe on the verge of taking before those Nidus has popped and ruined his entire plan. Oh, yeah, definitely. Drogo's going to suffer a bit of a supply block here. Uh, very unfortunate because he has been powering up nicely. Both of them on about 70 workers apiece. Those oracles did come over here when, and saw that this base was in production. And they do get to come over as these uh, drones are fleeing for their lives, greeted by a bunch of queens, though. Drogo's been all right with his oracles. Like, this is... It's only four drones that's died so far because he spent quite a bit of time trying to kill queens instead. But it's technically a flawless game from so far, suffering zero losses, and it's going to be a lot of Protoss on the field very soon. Uh, four gates are currently done, but a few more are changing over here. So that number is going to ramp up to... How many is this? Eight gateways available. Charge just about finished, plus one as well. It's a big timing for him. Yeah, no, I mean, you've got everything kind of available if you want to just send it. I mean, Prism comes in with these couple of adepts, tries to find some drones, finally gets one kill, but the Lings will have to it in. But the shade goes down, and that'll be a couple more kills up in the main base. So three, four workers now dropping down dead. As the Bane speed, the road speed continuing up. And that is uh, where you want to be as our story before anything happens. And to be fair, Drogo's just sat at home, so it doesn't like, look like much else will happen. No. Uh, a little bit of drone damage being done. Drogo very comfortable with just getting up to four bases and just letting the game do the talking. Lots of roaches in the middle. Creep spread kind of entering out a little bit. Not being too much halting that progress from Drogo. Drogo, again, suffering a little bit of a supply block here. Maybe, maybe the nerves showing a, a smidge will be a Nexus finishing up soon, which will allow him to produce more units, but... Hmm. Mm -mm -mm. Yep, 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 yep. I'm just going to have the uh, units moving across to that right side. Gorgo's setting up in front of that fourth base. The Oracle's going to come around as well. And uh, just going to see the orb server is there. We're just going to drop the revelation to keep track of things. The orbs will go down, unfortunately, so that will be that. And our story is actually morphing in a lot of Ravagers now. And usually, whenever you morph in Ravagers or Banelinks, he's doing both. Mm -hmm. That's a sign that you're ready for a fight. Yep, go time. Not ready to get a fight going, and that's a lot of Zerg now. Not, not the most high-tech Zerg. We've seen him venture down different avenues in the series so far, be it Broodlords or Lurkers. Uh, Warprism staying alive just, just about there, getting into the main base. But Drogo is hitting a lot of supply here, and it's going to be a big, big high-tech army from him as well. 
The 1 HP prism to just buy some extra time and oh, soaks up a bunch of Banelings as well. That's really nice. That depowers the arrow story timing and just what was in that timing as well. So that's a pretty big deal, I would say, <clears throat> as we do have Drogo. Again, time is his friend because more tech units is almost always going to be a good thing. So the closer we get to all that, the better off we should be. As they cross yeah. the coming in. It's a lot of Zerg. It's going to come in from a lot of angles, but Drogo's been ready for this for a long time here. Uh, storms do start landing on the Banelings. The Banelings are a little bit indecisive of where they want to go. Those probes run into their absolute doom and Immortals, pretty damn good unit. Archons as well, and he's ready to launch a counterattack of his own. Nice defense. Civ set up here from Aristori with those roaches very, very well situated, but Drogo, he's going to launch it. Yeah, I mean, it was a very good fight. Not a single Bane really connected with that army. So Drogo got a great fight, and he's immediately going across the map to make the most of it. And he knows he's done some damage as well. Roaches and reproduction just are not the tech that you need right now. Aristori does not seem as though he has got a route to kind of stay alive in this. Storm goes down the Roaches, but they're also going to be met by Immortals, so that's not going to be fun. So many drones dying. As Aristori is struggling on the natural, he loses this fourth base. Yeah, I mean, Drogo can probably push up into the third as well. There's not really a reason to slow down, as long as this is just Roach production from his opponent. He can jump on roaches all he mm -hmm. wants. Unfortunately, we'll lose the prism, so that's the end of the warp ins here. Um, and that may be the one thing that slows him from going any further. Without reinforcements, he might just step back a second and go back home, get a new prism, and then think about going once again. Uh, that's the damage he was looking for, though. I mean, that was so yeah. much uh, eco damage, and Aristori looks like he's going to be coming out for one last hoorah. Drogo warping in a lot more high Templars. Look at that. That's going to be... I, I said he was an Archon boy, an Archon Zealot boy, and that is a lot of Archons. I, I mean, Roach Ravager isn't meant to be super terrible against Archons, but in that number, with that amount of Immortals, that is a scary army to go up against. I mean, the more tech units, the better, basically, for Protoss in this situation. We see the Archons, Immortals coming around, and, well, the Roach Ravager just does not really have the numbers to it to really fight this at all. So our story is going to, again, be losing drones back at home. He's just going to have to back it up. He's just got nothing going his way, really, at the moment. Tough time. It's a real tough time, Wardy. It's a real tough time. He just got absolutely bludgeoned, you know. <laughs> Comes back home to deal with those zealots, but that allows Drogo to move out across the map. Catches some Ravagers trying to morph as well. Hive is on the way, but with 48 drones, about to lose your fourth base. It's just yep. not pretty. Patrick goes down. Another couple storms coming in. Roger Ravager will take some hits. Corrosive Vile's coming down. We have to split away from that. Corrosive Vile's again. The Immortal's going to set back up once more. We see, I mean, there's just no way you win this fight as our story. The supplies, the composition, everything about it is looking pretty rough. And Drogo will close out this matchup with the 2-1 to one victory. And uh, gets it done. Recovers from the 1-0 deficit. It's that experience that haven't been here before, Ben. It's just so used to it. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Drogo's the 2 1 kid today. Two, one kid. Like, 1 2, Keep Thermal, 1 2, Lambo, 2 1, Aristories. He's living life on the edge. He really is, and uh, it was definitely time to start turning those 2 1s around the other direction and finish off a series because this was elimination. Unfortunately, Aristori is our first player eliminated from the European section of this event, so we have to say goodbye to our Polish Zerg, but uh, fear not. We have another Polish player coming up next, fighting for their life. That is going to be in the form of Rodzin. He plays Protoss. He's taking on the Terra Nicorakt. As we look to see which of these guys will stay alive or not in this next matchup. So we'll be back with that in just a few.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Another matchup down. One player eliminated. Three players left to eliminate today. And three players left to give another chance as a TVP comes up next to decide who gets to go, go, go into Swiss Round 4 here in Europe. Again, just to confirm you guys' the schedule as well, the next few days will be uh, Swiss, I believe tomorrow is Europe, Swiss Round 4, and then Swiss um, uh, Swiss Round 3 for America. And then I believe it's the same the day after, and then we go back to, like, I think one day is, like, Asia and America, Swiss, the day after. And you know what? I really thought I knew what I was talking about, but the more I said it, the more I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> I did know. I swear, Dad, I did know. Okay, tomorrow is, and tomorrow and the next day is Europe plus America. And America's still in Swiss round three. And then we have a day of just Asia and America, Swiss round four. And then across the weekend, it's Asia, Europe, and America on Swiss round five. There you go, on Sunday, that's what goes down. I knew there was something like that. Like, I, I was halfway there. I just should have just... just I mean, up, I, I applaud your honesty, just mid-sentence, to just be like, <laughs> I have no idea what I'm saying. <laughs> Honestly, the boy was talking, I was like, this sounds right, but there's something specific I'm missing to make it all make sense. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, Wardy, I live my life like that, honestly. Like, I, I'm, I'm saying stuff, I don't know what's coming out, it just happens. But, uh, yeah. All right, spawning over the bottom left hand side. As our blue Protoss today, it is Rods in. In the top right hand corner, our red Terran player is going to be Nicorax. I would not actually like to pick a favorite between these two. I think they're both on that kind of similar level. I think they're both very capable of winning here. Um, Nicorag to see in more online events, but when I do see Rodson, he honestly performs like up to a kind of a similar level. So, yeah, this one is uh, has not really got any uh, anything to be added from my side, I guess. No, I like both these players fairly solid, eh? Like they've been around yeah. for a while as well. I, I feel like Nicorag, from memory, is uh, maybe a bit younger, but de uh, this is going to be a close one. Like they're both evenly matched in my head. Rodson is kind of knocked about like the 6k-ish mark on Europe in the past. I don't know what he is currently in 
Nicaracti's not going to be far off. Like, these are the kind of guys that when I load up ladder and I, I run into one of them, I'm like, oh no. God damn it. Like, I'm just going <laughs> to get pooped on. Like, <laughs> like they're, they're sitting in that range where they're, they are actually very, very solid. Uh, and and it would be a shame for either one of them to fall out 0 2 here, but this should be a nice match. Yep. No, I'm actually really looking forward to this. Like I say, I don't really have a favorite to pick. Um, just excited to see what these guys are going to show us. Potential to see these guys play like I mean this is it for them, you know. This is one of them has a chance of getting another shot in Swiss round four. So you know they're gonna play their hearts out. You know they've had a rough time getting here. This is their opportunity, this is their best and final shot. They're gonna play their hearts out, and I think that can really just bring out the best in StarCraft too, right? If you put two players who are evenly matched up against each other and you just say go at it, like you get some really good games sometimes. It doesn't have to be like absolutely pristine, the macro doesn't have to be perfect, because if they're both making the similar amount of mistakes or so. It's still extremely entertaining. That gets me very excited about this. So, it can turn into very scrappy SE2. I think that's what we live for sometimes. Definitely is. CC will be happening. Look at the. All right, all right. So, he's got it uh, in a nice location there to float over. It's been such a long day, Wardy. For a second there, I was like, what map are we on? Like, uh, I, I was like, the natural is below, but obviously, uh, it's, it's been a long day. It's going to be a lot of Reapers with. So it's going to be like three Reapers and two Hellion follow up here. Like, this is a very aggressive build from Nicorac, and this can spell trouble for you very quickly. This is a build that was done quite a long time ago. Like it was, it was very TVT esque. Then it got tried out in TVP, and it was like, hey, this can actually deal a lot of damage. I'm excited. Yeah, no, I, I, I like this one. It's a bit of pressure early. You're going to get the Wooden Mind drop coming after. Just lets you kind of be the aggressor, and you know, sometimes you can cause so much trouble out of this as well. So, you see those Reapers and the Hellions heading down to the bottom left hand side as we head down, down over there. Yeah, and I mean, this is a pretty big entrance in here, and he's actually gonna go for the Adept yeah, I like first, it. just to mitigate, yeah, mitigating the damage. He's, he's gonna, gonna get, the stalker. get that stalker. Oh my god, the, the Hellion microed back with the Reaper grenade. At this point, do we really chase the stalker? <gasps> do, do we not turn onto the probes? Oh my oh goodness, my god, this the stalker is... as well. Jeez. And th th this is an invite into the main, isn't it? Oh my goodness. Well, we talked about this build being wow. able to get damage done. I, I didn't think it was going to get this done. No. This, this is brutal. Savage. Savage, brutal. We could pick a whole bunch of other words. Get the Thesaurus out because this is not pretty. We got the Hellion to get one more shot off. The Reapers will hunt for a final kill or two. We target fire correctly there. We get one more probe. We do to make it 13. My goodness. That went about as bad as it could, if you're Rodson. Like yeah, there's, there's absolutely. Ad, there's advan yeah, there's advantages to having like two of your big buildings at the front, if you're a Protoss, just so you can get a wall in. And then for the for the Terran player, it's like, all right, do I use a grenade to pop that unit out the wall and make my life a little bit easier on entry? But he didn't even have to do that. Got to use all his grenades very nicely. And now Rodson is just fighting the game from incredibly far behind. Uh, like, that work account does not lie. Protoss want to be a good 10 ahead or so at this kind of stage, and it is a good 5 or so behind. This is just not what you want at all. Nicaract is going to have fun this game. <laughs> yeah, he's going to have a lot of fun. He's going to drop oil mines in as well, so this is more mining time lost. You're already in a horrible position. The last thing you want is to be losing even more time Ooh. from mining as the medevac, though, is going to get shot down. So, hey, Rodson gets a catch. He will uh, set off the widow mine. So, hey, that was as good as it could have gone because the other widow mine never got a chance to fire. And he gets the medevac before the natural probes have to evacuate as well. Now, Nicorect will send the raven across the map as he just drops a little scan in. This is one of those moments where you're like, surely if I just build up to, like, stim and combat shields, my first push should be pretty freaking deadly, no? Yeah, yeah. Uh, if, if if I'm in Nicarac shoes here uh, and it's gone that well for me, I just do some pretty sharp two base timing, play absolutely standard, you know, third CC behind it, most likely. Don't complicate things. Um, but he's coming out to deal more damage with this Raven and a bit of a slow pull there. We'll get two probes, some lost mining time. Everything just hurts if you're in Rod's in shoes, man. Like, he, he's going to have to try and gear up for so much here. Yep, absolutely has plus one stim and combat shield all come through on the side of Nicorax, so you will get those going, but uh, I mean, even just trying to blink on the other side, it's like you show up, you, you fire a couple of shots, we're going to try and get charged, we're going to try and get the Nexus, I just cannot imagine a world we get enough gateways and enough units out in time to realistically 
pulled off the bio push. Like, I mean, you just took so much damage early on. It wasn't just the probes killed. You were not mining with any of the other probes during that time. You lost a bunch of units. So it's not even like you had a strong army on the back of this. When you said that this was as badly as it could go, it really was. I mean, in every way, shape, and form. If this wasn't such an important match, he'd be out of here. Oh, you, yeah, you, absolutely. You can guarantee that. Like, you can guarantee it. It's, it's that bad. And now Rod's in. He's trying to get a bit of everything, isn't he? He's got Blink already done. He's getting charge out. And, I mean, four Sorkers can one-shot these Marines. But you see that army, you're like, this is that gulp moment. Because, I mean... It's not as if Rodson has an army back at home. I just checked the unit tab. It's He's got six stalkers in total. That, that, that's it. One, one century, one zealot. And, you know, he, he just lost their 15% of his army. <laughs> like, it's, and that's a lot of Terran coming. And that's a lot of big upgrades finishing. Wait a minute. Stim is super late, though. Did he just accidentally cancel it? I swear he had it on the way already. I, I thought so as well. I mean, I, I don't think it's going to matter, luckily, but... Yeah. Shield battery overcharge, lift, living for as long as possible. These are the worst Marines you've seen in a while. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what a game! What a game! Okay, okay. I mean, if he had Sim there, that would have been a lot better. <laughs> um, I'm gonna watch back on the, the, the stream Oi. and see if that uh, does anything. I'm gonna lose a Raven as well. I mean, hey. Nicarak's giving Rods in all the hope in the world. Like, if this is the strategy to give him some hope and then break him down, then that's just cruel, bro. Just finish him off already, you know? <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. That that was that was so strange. This is this is all bizarre. Like this <laughs> overall, like 90 90 odd percent of it is just like good play, and then one or two things are just like, huh? He like, what's happening? He definitely started Stim, by the way, so he must have cancelled it or lifted a barracks or something. Uh, yeah, I think something like that would have happened. Like, they have changed it where if you lift a barracks now, it doesn't... Like, you can't lift it if an upgrade's going, which I think oh, was really? a nice change for, for Blonkers like me, yeah. That was, that was done quite some time ago. I stopped making um, that mistake a long time ago, naturally. Naturally, naturally of course, yeah. Wardy, of course. <laughs> a, a player of your caliber, you know. <laughs> you know it, you know it. All right, well, let's see how our uh, bio going to stem to the front here. Fusel's going to charge forwards. It's going to be seen the Widow Mines. Oh. Good split. <laughs> the Unburrow split on the Widow Mines is not something you see every day. With Stim, we're going to fight in. We're going to start looking a whole lot better. We are going to just go jump it in. The Disruptor dies. One Colossus is basically going to try and save the day because Colossus 2 spawns into this. And uh, here, yeah, this does not look pretty. Man, that's forgetting Stim. Or not forgetting Stim because you're absolutely right. He was upgrading it. It was, you know, 80% done. And then it's like, oh, damn. <laughs> but yeah, Rodson, he's, he's been fighting this game from so incredibly far behind. The fact that he's turned this into something-ish is massively thankful to that sim cancel. But, you know, um, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it's one of those games where, like, we know it's kind of over. We will obviously watch until Rodson taps out, but it, so much has to go. Like, Nigarak cancelled his stim, and it's still pretty much fine. You know, like, he's still easily ahead. <laughs> like, that's a pretty big disaster that just hasn't really mattered. Too. Like, obviously, he has had some impact, but he's still very far ahead. He has to make a lot more hugely critical errors at this point if he wants to uh, realistically kind of lose this game. But hey, you know what? We've seen some crazy games. I thought Goblin was super dead earlier today, and he survived, so I'll believe for a bit. And against Clem as well, of all people. Like, it was uh, pretty incredible. I, I'm, I'm really happy for Goblin that he got to play a really good game one. Um, and, and honestly, it was one of those games that he could have potentially had uh, several times. Like, I, I don't think he was uh, throwing at all. I just think it was a good back and forth where there wasn't uh, a, sh a sheer outclassing. And doing that with Clem, that's phenomenal. Yeah. All righty. Nicaract moving to the south of the map here. And he does want to get out with those medevacs to somewhere. <laughs> His supply is monstrous at this point. Giga long distance mining. Giga long distance mining. Yeah, I mean, this is, um, I, I mean, he's just in a terrible spot. I mean, I, I, not really much else to summarize on, but we kind of talked it over. Maybe the world you, you kind of win this is if you get the most magnificent disruptor shots. We stim down here. There is not, in fact, a base. Force fields, disruptors, those are your kind of comeback mechanics right now. They are down on upgrades currently. The few Vikings get caught a little bit, so Nicarax 
I'm in a little bit of a struggle there as the Colossi again just put enough of a threat out for the moment. Rodzin's a warrior, man. He, he's been so dead for so long and there's really not much else to say, is it? He's, he's been fighting from such a deficit here and to his credit, like he's, he's got plus one now on the go, but everything, you look at everything that's lining up here for both these players and it's just, it doesn't spell anything but disaster for Rodzin. Um, every fight is potentially going to get worse and worse before it gets better. Try and take a fourth base here against a Terran that's already on fourth base. It's meant to be the opposite way around. Yeah. Well, I mean, absolutely right. We're just going to see the Terran deny the fourth again. The Disruptors are in dangerous position there. We're going to get one of them. The other one just lives off the back of the EMP. Again, you can deny the fourth. We're splitting the Terran army up. There's not enough Protoss to realistically split against two fronts here. We blink in, which isn't pretty either. As the Vikings get rid of the Colossus. We're running lower and lower on splash damage. I'm afraid that these disruptors are just going to get target fired down if they fire. That's exactly what goes on. The Vikings will get rid of the Colossus. The super battery actually will save it for a moment. We're going to lift up and drop the main. And at the same time, Nikorak hits the left hand side. I'm going to run in here, depower the robo facility, stop future tech from coming online. And this should be the killing blow. There's the attack still in the main base as well, remember? So that's trading out with some stalkers. Looks like the medivacs went down, but. Marauders trade pretty well. Reinforcements stim into the third. I mean, come on. At some point, the man's going to run out of units. No, he gets rid of the Disruptor. That could have maybe been the chance as Rodzin does finally have to type GG. Nikorakt is going to win this game after it was kind of done from the four-minute marker. But like we said, Rodzin <laughs> made it a game. He, he, he did. He did. And i, I got to say, Nikorakt... Um... A lot of those fights he microed very well. Like, we both went, oh, are those Widow Mines getting unburrowed and splitting in both directions? It was cool. The grenades at the start with the Reaper and the Hellions as well were all nicely placed. Uh, a good game out of him, a good game. He, he never looked like he was in danger, and that's just nicely done, nicely done. Yeah, sometimes there's... Uh, yeah, I, I mean, you missed, you messed up on the stim, but if there's ever a game to mess up that badly, it's the one where you've basically locked, down, locked it down anyway, right? So, lock it down mess up. Now your mistakes are out of the way for the next game as well. And uh, you still have the map win. Beautiful stuff as Rods and Nikorakt head into game number two here in a second. It's Ghost River that we are essentially ready to load into. So one of these, uh, we've talked about this about kind of the shorter map, but it only gets larger as you play because you expand away from base number four and so on. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll see what that means. We'll see if Nikorakt comes out with some aggression. Again, he is a player who can play quite an aggressive game. So definitely have that as a possibility just to kind of keep in mind in general that you might just be aggressive all out um so yeah we'll, we'll kind of see how that goes this game two starting up on ghost river pretty much in just a second we are loading on into this one ghost river tvp got to see a little bit of it in other matchups not so much in tvp thus far I still think some of those rules apply you know about that sv coming over bunkering down on that third and things like that it's it's very obvious where protoss want to expand and yeah we're gonna see what uh happens in this series spawner here on the top left hand side it is the blue turn it is nicaract taking on the red protoss in the upper right hand corner it is rodson it was a nice build from nicaract that game that was like a also a bit of a blast from the past but you can really see like if you're confident with it you can get a lot of damage done won't be that kind of build again out of him as he is going for a gas first build this game yeah gas first so we'll have a little still definitely have like the the route to aggression a little bit that gas comes in the factory can be nice and quick here i mean well we'll see what rodson wants to do obviously we never really got to see rodson's overall plan because Yes, okay, he, he went to Blink, he went to Colossus, but so much of that has to be based on the fact of, hey, I had a crappy opening, so we never saw how aggressive he wanted to be, or if he just wanted to sit back and macro in the first place. A lot of what he wanted to do was really dictated by the fact that, hey, I lost 13 probes, I kind of lost the game already. So he just had to play the only way he felt like he could to get back in it, which was very light stalker pressure, tech up to some splash damage units and just hope and pray you survive, which he kind of did for a while. So, yeah, he was really forced into his, you know, his hand was kind of forced from, you know, minute four onwards. It'll be cool to see what he does mm -hmm. when he's able to kind of choose freely his kind of choices, his tech, his whether he gets aggressive or not. Uh, obviously, that is assuming he's not going to take a whole bunch of damage early again, which I'd be surprised if it happened twice, obviously. 
Yeah, twice in a row would be uh, very, very bad for him. He did go for a gas first barracks, so he is going to go for a reaper. Will mean a fairly fast factory as well with that. And a CC on the low ground. This is the bravest TVP opening we've seen all day. And it's a zealot first from Rodson as well. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the zealot's actually going to step forwards. Obviously, the zealot can get across the map quickly, but the reaper will meet it, so you can just get some free shots off onto the zealot, and that zealot will basically just buy time for the adept to come through, right? So it's just going to say, cool, reaper, you come back over this way, you deal with me. And then I'm just going to get my adepts out behind this, and you're never going to get across the map to truly see what's going on. The Reaper's going to be forever busy back over on this side playing defense at the moment. Yeah, and if I look at what Nicorak's seen so far, I, this always makes me a little bit scared when I see a Zealot just coming, marching forward, and I haven't got to see if there is a natural going down. He's going to make the call that there is, but stopping that Zealot from slowing this down, does he yeah. get the CC done? I think it's just going to miss, yeah. Unfortunate indeed. But Hellion's on the go. Is it? Okay, it isn't a proxy starport, but this is again a build that you want to be very aggressive and deal a lot of eco damage against. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Is the uh, Reaper and the two Hellions going to come through? The Adept will take a lot of shots. Adept will get away with the shade just in time, but it's going to be right there, so it's going to go down anyways. Uh, that Hellion wants to be a little bit careful. We're actually getting the two extra Hellions up as well, so we're really getting into like dangerous territory. Four Hellions across the map could absolutely start netting some damage similar to what we saw in game one. Yeah, this is this is the kind of build where it's like you use the Reaper, plonk out a unit if they're in the wall. And I mean Rodzin, he is he going up to okay, three gates so far with a blink. This is definitely potential for being very aggressive. But that Reaper will come in handy with a build yeah, like this. Made. You want no a shield battery, by the way. Wow. <gasps> Whoa, he's just, he's just fighting. Yeah, no battery, so you can actually just trade with this, and oh, no. that Stalker is going to go down. Hellions are going to start hitting the probes, and again, there's only one Stalker here now, so it's going to be difficult to shoot down the Hellions in time. I honestly feel like we could have run into the main base, because then you would have at least been away from this Stalker, and you know that's the only gateway that was ready to warp in, because the others are on the front. So then there would have been nothing in the main. Ah, but I guess the battery would have been there. Although, if you went in with three Hellions, he would have actually been able to shoot through the battery anyways, so... Yeah. Any which way, this is still great damage. I like everything from Nicorak this game. Like, I, I like everything from him. I, I think he's played really smart openers here. I also like the fact that he's going for Banshee and tanks. Like, this allows him to send a Banshee over to the top. Just be like, all right, I know you. I know exactly what you're doing now because i got all this scanning information. And it's just going to be more damage. Get the tanks back at home. He's going to sit very comfortably, not taking a greedy third either. If he just plops a bunker down at the front as well, I'd say it's a perfect response to what he's seen. And he's he's yep. waiting with that Banshee at the north as well. Or is he waiting? Okay, okay he's running he's, in a little bit. He's sending it. He just knows that he can already go. Looks about to finish, and uh, this is a, a very uh, harsh reality of just damage to be done, right? I mean, Banshee is going to try and escape to the side. The Observer was good enough, and he is going to see Job just to make sure he had vision as well. So actually do clean up the first Banshee. Not too bad. Only three workers, but it is keeping Stalkers at home, right? Which means that more units get out and just more preparations can be made we see no third base and that should tell you that hey maybe i should just double down with a bunker at the front because like you say that's the only thing he's really missing right yeah that was the one thing that was missing it, kind of funny that he scanned there now. when his banshee was going it, it's funny that he scanned there when he was going to be there with his banshee in yeah. like two seconds <laughs> and he saw the shield battery here earlier but it's like all right there's the observer wants to get across the map as well um, I mean, there's a lot of things that are just not going well for Rodson, uh, really aren't. And this game, there's a bunker also in the main, right? Yeah. He, he definitely is scared about a warping of some sort. Robot base starts for Rodson here, and he's kind of crippled economically, um, or at least not where he wants to be. A very, very late third base. Yep, third is, uh, I mean... Only just now going down. Six minutes twenty is one of the latest thirds you'll see as a Protoss who isn't just dead. Um, th this Banshee comes back into the natural. Even just a couple of shots, a couple of probes, right? I mean, gets in, gets one. It's a pro pull as well. Mining time lost. Nikorak's army supply is looking good. With Stimpak Combat Shield and plus one, if he sends it, he might just win out because you kind of look at Rods inside the map and you're like, well, he's not. I mean, he might have one Colossus, but there's going to be tanks that can take position as well. 
He salvages that bunker in the main base too, so he just gets rid of that. And we're going to unseat your tanks. So we're going to start moving. I think Nicorak is very aware of the lead that he has. He's very aware he can send this a little bit right now. Yeah, and Rodson, he has to slow this down in any way that he can, but... I mean, he's got that warp prism still in the southwest part of the map. He's going to deal a little bit of tickle damage to this medevac. In fact, it's a good few volleys off on it, making it very low. But that Colossus, <laughs> it's got a massive job on its hands, doesn't it? And this time, Stim is not cancelled for Nicaract, as Mapu does point out. And that third base, oh, it's basically got a welcome, welcome Nicaract sign on it at this point. Yep. <laughs> Welcome home. This one is yours already as uh, it gets cancelled up. Rodson actually supply blocked on the back of this just in case losing the third base alone wasn't going to be bad enough. We stim in. No respect for this Colossus. There shouldn't be to be fair because there's nothing. There's no battery here to fall back to on the natural and we can just hit the robo facility. I don't think we have to pull back with these bio units. Get rid of that robo. The Colossus is probably the only good thing that can come out of this right now and yeah, Stalker's getting targeted by, by tanks. And Fire will trade against the Zealots. This is good enough to send Nicarag to with a 2 0. Gonna break our streak of 2 1 victories. And uh, it was a pretty darn fast series as well. Nicarag just got ahead early both times. And uh, while game one dragged on a little bit, he had no intentions of letting game two drag on at all. Overall, I like Nicarag's play a lot. I think the only thing that I would have said that maybe maybe being a bit more patient with the first banshee and the cloak like just waiting for some because normally in rts it's like you've done a lot of damage your opponent needs to come to you so get the bunker then wait and then get the banshees in you know maybe getting two out at the same time um but besides that just really good play out of him wasn't it like he micro good good builds rodson just never got to get going in this series uh real, really cool play out nick correct yep awesome stuff and with that, we are basically set to go into our last couple of matches. It is going to be a TVP once again with DNS versus Milky Cow. And then we're going to go into Fujumi versus Garrett for some cheeky little PvP as well. So we are going to get all of that on the go, ready to play. Two best of threes remain today. Let's see who will survive through to Swiss round four.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. We have two best of threes remaining, and it is going to be Milky Cow versus DNS up next. Actually, I think this is a pretty fun matchup, Ben. What do you uh, think going into it as these two look to survive another day? I would have said that DNS was the favorite, but I feel this is one of those where Milky Cow is on his way in and obviously trying a lot, and DNS, I feel a bit mean saying on his way out, but, you know, he's he's a bit less uh, full-on with the StarCraft these days. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of like uh, old guard meets new uh, in a little bit of a way. I'm a bit surprised that both of them are here, to be fair, and I will go ahead and look at who they played previously. So DNS lost to Shadown 1-2, lost to Strange 0-2. So no shame in that. And Milky Cow, 0-2 against Clem, 0-2 against Mana. <laughs> so not easy opponents whatsoever for Milky Cow. Yep. And that's, um, I mean, honestly, just uh, rough opponents across the board. Um, yeah, I, I mean, obviously, DNS has only played PvP, so maybe it looks a bit better in the PvT. That's a benefit, you could say. Obviously, Milky Cow lost a mana, but I wouldn't say DNS is... I'd say DNS mana honestly play about a similar level lately, so maybe that doesn't bode well for Milky Cow. Um, then again, mana actually kind of popped off against Battle Bee as well, so maybe mana is a little better than DNS right now. Anyways, we're going to be heading into Amphion for game one of this best of three. We mentioned we haven't seen this map a lot. We saw it a little bit earlier in the ZVP. We only got a five-minute game on it, uh, so maybe this is our time have a good old time on Amphion. Yeah, I'd... these new maps really bring out the best and worst in people. Like, uh, as soon as you can find something that's nice and cheeky, and it's like, yeah, I'm going to showcase this. This is beautiful. Like, it gets done. Um, but I do think that same Nida spot that um, Reynard did utilize is a very good drop spot to be between the bases, depending on where you want to go. Spotting over in the bottom hand side, as the blue turn, it is Milky Cow. Up left, our Red Brutal player is going to be DNS. What would you give the name Milky Cow out of 10, as far as nicknames go? Oh, 10. Easily. That's a 10 out of 10 nickname. It's descriptive. It's accurate. It's factual. Cows, oh. cows are, in fact, milky. <laughs> <laughs> well, not the, not the male ones. But sure, but we can generalize, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Sure, sure, sure. If, if you yeah, if I'm, you I'm... if you think of a cow, and I say milky, do you, do you think? Well, only the women. Like, <laughs> surely not. No. I mean, I don't know. I I, I, think, I think of cows. I think of milk. I, I don't know what to say. When I think of cows, I think of I think of the animal. <laughs> 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 well, I, I I actually don't know what I think of when I think of a cow. Like I don't know if milk comes to mind, but if you say cow and milk, I'm like I'm not looking at you like you're speaking a different language, you know. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just uh, you know I I don't know why when I saw that I thought of ratata. Like uh, and I thought, <laughs> what? Oh, everything makes ten. you think of wild ratata. <laughs> I I just you know. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. I just well, want okay. to know what your thoughts are. Right? What, what's your What's your opinion on the name Milky Cow out of ten? Out of ten, um, I'll give it a six. A six? Okay. Well, if I let, let's say let's say um, you know you you, you <laughs> I'm just thinking you 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 bring a girl home or a boy home whatever <laughs> and you're like. Hey, what's your what's your gamer tag? And they tell me it's Milky Cow. I'm not thinking, oh, I've I've, I've got I've got a right one here. Like I'm, I'm thinking, what the hell were you thinking? You know? Is that is that how you, is that how you rate your dates? The gamer tag. I, I mean, if they've got a terrible gamer tag, I'm like, I'm out of here. You know, this is a red flag straight away. So I, I think Milky Milky Cow would definitely come pretty high on my red flag radar. And Ratata, to be fair, that's a that's. <laughs> I feel like I feel like a lot of gamer tags are gonna give you red flags if that's how we're discussing them. That absolutely, like you know, I, I, I to be fair, there's some that are really damn cool. Like when you say it, you're just like, frick, yeah. But <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just waiting for Pidgey to show up. Like terrible. <laughs> I'm gonna make an account of Pid uh, account called Pidgey and just get real high on ladder just to 
just to make you feel the pain. <laughs> hey, no respect. You, you really will. You really will. Yeah, man. Find, find uh, okay, some motivation so to grind again. <laughs> That's your motivation? Uh, all right. So Milky Cow did get a scout going off. Did he get to see the tech exactly? Yeah, he did. Exactly. So he gets to know that it is indeed a Stargate opening. Does have a Hellion out on the map as well. Cyclone being made. He's playing. He's doing all the good stuff, isn't he? Um, to deal with what is most likely either an Oracle or a Phoenix out of that Stargate. Not going to be a, a Void Ray because, you know, <laughs> that's ridiculous. But, but yeah. Yeah. Um, Phoenix uh, already showing up and is just going to utilize its ability to get across the map to actually scout this Hellion. Ooh. Potential for damage. He's going to get one. He's going to get two kills. He's going to get three kills. No. Ah, oh, he Ooh. got it. He got it. Legendary Hellion. That was, that was great, man. That was absolutely fabulous. Um, so he's already got a good four pros for his troubles. This Phoenix as well has been damaged. I guess that was just happening against most likely the Cyclone, right? And Milky Cow taking a very early third here in his natural. Gorgeous play out of Milky Cow so far. I, I like what I'm seeing. And I've seen Milky Cow in the past as well, where it's like he will start nuking Protoss and going full, full, full late game and making it look really awesome. He, he's one of these players that I do look out just to hope that you know the stars align for him at some point because he is an exciting little Terran. oh no i'm with you man like uh milky cow has also been the player who's been in so many of these regionals but it's just it always seems to struggle to like get going like he qualifies consistently but once he's qualified it feels like he never gets like a good bracket or like i mean he used to he dropped zero seven a few times when we had the bigger swiss group uh bigger round robin groups He's just not had a good run once he gets here. And yeah, I feel like the potential is there. I see him, you know, challenging these top guys and absolutely having good games. I feel like he should be able to do more than what he's shown us in these events. And I'd love to see him have one more chance. I mean, it's kind of like, you want to see both these guys have one more chance. DNS, he's been around a long time. He's been playing in my events for forever as well. So, yeah. That's rough that these two have to play each other. Why do these two have to play each other for knockout, Ben? It's not fair. Uh, at some point, you have to run into the milky cow, man. Whether you like it or not. Oh, that's a great snipe there. Focus firing that low health Phoenix. Yep. <laughs> and run <I'm> down. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, this one wasn't my fault. I was distracted by touching that. <laughs> I, and also, oh, really? that wasn't that wasn't just a yep and a stop. This was a uh, this was a, a yep, and I was about to continue talking, but then you were just already like yep on your own side. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I love it, man. You know, these these long days, it's like, hey, man, you get four minute break here, here, here. 12, 12 best of threes. Let's go. Of course, we're going to get a little bit silly. Eh? I love getting a bit loopy yeah, at the one end another. of the cast. It is I crazy. Just hope like, the, other... the feeling at the I start or get... at the end. Right. Yeah, I hope. I hope your other combos get your other cast combos get yapped. I hope it happens to you, Wardy. <laughs> well, they, but they yep me. Yeah, I hope it, man. Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't care if they did. Sometimes it's just like will, that, you know. I will never forget talking about max packs for a good. And granted, I was yapping. I was talking a long time, but then <laughs> it went up to you. you the pause, the the famous warty pause. Then, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> that, that that one was brutal, though. Like I actually, you talked for about an eternity. And by the time we were done, I was like, I've got no idea what you said. <laughs> you lost me <laughs> two minutes ago. So I was just like, yeah. Oh sure. <laughs> that was a long ass day as well, man. That was that was tiring. That was a long day, man. It really <laughs> was. <laughs> and then you and then you're like, that's all you're gonna give me? <laughs> yeah, that is all I was gonna give you. <laughs> <laughs> uh alrighty, alrighty. So both these players, they get into a, a middle stage of the game here. So it was Phoenix Colossus. <clears throat> and and so far, the amount of robo units that have come out for DNS, it's, it's almost more than the gateway units at this point in time. He's, he's been very, very committed to very high-tech army. And the Phoenix, they've been trying to get done what they can. I do like Milky Cow's position overall. Like, he's 1-1 one, one upgrades. He's still waiting waiting on getting the ghosts out and whatnot. But going for the Ghost Academy before the armory always feels like a good choice uh, in my eyes. It's just... Or I say, I say that... <laughs> There is an armory, but getting the ghosts out before the uh, second tier of upgrades is a nice one, I think. It is what I tend to see a lot of the tip-top Terrans go for. 
and it, it is the style now, right? Like, it's just... Yeah. It, it just feels so good to have those EMPs. Like, what's better? An upgrade that does, like, plus one damage or an EMP that removes half the Protoss' health? Probably the Ghost. Like, you know, I think I can agree the EMP is pretty darn powerful. Um, so, yeah, but getting into those EMPs, I mean, it's just so useful as well because sometimes then you can actually target down units because you get the shields off them so quickly. You remove force fields or just energy. It's just so nice to have those available. So, yeah, prioritizing that is nice. I uh, mean, well... You see, I mean, so I already Ooh. see the expansion pattern looking funky here as well. Ho ho, Phoenix, you do not want to do that. Yeah, he's not going for that back one that's further away. And I, it is tricky. Like, this map isn't so linear as, as where to, where you want to be exactly. And getting a few Phoenix early on is a big deal. Like, those are your protection for your Colossus when you go for this kind of unit comp. And as that Viking count... Oh! Pick it off a ghost. Oh, he can't. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, oh, my it. goodness. That was that was a big committal. Big committal. Yeah, big committal. Didn't get that one, but uh, you know what? I like the idea of it, right? Getting rid of the ghost is huge. I mean, they're expensive. Still haven't started 2-2, by the way. At this point, I kind of did expect 2-2 to be starting from the Terran player, so kind of surprised that that has not happened. And Zabayo steps in. A couple zealots go down. Phoenix is going to go join up with everything else. And a few more barracks continue up as well. Um, I guess we are just kind of waiting for the players to really want to attack into one another, but it's going to take a little while. We now lose the Siege Tank. Nice save from Milky Cow, and the Phoenix is going to chase. We're now going to try and kill the Phoenix off. We successfully get rid of one. Yeah, that was a uh, nice little trade there for Milky Cow. Like, this is getting to a stage in the game that you're either ready for or you're not, you know? Like, Terran players, we've seen players like Clem that are really damn solid at it. They'll do all the juking and jiving against the Disruptors. Right now, the fact that he made that armory, kind of funny that he hasn't utilized it at all. Like, he's got a scary squad here. Let's let's count here. We've got... In fact, the Viking number's really low. He, he's totally banking on dealing with these Colossus in a, a, a different kind of way. The tanks, nicely placed on that low ground, getting some big shots from those Blink Stalkers over there. Yep. Well, I mean, the positioning is nice, and it kind of makes me intrigued to kind of see that this was the base of choice for DNS in the first place. Like... It feels like it's so abusable with tanks and so on. Like, okay, the Terran Committee can't move their whole army through, but it feels like they can get a lot of positions set up. Meanwhile, the attempted uh, prison play in the main base is going to be going down, but Milky Cow is also going to get to the upper right. He's going to get rid of that uh, location, and Ooh. that's going to be DNS kept on four bases. And I think this is the first time I've actually seen two players expand in this way against each other. Like, I've seen this expansion pattern from one player before, but usually the other guy goes the other way. But, uh, yeah, seeing them both expand like this is kind of funky. This is... Ooh. Oh, a decent disruptor hit to start things off. The second one, not quite, but Milky Cow going for the... Well, he was going to go for the sandwich there, but I, I didn't like the attempt. That was a lot... It's not that many Marauders in the mix just yet. So this this army, not able to withstand against the Colossus as well as it might like. But that base is a little bit open to this drop. There is a lot of Zealots running south here, and they're going to get shelled by these tanks on the low ground. DNS feeling like he's going to send it over here. Five tanks. That's a massive deal, though. And he has to be so careful. They're in such a little nook here. It's actually so hard. Like, not binding out those minerals, very difficult. I'm going to call that uh, Siege Tank siege tank Cranny or something, mate. That is a beautiful spot for the tanks just to camp in. As you are going to see the Bioforce coming around. Up the right side, another position they can try and take. I mean, we don't really reach many of the minerals there. Maybe, like, one corner. As the bio army is actually going to get cornered in, we're going to decide to fight this here as DNS. So he's going to come through. The disruptors get blasted oh initially, my. but then they do get some blasts off on the tanks. I mean, it's a combination of everything. People are dying on both sides of this war. Mate, that was a that was an absolute box art fight. That was and box art. If you're a Terran fan, not if you're a Protoss one. They those units got massively clumped up going down that ramp, and Milky Cow takes a massive victory over here in this fourth base of DNS. Milky Cow is just exploiting how vulnerable it is against a unit like a tank. Even the Warpin's dying. Somewhere out there, Drogo is saying... <laughs> so, do you remember that clip of Drogo, by the way, where one widow mine kills, like, four stalkers? <laughs> yeah, and he face bombs. <laughs> Dude, that's, like, one of my favorite clips of all time. And then he walks in two more. <laughs> and he dies to another widow mine. Oh, it's so fantastic. All right, DNS does hold. That's pretty amazing by him, honestly. <laughs> that Drogo clip was actually an all time clip. Didn't he like lose something to the same Widowmite and then he warped in four stalkers on top of it after? Like, it was just, it was so stupid. It was so good. 
No, I, so I remember it so vividly. Yeah, so he, he just he, lost he, two more after. Yeah, yeah, so he rapid fires yeah. in four stalkers and a widow mine goes off on them and because they're not full health, they're warping yeah. in, he loses all four. <laughs> so it's like, I lost four stalkers to one widow mine, you know? <laughs> and then then he then he walks in two more and another widow mine that he didn't see kills those and he just goes <laughs> It's a great clip. Oh my god, it's so good. Uh, amazing. Uh, DT is continuing to come around causing trouble, just trying to find ways to mineralize there's a warping into the Terran main base as well, so DNS keeping the action up over there. I'm not sure his main army in the middle of the map really has much justification to be out there. Like, it feels pretty bare bones right now. Um, but he doesn't go, like, running into a fight. He just takes a little bit of a position and looks to see what he can do. Yeah, this war prism has been really annoying. I wonder if this is, like, <laughs> the same one from earlier that's just not being cleaned up. Like, DNS, he's not playing like a guy that's got, you know, a 40 supply deficit right now. He's playing like he's in control of the game he's 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 in good shape but milky cow he's ready for this pounce and that army that main one does not look that scary from the protoss nope not really it's uh it, that, that's the thing like i'm looking at the army in the center i'm like surely you can't do anything with that but if it's just a threat to kind of keep you you know a few units over there so that the rest of this kind of drop play can work then i'm kind of okay with that because i think that's actually very smart from dns problem is the pr prism is gone Milky Cloud is closing in on, you know, maxing out, and I don't think there's any reason he's going to necessarily hold back, especially once Liberange is done. I think he's going to be very happy to start moving across the map. If not, Ooh. obviously before oh. then, gets that Disruptor as well. Nicely done, and again, this army can't stand up for itself at all. No, it really can't. Like, Milky Cow, he he's in control this game, isn't he? he? He really is, and he's got scans going on. There's a lot of DTs, though. They are yeah. a hit squad and a half, you know. They really are, and... Milky Cow, he, he's gunning for it. DNS, he pops a shield battery overcharge. It's in a good spot, but does get taken out pretty damn quickly. DTs are greeted by a PF in the bottom right, but those SCVs have to get on out of there. And Milky Cow is going to start winning out in this main fight over here. But tell you what, big losses on both sides. Yeah, he just needs a bit more bio, and I think he really does just keep pushing through. The Liberators work, but they're not always like exactly in position. Uh, obviously, this bio for uh, this DT force is going to be causing some distractions too. We get into another mineral line. Twenty SCVs have gone down. This orbital command is about to uh, burn to the uh, burn to the ground as well. The rest of the bio continues to hang about there, and we do have ourselves another base going down. Milky Cow is bleeding our bases right now. DNS is absolutely going to swing. He's supply? swinging the supply around. Yeah, I mean, no workers left for Milky Cow. A bunch of orbitals, yes, but I mean, DNS starts to deal with the big army. He does, he does, but I tell you what, what a swing of things, because I felt that Milky Cow is very much in control of this game, but that that little holiday squad of DTs over there, they went through all sorts of trouble to deal that damage, but they did it, and all of a sudden, you're talking about like 50 SCVs dying in a, a good minute. What a crazy turnaround this could be as DNS is uh, giving himself some hope again. I think Milky Cow needs to slow it down a second, right? Clean up the, you know, get some of his bases finished, get them relocated, get back on track. Problem is now Dian is attacking with a large army down the bottom right side. He's not going to find a new Oi. base here. He's going to find a building base. So get a cancel on that. It looks as though we're going to keep pushing through. Uh-oh, all those Liberators just on siege. Don't think DNS really saw it in time to jump on them. Uh, he could actually jump past the Liberation Zones and just get rid of a bunch oh, of them no. here for free. This is horrible for Milky Cow. He's losing so many libs. Young Siege is the ones that are going to die anyways. And now this base is in trouble. His bio army in the center has to pull back home. But, I mean, this Protoss army can just run. It really can. And, you know, there, there's, there's going to be Terrans in the chat that are like, God damn Protoss. And there's going to be Protosses in the chat that are like, man, this is beautiful. Like, <laughs> I tell you what, DNS has more than got himself back into this game. This was really, really good out of him. Proper clutch because Milky Cow is in all sorts of trouble, as my good friend Kevin would say. And how does he get back into it? I, I don't know, man, because DNS is just juking and jiving all over the shop and doesn't really want to take a direct engagement. I say that as, oh, okay, okay, does back off. Oh, thank you, DNS, for not making me look like a klutz. All right, right, Colossus in the mix here. Has to be a little bit careful because that Terran army does pack a punch. Yep. Because the shell's setting up, just going to be seeing the SCVs coming through as well, so we're trying to rebuild that economy. But DNS's army supply is back on track, man. So it is back on track and looking good. 
Now there's a couple more claws I pop in, and this army of milky cow is going to settle down again, sure, but DNS is right back in this game. He's up to six bases because he's taking the one on the left side now as well, so he is looking better than ever before. But I love this drop from milky cow. There's been no action up the left side into that main base, so this is a great time to just abuse something that's not been utilized at all, all game. And it could be the thing that maybe swings this back in his favor a little bit as well. No, I mean, <clears throat> DNS doesn't have a hell of a lot of supply to just warp in with, so he does respect it. That's a big recall, by the way. That is, is huge. And it's just Pretty as big. the main army of Milky Cow shows up. I mean, this is as good a moment forever for Milky Cow, and he is making the most of it. You know, like supplies again, neck and neck, drops over I back in. This. Milky Cow. What a move that is. Just relocates, abuses the pros, having to run one way or recall one way, then run back the other. Nothing to deal with Colossi, though, and that is four of them waiting to pounce on this army, and so the splash damage will add up. So now we're going to lift up. Now there's no recall. Oh. We could go boost towards the main base. Go, run, run, run. The Colossi go off the rocks. That's not going to help you. That's not going to do anything at all. Warp into the main, though, and that should be enough. The Stalkers, well, we're just oh. going to fly into it. Milky Cow has no fear. The empty Medivacs actually went down first, so he has potential to deal damage as he drops in. He will start a fight, and, well, DNS is only just now running the rest of the army back around to deal with this. There's so much time here for Milky Cow to abuse this. Oh, and it takes such a long time to get back to this base, doesn't it? Like, yeah. he has to blink over the wall, get back into the main, and, I mean, he is going to clean it up, but Milky Cow is a warrior over here, definitely making DNS work for it. And, I mean, this game's been very back and forth. Yep. Very back and forth. <laughs> Very back and forth, then. You, you yapped yep. me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to keep doing it, mate. I purposely do it. I'm now adding a couple seconds before I say it as well, just to keep you in pit when waiting. <laughs> you're terrible, Woody. You're uh, terrible. Yeah. All right, yep, you're riding. Yep, yep, yep. I'm terrible. Milky Cow set himself up here. I mean, this has actually been a really good game. Like, this has been... These guys are very nicely matched here. It has been a great game. Back and forth, swings, roundabouts... And honestly, right now, kind of anyone's for the takings. I think Milky Cow obviously has the lib set up, which is great. If you don't attack, if you attack away from the libs, I think DNS wins. The Colossi are just too strong, but the libs are really hard to attack into, so I don't see why DNS would do that. So I imagine and that's a Mil factor. Yeah, Milky Cow isn't making Vikings against Colossus either, which is kind of interesting, really, like, prioritizing getting the libs out. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've been there. The libs are just so good when they get plus two in the... Vikings, you feel like they're so flimsy against the Stalkers, but big fight happening. DNS just marching on in there, and yeah, those Colossus, man, there's not really much to deal with them besides Liberators being in the right positions, or a big flank, obviously. Yep. Well, I see a couple of Zelts heading up into the main base. We are going to have Colossi again, lasering away from afar. Another Liberator gets Siege. Bio tries to jump through. Stalkers, Colossi taking some shots right there. And we are going to have DNS still trying to find a direction. A couple of the Zelts is going to go through. He's going to go grab the bunker. Widowmines will play the cleanup on the defense. DNS looks to get into the front. And we are going to see a few Marines going down. Libs continuing to get set up. And that Nexus is about to finish from DNS. So that's going to be another base for him to work with. I think the setup from DNS is almost too good for Milky Cow to break through. It's really dependent on these Liberators, but he jumps on them before they're ready to go. The Colossi will laser down so much of the bio in the background, but the Liberators are shredding the Stalkers, but then the Zealots are there as well, and that's going to be good enough. It is good enough indeed for DNS, who takes game number one of this best of three. Great game. All, all he needed was a, uh, a, a DT run by, which did... <laughs> killed three PFs and 48 workers, you know, to get back into it. Just... Just the little things, you know, Wardy. Just the little things. Just the little things. We get ourselves hopping into game two here in just a second. So, second game coming up in a moment or so. Get this underway and we'll be able to go, go into our second map of this. Ghost River. Wow. They're all about the new maps here. That's cool. Yeah. I, I'm down for it, man. Like, the new maps have been pretty darn good. We've been seeing some pretty good games from them. So, excited to see another one uh, coming up right now as we kick off into... Uh, yeah, this is as soon as these guys are ready. Sorry, I lost track of things for a second, but yeah, we are all in the lobby, so we are going. And DNS looks to make himself, well, survive another round of this Swiss group stage, whereas Milky Cow looks to force us into a game three. As, uh, yeah, I mean, Milky Cow obviously made it difficult. I think Milky Cow absolutely had himself the advantage. But then DNS turned around those DTs, and that moment where he just kills 50 workers, God, what a turning point. Really was, like that, that 
well, obviously got DNS the win, I think, in this game. Like, because DNS was, I think, super dead. I really do. And I mean, I think most people would probably agree. Just not a lot was going right for him. And Milky Cow with all those positions, like the, the five tank army as well. It was actually the perfect army to have against such quick disruptors from DNS. Um, so a nice choice by him. And all those little nooks that he utilized as well just went about as good as it could. Uh, Spawning her in the top left, as our Red Protoss, it is DNS. Taking on our Blue Terran in the upper right hand side, it is Milky Cow. Um, one thing that in those chaotic situations, because it kind of wasn't, didn't feel like a super normal game, um, but having just a couple of Liberators on a PF can make the world a difference in those DT situations, right? Like, yeah, they just, just shoot them down so those quickly, extra right? shots off. Yeah, yeah I mean, or yeah, at least really make them pay. You know, because then at least you get rid of some DTs. It's actually a cost for the Protoss. You know, make them feel the risk. Yeah, make them make them pay, Wardy. Make them pay for their absolute troublemaking, invisible butts. Twitch chat is loving the yet one. They are? Yeah, everyone's just yapping. Yep. Okay, I, you know what? I might just make it my new catchphrase. I just, you know, I really agree with someone. Yep. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, it's not even your new catchphrase. You yet me all the you know, time. But you know what it is? I, I, you know, I don't do this to everyone, though. And it's, just, it's clearly just because I think you really just say a lot of what I want to say, which is not, not a bad oh. thing at all. Like, I, you know, sometimes you just really round out the, the point really well. So I'm just like, cool. It's not like when I'm casting with Roddy and he has no clue what he's on about. And I have to, you know, fix up what he's <laughs> saying, right? <laughs> yeah. There's like a, a TVT or a CVC or, you know, TVC. And it's like, Roddy, do you want to cast it? He's like, I don't freaking clue, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, Kevin. I'm kidding. All righty, all righty. I mean, I do say, uh, I do s tend to say a few words a lot, you know? Oh, oh I mean, you just summarize points when really you well. you reply then. with, this is where you reply with absolutely. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Hey, I love these movement. long days. Yeah, man. To be fair, I didn't yep you for the first, like, you know, half of the day, I think. It was really the later on. Me Maybe once. I think. No, no you def you've definitely no yeped me. There's no way. Oh, I refuse to believe it. 100%. 100%. 100%. Like, I'm just. W okay, do you know what I'm waiting for, Twitch chat? I'm waiting for. Any of you guys remember that montage that somebody made of. I think it was JP and Day9, where they casted together. And JP was a little bit of a fanboy of Day Nine. <laughs> I think he said Sean. Like he said his name Sean. Like I think no lie, it was like two hundred times in the space of like ten minutes or something. Like it was every sentence he would end, it would be like Sean. And somebody made a little montage and put it all together. I think somebody should get you yepping. You know, you, a yep there's montage. So freaking many. Yeah, okay. I'm down. It's gonna make a montage. <laughs> Cyclones and a medevac. Milky Cow wants to get a bit aggressive, Ben. Mmm. Uh, he... <laughs> mm. Did I yep you? No, you mmm oh, me. I, 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 I yoded you, yeah. <laughs> yoded <laughs> me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what can I say? What can I say, man? These, th these things happen. These things happen. All good, mate. Uh, yeah, but this is obviously a fun opening because you're going to try and put in some pressure. It's against that Stargate as well. So I always feel like, you know, we talked about this earlier. Cyclones, Marines, always good when a Stargate is up. We're actually going to lock onto this Ooh. Oracle. We're actually going to stay locked onto this Oracle. We're going to kill it. Huge opening for Milky Cow in the start of this game. And now he's free to go across the map with everything. That is actually huge. Because, like, Cyclones, it's, it's not a unit that you really want against Protoss unless they're going for Stargate. But... He has timed it so nicely, and maybe he's got a little bit of a read on DNS. Maybe he knows far more about it than I do. Um, but yeah, Cyclones against this. This is awesome. Yep. Well, we have ourselves the Marines and the Cyclones. See, okay, I said yep there. Now I'm like second guessing myself because that was just my way to transition because I'm ready to talk. Oh my god. Hellions in the main base, so it is going to be disaster across the board for DNS. Milky Cow sets this up beautifully. He's going to get a good few pros before those Phoenix play cleanup and. Now, this really is nice. He's going to get six workers here. Still pressuring at the front as well. You know, the front can't really do much. The Adepts try and come forward. They get locked onto. They'll get pushed back. More Cyclones. And that makes it very difficult for the Phoenix to really be the answer to this. Super Battery pops up. 
But yeah, we can just fight the gateway and just kill that off. Get rid of production. That kind of works out as well. The Viking lands actually allows it to be saved by the Medivac. Cute micro by Milky Cow. Love it. It is. It is really nice. But whether he gets away with this or not, because, I mean, that is still a scary Protoss army that he has to deal with. I think he was looking for more. But you're right. He did micro very nicely. Very nice micro. And it just allows him to just maintain an extra unit or two. Now we fall back. Milky Cow will be back onto a couple more barracks production. The engineering bays are coming up as well. Cyclones will be there to push the Phoenix away. So, again, that's the benefit of having kept the Cyclones alive throughout this. And now DNS gets to put the third base down. But this feels like later than he would have wanted to. Is on the way to that Robo Bay to try and stay tacked up. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, by the way, the liberator choice here from Milky Cow, that's that's wild, man. Like, he is against Phoenix, of all things, and it's like he wants to sneak out a liberator to get across the map and slow things down. If he gets away with it, that could absolutely do a good job of that, but definitely a risky play, especially given that he's 0-1 down, and yeah. Well, <clears throat> with the 1-1 uh, coming through. Oh, did you stop yourself? No, I was actually just thinking about what to say. This time we didn't yet. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> this is just going to be like a psychoanalysis every time I say it. It's like, wait, what are you about to say? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, like, I felt it, man. I felt it. You felt it? You just feel it all the time now. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. that's bad. Oh, I was going to go for absolutely again. Absolutely. Freaking A. I'm, I'm done. Well, Stimpak is about to be uh, finished here from Milky Cow. Just knocked down a Phoenix. Honestly, still a pretty scary army to push with until, I guess, a Colossus pops out. Colossus is a pretty good stopping point on this. So that is definitely one the thing we can for Milky Cow. Yeah, the problem for Milky Cow is the fact that he's got Stim for, like, 10 bio units. Like, it's not enough. Like, I really think a lot of this build, he wanted more to happen earlier on. And he's feeling the pressure a lot. Like, that's a healthy number of Cyclones, but... It'll do good with the first lock on. The Swisheroos are obviously a little bit problematic, but DNS, I think he's getting himself into a situation that he really, really likes, you know? I do think he's very happy with where he is at as long as he can keep on defending. And it's definitely getting there. The Phoenix is going to come across this. Medivac doesn't do anything. Whoa, it takes a weird turn, which means that it stays in the base. Just didn't think he could get it away from the Phoenix, so that just goes down. It's a little bonus pickup then from DNS. And Milligan is absolutely losing any kind of momentum he might have gained off the early push, so... As external thermal land starts up, DNS is able to kind of get those colossi into a better position. And yeah, I, I, I am a real, I'm with you. I think he is absolutely going to be feeling this as even this Liberator gets chased down by the Phoenix. Nice to get rid of that potential future harassment. It really has, is. And like the Phoenix, they're where they want to be. They don't want to be on the defense necessarily, like shutting down Liberators and Medivac players all well and good. Oh, that's not where they want to be though. Those Cyclones all doing their job this game of just making these phoenix really work for it but dns he's probably thinking about a fourth base kind of soon he's getting good upgrades online and that is a gateway explosion if i've ever seen one he's on two gates currently going up to nine very soon it is interesting because as you mentioned the fourth base we, we talked about this a lot yesterday i think where the fourth base is away from the opponent so it's actually getting to the point where it's now safer to expand than the third base was so you put that down, and again, with the army getting the tech up, the Phoenix Colossus combination in general, I think DNS across the board is extremely safe. So it's very hard for Milky Cow to push through and be aggressive. And Milky Cow is a player. He really loves to just play lots of bio, lots of drops, like action everywhere, and, and just be aggressive. And I feel like he's already going to be forced into that later stage again, which is kind of what happened last game, right? He ended up in that later stage, and while he played a good game, I don't think it's where he's most comfortable, and that might be part of the reason why DNS was able to find so much damage and find a way back into a game that was looking so brutal for him otherwise. Uh, definitely. Definitely. I, I, th This game, it's starting to get to a point where I think both of them are where they don't mind being. Like, Milky Cow does have that inner spirit where he can kind of dr draw it out a little bit, but... DNS, he's got five Phoenix on the map, he's got vision everywhere, he's on double forge, getting the second Robo as well. Uh, there are big upgrades coming online for Milky Cow, like he did it in the opposite way to what we see Clem, went for the Armory first and then the Ghost Academy afterwards. Yeah. But it will allow him to get a good number of Vikings and Sea Shanks on the field early. And this is what we're seeing from a lot of Terrans these days, where they really hunker on down on the tank count and 
against a lot of what DNS has, especially with these early disruptor switches coming online, it's not bad against that at all. The disruptors will be such a cool way to obviously kind of just have that extra splash ready for the entire Protoss. But of course, we, uh, I, I was about to say, I was like, of course, we kind of need to see the later game setup in general, right? And that's going to be the Dark Shrine as well as the Harass setting up from DNS, two disruptors at a time, upgrades finishing. I, I like everything that's on the way from our Protoss player. Fifth base as well, just before Milky Cow starts to get into his fourth. I love that Milky Cow's floating one CC over, but he's already building another CC next to where this fourth will be. So he's ready to stack up the bases. And ooh, DNS a little bit caught up in the game. Gets a second Dark Shrine as well, unfortunately. That is a little bit unfortunate. And I mean, it happens to the best of us, you know. Uh, it does. It's Granted, it's not the most expensive thing in the world, but it just shows you that they're focused, they're hyper-focused, and it's like, I need a Dark Shrine now, and you think about it once, you think about it 10 seconds later as well, you just kind of forget that you just did it, because there's so much going on in StarCraft 2, it's so damn quick. Yeah, it's very easy, like, your, your brain just kind Ooh. of flicks back to this idea, like, you're not sure, because you're right, so much is going on, there's a lot to look at, you do a lot of things very quickly, it's super easy to forget. As so many CCs. Milky Cow is not afraid just to drop the bases and just send this, is he? Like, to the later game. He's he's very ready just to say, yeah, I'm going to have all the bases in the world. I have loads of mules. And you guys are going to meet him there this time. Sleep Beacon, Stargates. I love the choice because what Milky Cow is doing, I think, is best dealt with by just sitting back as the Protoss. I think so. I think you're absolutely right here. And the Phoenix, I can't believe he's gunning in this deep, though. I mean, this is very much in Milky Cow territory, and Loses a lot of his units here. Loses all those Phoenix. Granted, their usefulness was definitely going to be less. This is very much a little gorilla hit squad down here as well. No medevacs to keep it alive for a long time. Um, so a, a simple warping or a recall should be able to deal with that quite nicely. Bring those units back home and just use that to defend. And spot on from DNS, like I said, at this point... Don't give Milky Cow options or opportunities, although this is kind of going to be one of those, right? He is moving through the center of the map. And as he comes across, looks as though he's going to actually pull back down to the bottom and just clean up these zealots. DNS stops the carriers. This is the point at which he's weakest. He's built a fleet beacon, two more stargates. He's built the carriers, but they're not here yet. And even two carriers in super scary. This is absolutely the time for Milky Cow to go if he wants to do something pre-carriers. The problem is I don't think Milky Cow has the supply to go pre-carriers, and that means that he might be forced into this even later stage of the game. That's why I think DNS is going to find even more of a comfort zone as DNS is the one chasing through here. He's chasing his opponent down. I mean, again, go a certain amount, but maybe don't go too far. I'm, I'm scared he's going to, like, dive in, and it's just going to go completely wrong for him when it's looking so good for him back at home. Milky Cow just isn't afraid of late game, man. Like, you, you can really tell by the way that he plays. It's it's not like he thinks he's on a clock at any point. He's just all about, okay, maneuver on up, get everything I need, get the upgrades going, multiple CCs and stuff. But I'm, I'm thinking right now, is he going to get caught totally off guard by this carrier switch? And DNS is proper gearing up for it as well. Like, if you're clicking these Protoss units, you get to see, like, Oh, he's at 3-2? No way has he been investing other stuff as well, right? I actually wouldn't reveal these carriers just yet, but he, he's going to do it. He's going to do it. I think he should hold until, like, four. At least four. I think two carriers just don't do that much, and the, the bigger a warning you give your opponent about them, the better a time they're going to have than they really should. And these zealots don't quite catch those ghosts. It's a good save from Milky Cow with the movement there. As we'll see zealots don't charge up, and they actually will get into the main base and the natural mineral lines, so... Again, DNS able to cause trouble, able to cause chaos across the course of this. Uh oh, so even gonna get, uh, over there. Oh, that's rough. I was gonna say, Zelda's got the missile turret too, so opens up prison planes to that main again. Oh, these Zelda's are just going huge on the natural, non stop. They really are. And there was a scan in the center somewhere, but I think it just missed those carriers, which was definitely crucial for DNS. And DNS, he's on double cybernetic score right now as well, Wardy. Like, that's huge for getting these upgrades out very big upgrades now he knows and now it's like oh dear i need vikings moving that factory on over for another starport i'm not surprised with that one yeah more starports i mean at this point you want vikings even libs to some extent because you can actually leave the libs in siege sometimes and actually use them to fight off the interceptors can be quite effective at times so opportunities possibilities we do have milky car very ready to fight there and that was not a, a tango dns wanted to be a part of so just gets shot back, loses a unit two in the process. We're rich enough to afford that. 
Doesn't know the disruptor shot flies through. GNS with every base on his side of the map. Resources are lost currently they even. And that's important to keep track of, because this is not the kind of map where one player is typically going to mine bases, the other guy doesn't. Because it's mm. pretty easy to hold all of the bases on your half of the map. Yeah, it really is. Like, it's 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 a super symmetrical map here. There's, there's only a certain amount of bases to go. DNS has literally got all the bases he can. Now we can pump everything into just more infrastructure, all about units. And these DTs start to make magic happen as well on the other side of the map, just being a real pesk. And the army as these carriers keep on mounting up and it's just been two at a time but we're, we're starting to get to a point where we're at eight now wardy and that is very problematic it's just a very difficult army to fight against as milky cow and dns is obviously just sitting back on some of his side defense pops the super battery here is now going to start moving forwards Lipper is going to be under fire colossi shooting up like it's, like you mentioned those interceptors are going to be flying through with eight carriers there's so much potential there's the libs, though, and that's the splash damage on the interceptors that can help clean them out nice and quickly. And you can see those numbers dropping. DNS has to pull back away from that. Problem is for Milky Cow, so much of this fight was already very good for DNS. I wouldn't say that this was overall a failure. Having to fall back to rebuild interceptors is really a very okay thing to be doing. Yeah, they're cheap, right? They're like, what, 15 minerals a pop? And the only thing that you have to worry about when you have the carriers is the time to rebuild the interceptors. And he, he's getting, look at these upgrades he's getting. We're, we're, we're talking about big tier three Protoss upgrades and even getting tectonic stabilizers, going for level two Protoss shields as well. He's cooking, man. He is cooking. It's not as if Milky Cow's been lacking though. Air upgrade's about to get to plus three weapons, plus one armor on the go as well. Actually very important. Um, it's just going to be very difficult for him to take a good fight against this. Like, these these interceptors, these carriers are wild. Yeah, uh, they are just going to go straight through, and they are going to grab themselves a whole bunch of those libs, and they are, I mean, okay, interceptor count depleted once again, but there's not enough for Milky Cow to go chase that down and to punish that. So, like you said, you know, the problem with the interceptors is the time needed to build them. And DNS, because he's taking these fights on his own terms, is able to find that time. <laughs> Okay, now we're just going to get a battery farm on the bottom side so we can basically camp out and push into this forward base of Milky Cow, which is very smart, right? Because that actually really allows you to dominate this base location. And that is one way in which Milky Cow may not be able to actually mine from every base on the map, although that's a new coming down as well. I'm going to tell you what, DNS is just jumping into this. He's going straight through. Interceptors are flying. A nuke might land, but it would only be on side defense at this point as we've got stuff st flying up in the skies. The nuke is indeed going to drop down. It kills a cannon. And, uh, well... DNS is already winning this fight on top of the high ground and knocking down this planetary fortress. Yeah, B DNS is the big kid on the playground, man. Look at his bank as well. Like, we haven't really touched up on that, have we? 4K, 3K, Milky Cow struggling to even keep this base alive. <laughs> and there's there's not that many interceptors still rocking, but there's more than enough. The Liberators have been really good against them, to yeah. be fair, haven't they? The Libs have actually been huge. They've been so successful. They've been able to knock down so many. And it's the only reason why, really, this army's getting pushed back again. Milky Cow cannot afford to rebuild everything that he realistically needs to, though. And I think that is going to be the trouble he ends up on. As uh, four Libs, a couple of Vikings, the Bioforce still coming through for Milky Cow. But he's just not going to have the bulk on the ground that he needs anymore, I don't think, to actually keep on taking fights. So, unfortunately, I think we're going to end up in trouble as... Stalkers and carriers will continue through. Disruptor shot goes down on the ramp there. We are going to have this army still trying to come about. A couple more libs getting sieged for the moment. DNS is just getting further and deeper every single time he takes a fight. He's making more and more progress on the map, and that is a big deal at this stage. It really is. He's got money to burn through. He's got big upgrades. He's, it's a very mobile army as well. And these liberators, look. He, he, like, what do you do with them? He, he's... They are yeah. doing so much damage to these interceptors. It's it's really cool to see, um, but it's just everything else he has to worry about at the same time. And DTs again, GG DNS. Tell you what, that was a fun TVP between them. They played a hell of a series. Um, Milky Cow. I feel like in this game, Milky Cow never really got back in it. You know, like he had that aggression. It seemed like DNS got set up from there. And it felt like from forever more than DNS was just kind of set up and good to go. But Milky Cow absolutely had some fights where he survived through. And we saw the carriers obviously not, you know, immediately kind of ending the game, which oftentimes they can do when they show up. He was very, you know, Milky Cow very sure that he wanted to utilize those uh, liberators against them, which obviously really worked out well. We said it multiple times that those libs were such a big deal. So, uh, GG's. Uh, 
sad that Milky Cow drops out. I mean, I know we've got to lose some players, but you can see he's got heart in his play, right? And he's not afraid of playing later game, even though he used to be such a kind of drop only, like stuck in the mid game Terran. Really cool to see that uh, progress from him. I just really want one of these seasons to be his season, man, just to have a bit of a better result in these regionals. As we do have one result left to conclude today for Jumi battling against Geralt. It's one more PvP to round us out on Europe. We'll be back with that in a few minutes to be the final match.
ESL StarCraft II Masters is brought to you in part by Monster Energy and the United States Air Force. Welcome back, everybody. One last time a day. Oh, I was so excited uh, doing something. I forgot to press the button in time. My bad. It's Wardy. It's Demu. It's for Jumi versus Geral PvP to wrap us up and to send one final player home and one final player into Swiss round four here in the European region. Yeah, this is... Uh... This is... I didn't expect Gerald to be here at 0-2, man. I, I really didn't. And of the players that he lost to, like 0-2 to a laser, you know, I, I did class to a laser there, but 1-2 against Spats, a little bit of a surprise. I do think Spats is pretty solid overall, but still, Gerald is a guy that... He, he's had like a miracle run into top 8 kind of thing for him in this region. Um, I, th I think he beat Lambo when he did that. I can't I can't remember for the life of me, but still, so, yeah. uh, a player that I didn't expect to see here. So spawning in the top left here of Ghost River, it is the blue toss, it is Gerald. On the top right, he had a heartbreaker game against Wayne the other day. Felt like he won it, and then he just attacked a little bit too soon into Mass Hydra. It is for Jumi, looking to get himself a win on the board. Yeah, for Jumi's route hasn't been easy either. Like... I'd, is this going to be a cannon rush, you reckon? Okay. Oh, double gate. Oh. This is a very Forjumi kind of play, man. Like, he loves to play super aggressive. Two gate forge. Okay, oh. this map is... Okay, well, that's immediately scouted from Geralt. That's huge. This map has a very good <laughs> cannon position, by the way, because you can hit the gas from the low ground. So that's why mm. it's uh, probably the choice for Forjumi. But this is going to be immediately a forge going down for Geralt. And... This should be a pretty good ride for him because he can basically deny high ground vision by just walling the probe out. So the probe will have to sit in range of a cannon to get high ground vision, which is not sustainable. And that should mm. just mean that I guess in the end that Geralt should be okay. I like the fire that he was bringing, honestly, but Gerald scouted that beyond fast, didn't he? Like, didn't yeah. even get a chance to really breathe. And, oh, rough, rough start for Vajumi. He's going to have a few cannons on the low ground. How do you follow this one up? <laughs> um, well, I mean, you can still give it a go. I think the full wall is a problem, though. Like, if you have something in the main, you can cause chaos and trouble, but the fact that it's a full wall already, I just don't see what you can really do to cause trouble with. Uh, for Jimmy's first two Zelds are going to show up. I mean, Garrod has two cannons of his own. I actually don't know what you do if this gets uh, scouted. Oh, and the cannon isn't in range, and... Cancels one of the cannons. I think that's a good call by Fujumi. Gerald leaving both of them up, realizing that economically he's going to be ahead. And, oh, oh that's... Yeah, this is not yeah. what you want, is it? Counter proxy Stargate, probably. I think that's I think that's the play. I yeah. think that's the play here. Like, just, just to talk about how bad this is for Fujumi right now, his, he hasn't mined a single gas. Like, no matter what he does from this point, it's going to be a really hard game to win, no matter what. Yep. Oh, I, uh, I mean, this is just going to be absolutely difficult. No, I mean, I go say, yeah, because what, what do you want me to say? Like, oh, actually, Ben, I disagree. I think for Jimmy's got a great chance. He's going to spot this proxy Stargate, and yeah, now he's winning. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I think he's dead. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> You're going to be paranoid about it now, aren't yes, you? Yes, I like, am. This is kind of so, I, I, so to be fair, To be fair, I have said it, but like, sometimes, like, in this case, you just literally said something. It's like, well, wow, I just agree. <laughs> I'm, I'm tired, so I haven't well, thought of a better word to say than I agree, Ben. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'll be more proper no, I, next time. No, I love it. I love it just the way you are, Wardy. This is, <laughs> this is fantastic. Pain. I did oh, so well I in mean... the last series, too. I stopped doing it. <laughs> Oh, this is this is horrible. Yeah, it sucks. I'm gonna yeah, recall your stalker home. <laughs> oh, uh, did he did he shoot his own adept a little bit there? Still, this is oh hasn't lined up the attacks. I tell you what. Okay. Uh, I, I, I there's not much to say, is there? Like, it's one of those things. For Jumi's looking like he's in terrible shape here. Terrible. He's. He actually kills his gateway before he lets the Stalker finish, uh, which is interesting. Yeah, I think he's very eager to go and deny the pylon and the power to these gateways. Um, although yeah. that would probably be more sense if he then actually turned around and went back to it. But I guess he does want to win that fight as well. I mean, he should be fine either way. Just the moment you deny those gateways, you deny pretty much all of the uh, DPS available. So I think that goes a long way too. There's a couple of Stalkers. 
continue to come about. We are going to be seeing that one Stalker taking a few more shots. We go back and forth. The Zealot is going to be very low. It goes down. Turn back onto the Stalker, but I think we're actually going to be okay. Garrett is going to win that micro ball. And he's just, he's like, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> you, got, you got a couple of gateways there. You got a forge. Yeah, here's my Nexus, oh, bro. No. <laughs> the oh, no, stalk. there's a Stalker behind. He's stuck. Oh, no. Poor guy. Yeah. No, that's not ideal. Is he going to try and force field him out of there, do you reckon? Uh, I think plop he's just going to... Plop him on over. Well, I thought he, he's got a Robo, so I thought maybe he'd get a Prism and eventually he'd free them with the Prism. That's, that's true, that's probably true. Probably the plan, but Geralt's going to have Blink very soon, by the way, and that's obviously going to be a huge advantage. Yeah, the Immortal's obviously pretty powerful, but having Blink is extremely powerful. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, he can kill that Forge. Oh, that works too. I think he... Yeah, he can get out of there. Like, why, why do you need cannons at this point, to be to be fair? Like, are you going to start grading your plus one on that? No, doubt it. No, I mean, it's hard to move these ramp with the cannons, though. Ooh! Yeah, That okay. caught Fajumi very off guard. Yep. I mean, even with the, the force field, it doesn't matter if there's blink available, right? So at the end of the day, I guess there wasn't much you could do here. Anyways, two adepts do get by, but we're going to clean those out, and then Fajumi is in a whole world of trouble. I mean, he's going to have an immortal. So that's kind of about it. Yeah, this is this is definitely one of those games that you just kind of, if you're a Fujimi fan, and I'm, I'm sure he has a bunch, you just a bit a bit sad, you know, a bit sad. It's he's given an impossible task from this point on. Like this is this is not one of those mirrors where it's like oh, I see I see some light at the end of the tunnel. No, no, that tunnel is blacked out, mate. But we'll we'll, we'll see. He's got. So far, he's got one Robo for production, one Gateway as well. He's getting his own Twilight Council online, but... I, I don't know. He's going to go for the panel and the powers of the Robo. He's going to deny the second Immortal. That is... Um, yeah, that's not exactly great. As now he can blink on this other Immortal. Super Battery, though. No, come on. It's, it's healing the freaking Robo so the Immortal dies. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, maybe we can... Oh, no, never mind. Uh, he's going to go after the other pylon, by the way, which isn't finished building, so you can't repair it. But he does get the Immortal out. That's how close it was. The Robo was up for like 0.1 of a second, and it was enough to get the Immortal out anyways. Carol clearly has enough right now. The battery's out of energy. Super battery is gone. This Immortal will die, and so will Fujimi's dreams in game number one. Yeah, Fujimi's a fighter, man. Probes are being pulled. He's here getting a dark shine down here in the south. Oh, yeah. GG. That was... Everything that could go wrong kind of went wrong, right? It was just it's just one of those uh, games you want to forget about. You hope people forge. also forget about it. <laughs> two gate forge immediately scouted. Yeah. Kind of how it goes. I mean, at least he cancelled the proxy stargate. So he didn't die to the void ray. That is true. you got to take the positive sometimes, you know? You certainly do. You certainly do. Second map will be Oceanborn between these two players, so a far more normal map. And oh, I mean, I, I did have Gerald as the favorite going into this, just because I do feel that him being zero two, being in this position in the first place is weird. You know what I mean? Yep. I think uh, it could be like uh, I could imagine more so like Gerald being like one one at this stage, like two zero with good opponents maybe, but zero two is brutal. I think you said it right. I think him losing to Spats is kind of the surprise. Um, mm -hmm. You know, playing against the laser, that's always going to be tough. But Spats is, I think, a beatable opponent. I think it's very fair to say for Geralt. So. And it was a yeah. two-game series as well. Caught up in PvP. It happens. Yeah, and the thing is, I, I that is not because I think Spats is bad. I actually think Spats is pretty good. Pretty underrated, actually. It's just that I think Geralt is... He, he is a guy that he's going for top 12 this season, you know? Like, anything less would be a little bit of a surprise for him, I think, as, as far as he rates himself. But Fujimi gets a little bit of a pause going on here, start of this game. Okay, looks as though we're good. I, I, he didn't start a probe immediately. I guess that's because he was literally busy pausing. Uh, I'm not sure what the issue was, but we'll get in. Well, I'm sure he'll start his probe. And we can actually get to the introductions, Mapu's favorite part of the day. As in the top left-hand corner, it is going to be the blue Protoss player. Up on to zero, Geralt. And spawning over in the bottom right-hand side as our red Protoss for Jumir. 
I was also thinking about the Euthermal Lambro situation yesterday, where I was like, oh, like, Euthermal not with one like, thanks bro, or anything like that. And then I <laughs> thought about my my dear friend Wardy, friend of Euthermal, you know? Yeah. Give the man a keyboard, like, just to try out. Doesn't doesn't say anything, doesn't say like, hey, when do you want this Batman? Or like, hey, could you want... And I was like, my, my boy Wardy, this, this I'm, northerner. I'm in the wrong country, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I planned this for you. You know, I haven't, I haven't, haven't seen you since you gave me the keyboard. That's true. That's true. Anyhow, anyhow, <laughs> double gate. Both these guys. This is such a such a cool out. What the hell? It was a little. <laughs> I'm gonna wrap it up you know, for you in gift wrap just to make sure you're offended when you get it back. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with, with like a chocolate underneath yeah, or something. Yeah. You know, like yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna replace a couple of the keycaps with just chocolate so you can. A little, little chocolatey surprise. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I was just, I was just doing my friend with like, you know, limp wrists a favor, <laughs> helping him out a little bit. For sure, Ben. I'll, uh, you know, don't worry. I'm taking good care of it until you show up at an event again. That's good. That's good. Hopefully soon. Hopefully soon, Wardy. We'll hopefully. be at events together. You know, hopefully. Alrighty, alrighty. This game, so far, not as much of a uh, train wreck for Fajuma, you know? Like, <laughs> it's not as if he went for a uh, cannon rush and got scouted immediately. It's going for a kind of fake proxy uh, location there on the easterly side of the map. And I think the other probe that he has is just for scouting, eh? Yeah, it would seem so, right? You just have one of these probes <laughs> laughing. I'm just thinking. <laughs> I don't know why. Clearly with you, I just say like, yeah, a lot while I think. Like, you know, maybe it's the British in me. Like, you know, you bring it out a bit. I have no idea. But um, yes, I imagine the other probe is in fact just for scouting so that you can just scout as much as possible all around the map and make sure you're not in trouble. I think it is something where you hear somebody that's speaking like, you know, people that you're familiar yeah. with. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and you fall back into certain patterns that, uh -huh. like when you when you're on a broadcast and you have these sentences that you fall back to quite naturally, and it's like, oh, it's a mate, right? I'm just talking with a mate, and it's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, yep, you're not wrong. Everything just goes out the window, but especially also, you know, you're on cast for like ten hours, and it's like the twelfth best of three of the day. It's uh, uh it starts, starts to get you a little bit, I suppose. Oh. This is 24 hours of you, Wardy. 24 hours of me? In the past yeah, two days? Yeah, like the last two days. Yeah. yeah. That's a lot of Wardy in my life. That's a lot of Wardy. A lot of Ben on my side. It's okay, though. It's been fun. As we got a PvP to wrap it all up. And we're back next week as well. How great is that? I think my next day is with you again. So it's like, basically, I, I disappear for a bit. When I come back, boom, straight back to the good stuff. <laughs> that's like one of those moments where you contact like the people that hired us and you're like what are you doing to me <laughs> put me with ben every time jeez louise jeez louise i know he's uh <laughs> they really just like put me with you all the time actually you know it's kind of weird because i looked at it and it's like i cast with you like three times i cast with Jake three times and that's like half my days <laughs> i cast oh, with i mean that's a lot oh no I, I guess i did uh loco and cats one day each already yeah, I get like okay. one day with Loco, one day with Cats, one day with Roddy, one day with ZG, and then I get three days with you and three days with Pig. Sandwiched in between it all. Yeah. I'll tell you what, for Jimmy, he's, he's been a bit spicy this game. It's a Dark Shrine on the go with Blink. Now, his heart probably sank a little bit upon getting into this base and seeing that there is a Roro facility on the go. But, but that does not mean that the DTs can't deal damage, because we all know how good they can be, especially today, like... The DTs have been great today as, uh, for Jimmy though. And again, force field on that ramp is not too pretty of a time. Let's see if the Dark Shrine can pop up and make a difference. We do have an OBS coming in. Obviously, it's going to be about the positioning, where the army is at, to actually help shoot the DTs down as well. Actually, chase forward here, that's Sentry, because it turns around, it's going to go down. So another loss for for Jimmy in this skirmish. DT's warp on the left-hand side, but I mean, Garrett's pulling back to the natural. The OBS is moving. I think the OBS is likely to see the DT's as they move in at this rate, so... Oh, yeah, this it's is gonna like be perfect. 
the uh, most unfortunate timing. Unless Gerald, he, he did, he did. He, he did. He's, he, oh, he just didn't yeah, pull the obs back straight away. Yeah, he was a bit like, whoa, 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 whoa. but luckily, because that could have spelled absolute disaster. I think it was one of those where you kind of might see the minimap a little bit in your peripheral vision, but but Jimmy will try and get a cancel here on that Nexus, and that could be the start of getting something done. Recall early but not quite early enough and doesn't get the cancel either and this dt oh this all just went topsy-turvy didn't it <laughs> it did indeed yeah it's uh it did not go the way that uh but jimmy wanted to at all good ideas right hit the right run the dt in the left but garrett was just on top of it absolutely pristine defense all said and done though but jimmy does have a worker lead on the back of this he has nine workers up uh, obviously, Geralt has an army lead, but if Jimmy can stay on the map, maybe he buys himself enough time without taking a straight-up fight where the worker lead has a bit more of an impact. He's going to catch a couple stalkers here, so that's one way to get rid of the uh, disadvantage, but now he gets blinked on by everything else. Geralt is somehow going to come out of this ahead, and that is going to be beautiful. Oh, that blink just saves that one low HP stalker. Yeah, it's real clutch, and, you know, the DTs this game, they, they really were not worth it. Like, they didn't get anything done... Centuries deal quite a bit more damage now. Gerald isn't necessarily like steamrolling this game, even though a lot of things have gone bad for Fujumi. One thing that he's done very well is Chrono Boost out a lot of probes. So economically, it's not that bad for him. I'm just worried. I, I am, because Gerald so far has been showing a lot of confidence in these fights. And it does feel like a lot of the fights for Jumi's just been a little bit on the back foot. And now. He is outnumbered uh, before things even begin here. Yeah, the army supply is the big issue, and I just don't think we've had enough time to let the probe uh, advantage sink in, obviously. Uh, taking, taking a fourth. I'm very surprised yeah. that he's that gung-ho about it, but, I mean, if he can stabilize against this, then he's going to be in good shape, obviously. It, nice blink micro. I think this is actually one of the better case scenarios for Fajumi. Geralt went down the ramp. He puts a lot of damage on the fourth, but doesn't get the four. He just lost his observer, so DT warping. Oh, play the natural. Now. The natural oh. of Fajumi. Something else is happening. So there were adepts going in there, killing a lot of workers at the same time. So Gerald doing a few things at once here. Castles this fourth base. He's got double the amount of stalkers now in the field. Yes, he does. We have ourselves at fourth base coming down from Geralt. So he does get the cancel. He does get a bunch of probes. That uh, does the work a lead. He maintains an army lead. And, well, I guess at this point, it's really the the DT advantage, basically, from Fujumi. Can he get those DTs to actually start doing something, actually start finding some damage? Has not been able to thus far. No, definitely. War Prism coming online for both these guys. Usually a big indicator that you want to deal some aggression some damage on the map but for Vajumi, that's a bunch of dts that is very very expensive cargo over there and gerald he doesn't need to use anything like that they're both on 10 gateways apiece both putting down their bases their fourth base gerald with a good number of obs set up as well yeah vision everywhere obviously ability to kind of deal with this oh that's gonna be good he's gonna kind of get a bit of a base trade but Geralt just has more to base trade with, which obviously is a good start. He's actually going to go into the main base. He's looking to shut down production immediately. Oh, I love that play. I mean, he's straight in there, so he is actually going to stop a lot of these gateways, and that's actually painful. That's so much warping potential. Meanwhile, you can obviously still warp in on the other side. Fujumi does catch the Immortal there. He is going to lose a lot of the Stalkers, however. The DTs show up. Another Observer Corona Booster now. The detection will be here in a moment, so we will be able to deal with these DTs. The Super Battery bought us a little bit of time. And the extra warp in as Geralt is able to deal with this so far. Now he loses the Robo. He loses the Observer. He has one Observer left in the game. Obviously, DTs are the play from Fujumi from here. He's hoping that he's killed the last Obs. Obviously, he doesn't know that there's one more. But Geralt really needs to now babysit that Observer. He cannot let that go down. That would be disastrous for him. But now he's going to be okay. And he's killed 41 pros. He actually sees his opponent's Obs. He's going to get the kill. And that was the last Obs of Fujumi as well. Ah, oh, brutal, man. And look how many stalkers he has on the other side of the map. I think it was real clutch by Gerald just going for the main base like he did. The reinforcements dealt with that third. He, he's still dealing damage over here as well. And granted, there isn't an observer to deal with these DTs. But as long as they have blink, as long as Gerald stabilizes behind all this, he's cooking. Cooking up. Oh, beautiful. Little 2-0 for himself. DTs are having some fun because we are missing the obs, but it's just not going to be enough. And Fujumi recognizes it, sees it. 
and accepts it. GG is called, and Geralt is the victor 2-0 on the final matchup here today, and he will stay alive. Unfortunately, that is going to be the end of Fordumi's campaign this season. So, uh, good try. But uh, I, mean, I think it's a rough opponent to meet at 0-2, because we said it. We don't think Geralt should necessarily be down here. So it's just a tough one for Fujimi to meet. Yeah, I mean, of all the people that were 0-2, like, I mean, DNS is a veteran as well. But Fujimi running into, like, a Gerald DNS or a Milky Cow, that was a real rough one. And even in the other group as well, there's people that you don't really want to run into at 0-2. Like, you don't want to run into a Petit Drogo. Uh, rough draws all around but i mean this tournament it's the best of the best isn't it in terms of europe and yeah. you're gonna have to start beating the big boys at some point or other it's just but jimmy again i just want to talk about his road he had hero marine wayne and then gerald like yeah, that's, that's horrendous that, that's actually horrendous those are all people that have been top 12 in this tournament in the past and i mean <laughs> absolutely brutal well, our final results for the day are on the screen. Clem, Spirit, Reino, and Max Pax not netted themselves positions in the playoffs. Drogo, Nicorect, DNS, and Gerald put themselves into Swiss round four while the others fell to the wayside. Uh, GG's congrats to uh, to everyone who won today. Uh, it's been a fun one, Ben. A long one today. I think it's been one of the longer days we've had in the event so far. So uh, We got through it, though. Lots of good series, lots of good games. Any any final thoughts? Any uh, matches to highlight people to go back and watch? Are we still on that Lemon Hype train 12, 12 versus 3 is later? I almost forgot about how good he was, actually. I, I There's a few series that were kind of fun, like the Showtime Max Packs, if you're a air enjoyer, was definitely kind of enjoyable. Yeah. I'm, I'm tr trying to think of, like, other series that were very fun today. I think Rainer Harson was quite feisty. I, I, think, I didn't really know. Yeah, I think everything at the start of Europe was fun. Like, Clem Goblin Game 1 especially was great. Spirit Skillless was a really good series as well. Um, yeah. The entire the, the start of Europe was really good. Um, Asia would probably highlight was Lemon. So, yeah, another fun day. All right, well, we are going to get around to wrapping it up. Thank you so much to our sponsors, which are, of course, Blizzard Entertainment, Monster Energy, the United States Air Force, and ESL Shop for having us. And, of course, if you join us in Dallas, if you want to go to the offline finals, you can do so, but you're going to need a ticket. Dreamhack.com slash Dallas slash tickets. You get 15% off with the code StarCraft, so go make use of that if you're going to be joining us there. Uh, I was Wardy. With me was Demu. We're going to be back on, I think it's Thursday next week, we're casting. So, mm -hmm. uh... We're going to be back on Thursday next week. Tomorrow is Thursday this week, and you guys will be met by Steadfast uh, with Fear Dragon, I believe. And then Steadfast and Roddy are here on Friday. And then Beowulf and Loco, Beowulf and Fear Dragon over the weekend. Do we really then just not have tournament Tuesday, Wednesday, the week after? Oh, I guess playoff weeks are only Thursdays through Sunday. Interesting. Cool. All right, so that's what you can expect when it comes to the the SLSET Masters Regionals. We hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you guys next time.